130 so we have to go uh, maintain the time strictly our first session is uh, uh, tumor imaging of the musculoskeletal system will be taken up by dr uh, ganguly as usual and our chairperson in this session is dr uh, sp kobiraj sir Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's good to see people have come back <laughs> after yesterday as well. It, it, is, it is quite uh, rigorous and onerous, but I'll do it a little bit differently this time. Uh, let me show you, let me start by showing you uh, some cases. Um, so this is this is a young 17 year old patient who presented with knee pain uh, to our department um, Just out of interest and to wake you up as well. Can you guys see any abnormality? Yeah, what what can you see? A lucency Okay in the tibia. Are you worried about it? Will you leave it or were you are you worried about it? We, yeah, we'll probably want to do something about it, isn't it? Um, let me see. It's not set up. So on the lateral projection, I don't know how well it projects, but there is actually a little bit of periosteal reaction uh, at the back. Only subtle, and you can't see the lesion very well, but it shows a bit of periosteal reaction. So what we did was he had an MRI, and I'll skip um, most of the... Uh, images. So I'll bring up a couple of things. By the way, this is kind of the platform that if you are taking the FRCR exam, this is a kind of platform on which the images will be shown. And this is the kind of um, uh, image in cases that uh, you'll see. So this is the actual lesion. So it's a 17-year-old boy with periosteal reaction and a lucent lesion, which is obviously based on this MRI, which is um, PD-weighted fat-suppressed MRI. You can see it's uh, breaching, the, breaching the cortex and extending posteriorly uh, into the soft tissue. The PCL is still attached. Um, this is it on the uh, coronal projection. So we did a biopsy, and this turned out to be an osteosarcoma, as you would have expected. Okay. Uh, and we stage it. We'll come back to that later to see how we stage them. Um, you, you, I saw a poster of a soft tissue sarcoma um, amongst some of your cases uh, in the poster presentation. So here's one that we obviously came across. Uh, patient presented with a lump in the thigh, and when he did an ultrasound, it showed a heterogeneous thing, lesion, and then went on to have an MRI. Um, this is again, uh, this, is, uh, this is actually not just a PD fat sat. This is a T1 weighted uh, post gadolinium T1 weighted fat suppressed uh, tumor, uh, which shows a well defined enhancing mass, still a soft tissue sarcoma. I'll come back to this once we have done the talk on the musculoskeletal because I want you guys to stage these two tumors for me. Because there's no point in calling a tumor a tumor if you can't stage it. Okay, you need to be able to, even if it is wrong, even if it is provisional, uh, we as a radiologist are paid to give our opinion. Sometimes it'll be wrong, but you need to still come up with an opinion based on otherwise no, there's no point in just uh, stating the facts of a report. Uh, right, with, I'll come back to that, so I'll keep it at the bottom with that in mind. talk, um, which is our first set of uh, lectures today, which is uh, tumor imaging. Um, I have nothing to disclose, uh, but I do acknowledge uh, a few of the images from uh, a couple of papers that we came across, and there's a couple of my own. Um, 
So what, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about an approach to tumor imaging. I can't teach you how to diagnose different tumors in an hour's lecture. It'll probably take, you know, forget days. It'll take weeks, months, and years to look at things, okay? So we'll look at a general approach. Since you guys don't stage them, we'll touch upon the AJCC classification and the Anakin classification, a few other things, but I won't dwell too much on the AJCC because if you're not attending tumor boards, if you're not doing the MDT, you probably won't need ever to use them. So it'll all, you know, go over the, um, go over the top. Um, so we'll focus on the role of imaging and we'll review some cases as we go along. So what is, so we start with staging, okay? Staging of uh, bone and soft tissue tumors are mostly done uh, in the UK and in the US based on what is called the AJCCC, AJCC, which is American Joint Committee of Cancer classification, and the Enekin system, which we will look at in a slightly more detail. The Enekin system is actually quite nice, and it feels, it is quite useful actually. The Musculoskeletal Tumor Society uh, actually has adopted the Enekin classification system as their own, and I'll tell you why in a minute. So the Enekin system um, was developed quite early, 1980, so far you know, before the AJCC classification came up. Um, and uh, it is based on the anatomy, it's based on the radiological appearance, and it also takes into consideration the pathology. They cover both bone and soft tissue tumors, unlike the AJCC, as we will see in a minute. Um, and these are often preferred by uh, the oncologists. So what is, I won't go into the details. So again, you can have this on the internet. I can leave copies of these things. The idea is to show you the principle of um, what we are doing. So this is the Enekin system, which as I said, applies to both soft tissue and bone tumors, right? So they divide the tumors into T0, T1, and T2. And it's important to understand the concept. So basically, like the sarcoma we went back and see, and I'll show you examples of all of these, T0 is a tumor which is confined by its own capsule and within the same compartment. T1 is when it has gone beyond um, its capsule, and T2 is when it's gone beyond the compartment. So, um, so I'll go through um, how that's relevant. So surgical resection, obviously, is sort of, you can think of it this way as a cornerstone or the be all or end all only curative thing that you can do for any sort of soft tissue or bone uh, sarcoma. It's the, it's, it's the only hope of cure. You can do chemotherapy, radiotherapy, everything, but if you can actually take the tumor out and put it in the bin, that's the best chance of cure, isn't it? So that's why everything is directed towards staging and to see, can we operate or can we not? And then find out what we do if we can't operate. So the Enikin system is actually very, very, very geared towards helping the surgeon and helping your surgical decision making, okay? So when we go to the MDT, we always look at the Enikin classification and we pay more importance to it than the T staging, uh, which is kind of unusual compared to lung cancers and colorectal cancers and other cancers where the T staging is very important in decision making. Um, but here, the Enekin comes in. That's where the Enekin comes in, and I'll show you why. So, as you know, when a tumor grows, and I don't want to go into histology or pathology, when a tumor grows, it's you know circular growth pattern, oval growth pattern. It compresses the fibroareolar tissue around, yeah, develops its own vascularity, angiogenesis, and things, and gets vessel. But it compresses the tissues around it, which forms a pseudocapsule. It's not a true capsule. A true capsule is only visible in a benign thing. So it's called a pseudocapsule, which we'll often refer to as a capsule uh, here, here, uh, here on forth. Um, and compartment is, if it's a muscle, then the you know, epimysium or the perimysium. Uh, if it's the bone, then it's the cortex and the periosteum. So basically, wherever it is. If it's in the joint, then the cartilage of the joint and the capsule of the joint. Okay, if it is a nerve, then it's the perineurium. That's your compartment's boundary. So if it has gone beyond that, then it's extra compartmental, okay? Um, so remember, T0 is a tumor which is confined by its capsule. So it's intracapsular, well-defined, completely circ well-circumscribed tumor, okay? Important to understand this bit. T1 is when it's gone beyond its capsule. But so if a tumor has grown inside, say, for example, any muscle, flexor carpi ulnaris, see if there's a sarcoma in there. But if it's still within the muscle, but outside, it's still intracompartmental, but extra um, capsular, and we'll call it T1. T2 is when it's gone beyond the compartment. So a muscle tumor going into a bone, or a bone tumor going into a muscle, or a bone tumor going into a joint, or a bone tumor trapping the nerve, 
or a bone tumor going into a vessel, think of any of these, that's extra compartmental disease. It's going beyond its compartment. That's T2. How is that relevant? So some of you already know this if you've got any background in surgical um, surgery. Quite often, you know, we, we use these wide local excision in terms in breast surgery, but I'll illustrate on this a uh, particular example. Once I found my, I find my mouse. Oh, there it is. Oh, I can't see the mouse. Okay. Um, so that is the that is that is the tumor, the yellow one in the middle. Okay. So. Um, the, cen oh, so the central dot it basically represents a tumor within that yellow, okay? So if you are actually resecting within that yellow dot, that's called an intralesional resection, okay? So basically that happens when they can't operate. So you're scooping a bit of the uh, lesion out within the pseudocapsule and leaving it there. Marginal resection is when you go along the margin of the capsule, okay? Still you're just inside. Wide local excision is when you go beyond it and remove a chunk of the muscle around it as well. So the same thing applies to breast cancer as well. A radical resection is when you remove the entire muscle. So you can see if it's a T1 lesion, which is intracompartmental. Keep forgetting the mouse is not visible here. So if it is intracompartmental, uh, which means it's still within the muscle, you can do, you can get away with a radical resection, no matter how big the tumor is. That's where it's different from a colon cancer or a lung cancer. It doesn't matter whether your tumor is 10 centimeter long. If it's all confined within the muscle, it is still excisable, okay? It can still be removed. So, but if it has gone beyond the muscle, then you're looking at something more dramatic or drastic, okay? You can't uh, do a wide local excision or a radical resection. Um, uh, here we go. So... Uh, the most frequently used classification system when we're doing tumor staging is AJCC, uh, okay? It stages the tumors on a T and M basis, just like any classification system, T for tumor, N for node, and M for metastasis. Um, it also incorporates a histological grade because histology of the tumor is very important because, you know, and generally most tumors, wherever you are in the body, are either low grade, medium, or advanced, or high grade tumors, okay? So they tie that with. Now, FNCLCC, don't ask me to pronounce it in French, but that's the actual histological classification system that the pathologists know, thankfully. We don't need to go into that, but they will tell you a low, medium, or high grade tumor based on that. Now, they divide, so the AJCCC we are talking about, um, it divides the bone sarcomas into three categories. They look at the appendicular skeleton, our arms, trunk, skull and facial bones in one group, spine and pelvis. Whereas for the soft tissue sarcoma, uh, they keep the trunk and extremity together again, retroperitoneal sarcomas, head and neck tumors, and visceral. So there are four groups in soft tissue sarcoma. I won't go into too much detail uh, again because you will need, to, there is no point in memorizing these. I can't remember who said it, but when I was reading in medical school, I read um, um, an advice um, on, on, a, on a novel, actually, and they said it's very important to know, because most people, most of my mentors have always said it's important to know what to read. He always used to tell, uh, or he wrote, that uh, it's very important also to know what not to read. Okay, your brain is not a computer. You can't delete things, okay? If you put a lot of unnecessary information in your brain, you won't be able to get the necessary information when you need it. So I follow that principle. I often um, don't, particularly when I come to exam scenarios, uh, I, I don't read quite a few things because I don't want to know about it. It's not going to help me. So there is no point in trying to memorize the stage and things and that. So don't even try, you know, ignore. Use that bit of your brain to remember something else or understand the surgical resection or why we operate on a T1 and how we operate on a T2. Why do you need this and why do you need that? That sort of thing. So, sorry, I'll stop waffling. So T1 here, so they use eight centimeter as a landmark. So if it is less than eight centimeter, they call it T1. If it's more than eight centimeter, T2. And discontinuous tumors, they call it uh, T3. And I'll just highlight a couple of things, uh, mag them. So in the spine and pelvis, they have div divided the vertebra and the pelvis into segments. And they stage it depending on how many segments are involved and the size of the lesion. Again, I don't want to go into the detail. You will have that chart if you are actually staging. Uh, but generally, as a rule of thumb, anything more than, sorry, anything under 8 centimeter is T1, 8 and above is T2, multiple uh, is uh, T3. Sorry, there we go. 
so slightly different when we get to soft tissue sarcoma. Soft tissue sarcoma, the cutoff is 5 centimeters. So anything below 5 is T1, 5 to 10 is T2, 10 to 15 is T3, and T4 is tumor greater than 15 centimeter in the greatest dimension. I'm not going into the other bit because the rest is very straightforward. N0 means no node, N1 means node. M0 means no metastasis, M1 means yes metastasis, wherever. Or that could be skip metastasis in the bone and things as well. So what is the role of imaging? What is your role here? Okay, one is TNM staging, okay? Um, and also to show the true extent of the lesion, okay? To differentiate between the solid and the necrotic areas. Why? Because as you can read, but I'll read it out anyway. So when you see solid areas with varying characteristics and varying enhancement pattern, they all need pathological evaluation because that's the thing about de-differentiated sarcomas and we'll see examples of them. Some part of it might look like one thing. The histology from a different part might be entirely different which makes it a de-differentiated or an undifferentiated, you know, higher grade tumor than otherwise. So if you see variation, that's where we need to pick that up. We need to report that, okay, because they need to biopsy all of those separate areas, okay. Um, Variation in intrinsic characteristic in a single tumor suggests variation in histology and hence upstaging of tumor grade, prognosis, treatment, everything is tied together. So that brings us to our first case. 69-year-old lady presented to you with an enlarging lump in the anterior aspect of the left thigh. Even without looking at the image, because of the talk, you know we are going to talk about a sarcoma. Okay? So uh, there's, no, there's no fun in that, but I'll show you the actual thing. So this is a T1W and a post-contrast T1 weighted fat suppressed image. Now another mute point, and don't get me wrong, I don't want to criticize it, but a lot of people, and I see that in my country as well, uh, or in the UK as well, uh, where I practice, my country of practice, shall I put it this way, uh, now, that a lot of people say, oh, a high T1 lesion and a low T2 lesion. Okay, it's low signal on a T2 weighted. Lesion is not a T2, or lesion is not high T2 or low T2 or whatever. It's high or low in a T1 or a T2 or a PD weighted image, that's why. It's, it's not in its nature to be low or high thing, okay? So it's a T1 weighted and a post-contrast T1 weighted image. Uh, so you can see, oh, it's a bit annoying because I can't see the arrow. Um, so you can see the high signal on T1, which obviously is a fat component, so hence it's a lipoma, but it's also got a central, which is the star, an enhancing component, okay? So which is what I was talking about, a tumor with mixed areas. So this is, a T2-weighted fat suppressed image compared with the other one. I'll go back. Um, you can see there are lots of other fat strands as well within the fatty component of the tumor, which makes it atypical anyway, which are the yellow uh, arrows at the bottom. Um, so this is a PET CT. They don't always go to have PET, but a PET was done because uh, in the workup of this patient. And there is high SUV and abnormal, um, abnormality corresponding to that particular area. And when it was removed, it was found that the rest of the tumor was lipoma, but the central bit was a de-differentiated spindle cell component, which makes this um, a de-differentiated liposarcoma of the thigh. Now, Bear in mind, the T4, um, it is a T4 tumor because it's quite a large tumor, the whole extent. We're not just measuring the solid tumor. And in Enekin-wise, it is 2A because it was going out of the muscle compartment. Sorry, it was 2A because it's not going out of the muscle compartment. Um, 2B if it would have gone out of the muscle compartment. So because it is confined by the wall and the yellow arrows show the confines of the tumor. Uh, okay, so that is a de-differentiated uh, liposarcoma of the thigh. So one of the role, as I said, is to see the true extent of the lesion, okay, for both bone and soft tissue tumors. Best, best evaluated by MRI. Ultrasound very, very limited here, very limited, unless it's a superficial tumor in the skin or something like that. So what are the critical aspects that we need to know? What do you need to include in your report? You should obviously describe the extent and extent in three direction. Okay, sometimes I don't remember, but you have to, you have to, if you're reporting a tumor in three dimension. Cortical destruction, if it's a bone tumor, if it's a soft tissue tumor, involvement of the cortex or periosteum, joint involvement, neurovascular involvement, nodes and mets. So those are the things that they are looking for in the report, okay? Um, 
Oh yeah, so one of the things that obviously, again, if you're not actively staging, this is not probably that relevant, but we used to use deep fascia as a landmark, okay? Say for example, teaching our registrars was, if you find a lipoma more than five centimeter, if it's superficial to the deep fascia, you can leave it. If it is deep to the deep fascia, chances of sarcoma is high, you've got to do an MR. Now that's gone out of the window on the eighth edition. They have now removed the deep fascia as a critical layer for differentiating between suspicious and non-suspicious. Uh, so, put it this way, the lesion needs to be treated on its merit, no matter where it is. Even if it is not deep to the deep fascia, it could still be a very bad sarcoma. So, so hence they have removed it, okay? And then soft tissue lesion extent may be difficult to determine in some cases. Classic ones, and I saw an example in the poster, was a nice case of undifferentiated multifocal pleomorphic sarcoma. I can't remember whose poster it was, but that was a good one used to be originally called um, fibrous, uh, malignant fibrous histiocytoma, isn't it, MFH. Uh, I'm glad that you're calling it undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma because you need to stay with the, you know, sort of development and progression of the age. So they can be quite difficult sometimes because of what is called the fascial tail sign, and we'll see some examples. So here, here's our next patient, 61-year-old lady. This time I've told you what she's got. She's got myxofibrosarcoma of the left thigh. So why are we seeing this? So it shows solid enhancing tumor mass, which is the star on the image, okay? And a long enhancing fascial tail outlined by the uh, white arrow, the thin white arrow, okay? So that is what is a fascial tail. We see it on the post-contrast um, fat suppressed image and the T2 weighted um, image. The image C is a post-contrast um, image. Here's another patient, which is a middle-aged patient with a mix of fibrosarcoma of the right leg this time, not the thigh, and he's had radiotherapy. Okay, so this scan, so he's now come to you, and there's a bit of a mismatch. So why is this important? So on your left is the T1-weighted post-contrast fat suppressed, and on your right is just a T2-weighted. So you can see the T2-weighted fat suppressed is really, really busy. There's lots of high signal along the deep fascia everywhere, okay? If you read that as multiple areas of fascia, fascial extension and fascial tail, then you're thinking that, oh, crikey, so this is a lot more uh, extensive tumor. However, most of this is post-radiotherapy change. So the post-T1 fat, suppre fat suppressed post gadolinium T1 weighted image shows you that those were actually just edema along the fascial plane. There is no tumor. So that's uh, along those fascial plane. So that's actually a significant um, prognostic uh, sign. Some people might stop treatment at that point and amputate the leg thinking, oh my goodness, this is not getting anywhere. It's just getting worse. But you said, no, no, hang on. This is, there is no enhancement. These are all reactive edema, secondary to the radiotherapy. There is no tumor there. You could also achieve that to some extent with diffusion weighted imaging, to some extent, but diffusion, because of the nature of how we acquire the image, has a lot of artifact. And most people in most places would be doing two point, three point, at most four point diffusion. Most centers, unless you're regional university hospitals, don't do multi-point diffusion. It defeats the purpose because it takes a very long time. So as soon as you do two-point diffusion or three-point diffusion, you're basically, think of it this way, if you look at a curved structure, and okay, only interpolate two areas, and tell somebody draw a line, graph, they'll draw a line like that. They don't realize that that much information is actually missing. If you do, which is why we do four in liver, we do four, well, in UK at least, we do four. Some places we'll do, you know, three in brain and other places. So diffusion has its downside. Without going into too much detail about the actual reason for downside, that's why fat suppressed T1 weighted is definitely more valuable and useful from your point of view. So going on to the next bit, the tumor, uh, so tumor necrosis, tumor heterogeneity and tumoral enhancement uh, and peritumoral enhancement, sorry, they're all associated with poor prognosis, okay, as we saw. So that is why we were doing a post-contrast image on the previous one to see whether it is or not, okay. So these are the three things which independently have been shown to be prognostic or poor prognostic indicators. So if you've got lots of tumor necrosis, lots of heterogeneity, the survival is uh, is poor. So it brings us to our fourth patient. This is a 64-year-old lady with an undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma of the thigh. 
so you can see mixed signals, the small arrowheads on the image on the top left and the black arrow on the top left, heterogeneous areas of low signal on T2 and necrosis on the T2 weighted image. Uh, ignore the C, which is just a T1 weighted image. It just is to compare with the D, which is the T1 weighted fat suppressed post contrast, which shows the mixed enhancement of the tumor. So this obviously is a histological grade three with worse prognosis with, as I said, the three things. So there is heterogeneity, there are areas of necrosis, and there is abnormal enhancement. As you notice in the white arrow on the image, along the deep fascial plane as well. So all of these are bad prognostic indicators. So here's another patient who's a 52-year-old with a myxoid round cell liposarcoma of the thigh. And bear in mind, when we report these, we can't tell what tumor it is, okay? So we always say it's a soft tissue sarcoma. None of these fancy myxoid or, you know, de-differentiated spindle cell and things, they'll all come post histology, okay? You don't need to call any of you. You will just report them as soft tissue sarcoma. So this patient has a uniform signal on the T2W uh, image, which is the top left, and there is no peritural soft tissue enhancement uh, on the T1W post contrast image, which is the bottom right. Prognostically, this was, well, histologically it was grade two, and prognostically this was, uh, this was found to be better than the previous patient. And our third patient in this group, our 71-year-old uh, lady with a de-differentiated liposarcoma, looks quite horrible, as you can see on the image. Okay, so he, uh, sorry, she, she sh her tumor showed heterogeneous signal on the T2W, which is your middle image, with areas of necrosis, which you can see as high signal, areas of scarring and calcific densities and things, which you can see as low signal on T2 or hemorrhage, blood product, basically heterogeneity. Okay, and on the T1 post contrast images, uh, you can see enhancement within the tumor and also peritumoral, um, sorry, enhancement within the tumor and minimal peritumoral enhancement as well as indicated on the image C by the arrow. This was a histological grade two, prognostically supposedly a little bit better, but because of all these three features, so this is from that paper who actually presented that despite of the histology grade, if you see heterogeneity, if you see peritumoral enhancement, and if you see necrosis, they independently say that this prognosis is bad. Okay, it doesn't matter what your histological grade is. So this is a grade two tumor. They should have a good five-year survival rate, but they died in 18 months. So the AJCC uh, T staging, they look at size, okay? Uh, as I was saying, we looked at it. Generally, eight centimeters is a cutoff between 21 and T2 for bone tumors and five, 10, 15 for the soft tissue tumors. Vertebra, and I, I wouldn't go into the detail, but just to give you a highlight, vertebra is divided into five segments and the pelvis into four segments, okay? And the focus is in seeing how many segments are involved, okay? Uh, more than one segment, and you can look at your chart and say, okay, so this is T2, or this is T1B, okay? Or this is T2B, because it's more than five centimeter, sorry, more than eight centimeter, and it involves two segment, okay? So that's how it works. So if it is less than eight centimeter, it involves one segment, T1A. If it involves two segment, T1B. So that's how it, it's mathematical. It, you can work that out once you look at one or two. Um, but what we're trying to assess is how many segments are involved, because these have prognostic and treatment implications. Is there involvement of the joint? Is there soft tissue extension for spinal tumor? Is it involving the epidural space? Is it invading the dura? Is there cord involvement, okay? And determinant and extent of surgery. Um, so this is where you differentiate. So from wide local excision, for some tumors which are within the compartment to internal and external hemipelvectomy. Just out of interest, do you know what is a hemipelvectomy and what is internal and external hemipelvectomy? No? So external hemipelvectomy, uh, hemipelvectomy, sorry, it's a tongue twister almost, is also called hind quarter amputation. So that's when you remove half of the pelvis and that leg. So that's how, what you do with that lady if you are operating on her advanced sarcoma. Internal hemipelvectomy is just removal of um, the side of the pelvis with preservation of the leg. So this is an example of a spine uh, sarcoma, bone sarcoma uh, in, the, in the spine. So this is histologically a chordoma, and you can see multiple, um, so, sorry, 
So this is a 52-year-old lady with a chordoma. So here's the image um, of it showing multiple vertebral level involvement. Disc transgression. Sorry, forgot about the disc. Also, bear in mind that breaching cortex, getting into the disc is also extra compartmental spread. Okay. Um, and then it's got a huge soft tissue mass anteriorly, which is the black star. Um, okay. So this is an AJCC T4, but Anakin 2B. Why is it 2B? Because it's extra compartmental. So that is the, if you remember one thing from today's talk, try and remember the Anakin classification, which is very straightforward, okay? 1A, uh, sorry, 2A, 2B, and 1, okay? 1 is when it, it is intralesional, intercompartmental. 2A is when it's extralesional, but within the compartment, and 2B when it's beyond the compartment. So this is beyond the compartment. So it notice, actually there's a better example later, so I'll, show, I'll talk about that in a minute. So this is the next patient, which is a 12-year-old girl with an Ewing sarcoma of the left iliac wing. Uh, these can be quite aggressive, large tumors, obviously. So there's a large soft tissue mass, and one of the things about Ewing sarcoma is their massive uh, soft tissue component. Uh, so there is involvement of the left SI joint and bone destruction. So this is a T4 tumor based on the size and uh, NAC in 2B, again, because there is extra compartmental uh, spread, joint, soft tissue. Okay, just to remind you that T2 means extra compartmental. So also we want to see if there is multi-compartment involvement. Uh, so yeah, we should report that, uh, the multi-compartment involvement. And as I said before already, for bone tumors, it's cortex and soft tissue uh, involvement. For soft tissue, it is bone involvement, joint involvement, and other visceral involvement. Okay, so bone involvement in case of soft tissue sarcomas, as we saw some example, is probably most commonest in synovial sarcoma, followed by undifferentiated uh, pleomorphic sarcomas. So it brings us to our um, next patient, which is a 40-year-old man with a high-grade synovial sarcoma of the right leg. So this patient has a soft tissue mass, and I've just got a picture on the left of the actual muscle compartment of the leg. Um, more muscle mapping, you'll be thinking, after yesterday's. But anyway, it helps you to decide which compartment we are in. So, you know, the posterior compartment, colored in purple, is the deep posterior, which is tibialis posterior and group, whereas the superficial posterior is the uh, orange-ish color, peach, which is this oleus and gastrocnemius and things. <clears throat> so, there's a big soft tissue mass, which is extending anteriorly, uh, which is A in the picture on the right, and P in the posterior compartment. So basically, it is transgressing the fascial plane, going from the anterior muscle compartment to the deep posterior compartment, which makes it an anakin 2B, okay? So if you're looking at removing, you can't do a intralesional excision. You can't do a marginal resection. You can't do a wide local excision. This patient is looking at losing that leg isn't it? It's extra compartmental. You can't. But had it been intracompartmental, you could have dearticulated and removed the muscle and tried a wide local excision, excision of bits of the bone and things, okay? But because it's extra compartmental, he's going to lose a leg. That's how it helps. And that's why the surgeons prefer the Anakin over T. We have to do the T staging for research because you, have, you need the T staging, but T staging is not very useful. It just tells you T4, T3. How does that help? The Anakin helps you to decide what type of surgery, and if it is beyond surgery, then so be it. Throw chemo, throw radiation, but that's where the Anakin comes in. Joint involvement. Um, in primary bone sarcoma, in about 14 to 30%. I put some percentages, don't worry. I mean, when you see a patient and a case in front of you, who cares if it's 100% or 2%? If there is involvement, there is involvement. You know, it doesn't matter if he's the only person in the world where it's been involved. To him, it's still involved. So take percentage with a pinch of salt. It's only to tell you what is more common. So if you're seeing something like an osteosarcoma, which is more likely to metastasize to the chest, you must do a CT chest if you find this. That's where the percentage comes in. Whereas if it's some rare tumors, you know, rare as a hen's teeth, which never metastasizes to the chest, you can get away without doing a CT chest. That's where the percentage comes. But otherwise, treat everything, we're radiologists, treat everything on its merit, on what you see on your image and what you know. So work that out based on that. So by definition, 
joint involvement is extra compartmental, okay? And as I'll show you in a picture, it can occur through the articular cartilage, right, into the joint, or via the soft tissue and entering the joint through the capsule, okay? It's most commonly seen in synovial sarcomas. Um, so here's what I was talking about. So it can breach the cartilage and enter the joint itself, or it can go into the capsule, grow along the capsule, and enter the joint through the side door. So here's a 50-year-old uh, man with a telangiectetic osteosarcoma of the femur. Uh, don't worry about the histology again. So this shows it's an 8-centimeter tumor with involvement of the joint. As you can see, S1, it shows. Um, it has involved along the ACL, which is S2, and has also gone into the suprapatellar pouch and joint effusion. Note that effusion, just like you know, your lung cancer staging when you see pleural effusion, malignant pleural effusion, upstages a lesion. I don't know whether, how many of you do lung cancer staging, but it'll become, uh, it'll, it'll go up in T stage. Oh, sorry, it's M1A now, isn't it, based on the uh, ninth. Um, so it'll upgrade your staging, basically, if you see effusion. So bear in mind, effusion here is also an indicator of uh, possible joint involvement. Here's an eight centimeter tumor, which is a parosteal osteosarcoma involving the patellar tendon hence extra compartmental. So here we go. If you actually measured the length of this tumor based on the eight centimeter size, it was just, it is just over eight centimeter. At most you will stage it as a T2 tumor. If you call your boss or a surgeon and say, oh, I've got a tumor which is T2, they straight away think, oh great, operable, nice. T2 is good, T2 sounds good, isn't it? T4 sounds bad, T2 is good. But that's where the Enekin earns its money. Clearly, it has breached the cortex, gone into the tendon. So this person's going to lose the leg. Doesn't matter what's T2. The Enekin is what is important here. So we always, if you're doing a tumor board for um, um, these sort of tumor, as, we, uh, as they call it in America, we call it MDT, multidisciplinary team meetings uh, in the UK. You've got to include the Enekin. That's what the surgeons are waiting to be. You know, even if you've given them a T4, N0, they'll say, what's Enekin stage? But because it's straightforward, the surgeons are very good at working out the Anakin classification. Okay, they look at you for the T, but they can work it out. So also, to earn your value so that they respect you as a radiologist, you need to know what they know. That's where the, as I was telling uh, somebody before, that's why you need to know what treatment options are available, why you do a rempli sage procedure for instability, and why you do a latter jet. Because you can tell the surgeon, well, the glenoid bone loss is actually 25%. I know you're trying to do a rempli sage. That I don't think will work based on the textbooks. They might say, no, I'm the boss. I know what to do. But you can say, well, fine. You can rewrite the textbook, and you can do what you want, but that's what is the evidence uh, around. But it, you just stand, next time they will come to you and listen, they'll say, do you think, at that time they argued, do you think this is acceptable? And you might say, well actually, it is you know, this, and I would probably think of this, and they'll say, mm, actually that makes sense, because they would have kind of learned their lessons. Although it's not about learning lessons, it's about treating the patients. At the end of the day, we should all remember we are treating patients, right, as doctors. And that's our first goal. So whatever we do to help them, whether it's radiology or orthopedic, I'm digressing. I'll come back to tumors. Um, so the next bit is neurovascular involvement. So uh, again, that's by definition extra compartmental. We need to look at neurovascular involvement in any tumor, okay, soft tissue sarcomas or bone sarcomas. Um, so generally, just like if you do any pancreatic staging, we look at the SMA and the SMV and the portal vein and involvement, and even for esophageal tumor, contact with aorta, it's the same sort of thing. So radiology is like maths. Once you can stage the esophagus, you can stage a tumor in the big toe. You know, it's the same principle, if you think of the principle behind radiology in, in imaging. Um, so more than 180 degree contact or loss of fat plane is a very sensitive indicator, okay? So we do that on T1W images because that's where you see fat as bright. That's what will differentiate. Uh, that's where it comes in. So it's the same thing with esophageal and, uh, you know, contact with aorta. Sometimes, obviously, with aorta, I think more than 90 degree contact is what is more important. Obviously, more than 180 degrees is almost definitive involvement, even if you don't see intravascular uh, invasion. So bear in mind, I meant that. So when you see contact, I'm not talking about any intravascular extension, okay? So you don't need to see any tumor inside the vessel. If there is more than 180 degree contact along the circumference of the vessel, that's invasion. 
until proven otherwise, because there'll be microscopic cells going in, which you can't see, but the pathologist will be able to when the tumor's in the bin, and they do a histology of the, you know, or frozen section or whatever, when they're doing. So this is an example of how the tumor can encase a vessel. This is a 73-year-old man with a leiomyosarcoma or leiomyosarcoma uh, of the thigh, and the, it's hard to identify the vessels because they're all encased in the tumor. So here's your knowledge of anatomy and where vessels and nerves um, comes in. So this is obviously involved the femoral or superficial femoral artery, the uh, profunda femoral um, artery and vessels will be uh, more deeper. So, uh, so this is a nine centimeter tumor encasing the vessel. This is again a T2 tumor based on AJCC, but Anakin 2B. 30 year old, with a synovial sarcoma of the knee. Another example of vessel encasement, okay? In this case, the total tumor length was about 19 centimeter, so it is a T4 tumor, again, Anakin 2B. Nodal staging, regional node involvement is not very common, uh, unlike the others. Uh, other tumors like lung and breast and colon and pancreas and things, it is less common. The most frequently seen bone sarcomas are uh, osteosarc and Ewing's. Um, and again, uh, I've given you the percentage, um, but obviously less common even with uh, soft tissue sarcomas. The soft tissue sarcomas that are commonly associated with lymph nodes are synovial sarcoma, and I don't want to go into the histological detail, but in, in bottom line is, uh, if you see a soft tissue sarcoma, you should look for it. Although it's uncommon, you should watch, look at the nodes. But what do the nodes look like? What are you looking for? Some of it is general. Uh, do I go into it? Uh, yeah. Uh, so this is an example of a 13-year-old boy with an osteosarcoma, okay? While I'm on it, we were looking at examples of osteosarcoma. If you see density in the bone, this is for people taking exam. If you see increased density like this in the bone, what is happening? There is osteogenesis, okay? There is bone forming. There's only two bone forming tumors in the world, either osteoid osteoma or osteogenic sarcoma. Generally, it's two. So bear in mind, if you're looking at a bone forming tumor, that's, you can argue osteoblastoma, which is the sort of bigger brother of osteodostoma if it's more than 2.5 centimeter. But often they'll have lytic areas and they'll be in specific places. They'll be in the vertebra, posterior elements and things like that. And they often have an expensile element as well. So purely sclerotic until proven otherwise, as somebody was saying yesterday, osteosarc. So this one, notice um, the, oh, I keep forgetting the arrows are not visible. So these little things, the black arrows, are uh, osteosarcoma deposits in the bone separate from the original tumor. So these are uh, satellite lesions or satellite deposits. And that thing behind the arrow is pointing to a node which has also got osteogenic material. So this is, this is obviously an N1 tumor. So regional nodes can be assessed on CT and MRI uh, and they follow the normal lymphatic drainage anywhere, uh, just you know, uh, based on the same anatomical principles. They generally have similar intrinsic appearance, as we saw in the example before, to the actual primary tumor. Otherwise, you just assess them like you assess any node. Look for hilum, look for um, loss of hilar fat, loss of um, you know, circular pattern rather than oval, and size of the node itself. Bring to the last sort of bit, which is a met. The distant metastasis, again, musculoskeletal sarcoma is most commonly is seen in the lung. Okay. Distant mets of soft tissue sarcomas uh, range between 22 to 36%. Again, commonest um, osseous sarcoma to metastasize are osteosarcomas, which is actually quite high if you think about it. 28% in five years, that's 30%. That's nearly one in three osteosarcomas when you see. What I tend to do is percentage used to annoy me when I was a trainee, and I used to always think of it in numbers. So 30% doesn't sound, but when you say one in three osteosarcomas you see will have bone met, suddenly it's an, mm, actually, mm. or you know, when I say 20% probability of it being, you know, one in five people you see, oh, I saw six people yesterday, does that mean I went, I missed, you know. So, you know, th that's the kind that you should have focus on. So that's how you should look at percentage when you're actually looking at it. So bone is the second commonest site for metastasis um, um, of uh, sarcoma, um, of a primary osteosarcoma. And osteosarcomas and Ewing's are again the usual culprits. So this is an example of metastatic osteosarcoma. Uh, note the osteoid matrix, as I was saying, same as a lymph node. You can see it on the picture on 
the left side of the screen. Um, obviously, it's a long window on the other one, and you can't see, it just shows the number. But you can see the little calcific or ossific deposits um, in the other image. So how do we investigate? Now is the nitty gritty. So this is all right, Dr. Ganguly. The patient has come with a lump to me. What do I actually do? Okay, here we go. So we always start with x-rays and ultrasound, okay? Because uh, obviously, unless you feel it as it's purely soft tissue, then it'll purely start with ultrasound. But even then, even if it starts with an ultrasound, we'll almost always end up doing an x-ray, okay? X-ray is a basic, simple thing. And as I think it was Branton Helms who used to say that if you do, you should be punished if you do an MR without an accompanying x-ray. It's probably not that serious, but you will turn out to be a fool sometimes if you do MR without an accompanying x-ray. You'll get caught out with chondrocalcinosis looking like tear, okay? You'll be caught out with so many different things. Classic example, myositis ossificans. If you biopsy it, it looks like osteosarcoma. People will end up losing their limbs. If you had looked at an x-ray, it's clearly myositis ossificans in an area of trauma. It's probably the most crude and gross example of where x-ray wins. We still, we still, every sarcoma, no matter how complex, no matter how, you know, even MR knees and MR shoulders, we often go back to look at the actual plain x-ray. That is the bread earner of all radiologists. That's how it all started. And a lot of textbooks still go by you know, I'm not going into the Lockwood grade and moth-eaten appearance of bones and things like that. Forget all that. But we're looking at gross pathology. Is the cortex destroyed? You know, it, those are the things that we're looking at. So we, we need um, the x-ray for all those purposes. Generally, for suspicious lesions, um, um, particularly above the age of 40, a CT chest and abdomen and pelvis is always done. 40 seems to be the magic age. It's, it, it, is, uh, it is quite strange. And some of you... And, well, all of you will get to 40 at some point. It is kind of a defining. Yesterday I was uh, talking about um, why we do MR arthrograms and where we don't do arthrograms. You know, below 40 and above 40. I don't know what happens. Magically you wake up one day, um, you know, 40 year and one day, and suddenly you will not get an MR arthrogram. No, it doesn't work like that. But generally we use it as a rule of thumb. Because the older you get, the more likely you're trying, you know, you will get uh, tumors and things. Because bone sarcomas and soft tissue sarcomas are so much more so much less common, put it this way, so much more uncommon, and you're more likely to have a met from somewhere. That's why a whole body chest abdo pelvis CT is done to make sure there's nothing else going somewhere else before we go down the sarcoma route. Generally, all of them will be referred, in the UK at least, to the sarcoma MDT to be discussed within two weeks. Why two weeks? Because they'll need biopsy, and the biopsy takes about a week to come back. Some will need immunostains because for characterization further. Most things will get genetic testing nowadays, and I don't want to go into that, but a lot of, lot of them, so hence the two-week time. And by two weeks, it'll be decided, and uh, then they'll dis you know, take a course of action based on that. And staging generally includes MRI, and when I say MRI, it's joint to joint. So same orthopedic principle. If you've got a tibial fracture, if your x-ray doesn't show the knee joint and the ankle joint, send them back. You've got to see the joint on both sides of the involved bone. That's an absolute basic must for any orthopedic junior, and that should be the same for us. You can't just not look. So same applies to when you're looking at hip replacement and things. When you see the bottom end of the prosthesis missing, send them back. They need to have the everything visible. You should be able to see it. It doesn't matter if it's extra radiation or a you know, second dose. So the coverage is very important for radiology as well. Uh, again, you end up looking like a fool if you've done a small field of view um, and, you know, trying to be a cowboy and diagnose something on that. Um, it, uh, it doesn't help the patient. For distance staging, we do chest CT. We do chest CT. Some patients will get a chest abdo pelvis, as I said, but most people will get a chest CT, particularly young people. Nowadays, there's a trend towards going towards PET CT uh, for a lot of them. Uh, surgeons prefer it. So um, in the NHS, uh, PET CT uh, is provided by uh, separate providers, but we're moving more towards doing PET CT. Whole body MRI, more a European standard. You know, if you're in Sweden, Switzerland, Germany, uh, you'll get a whole body MRI. They do whole body MRI, but in the UK, we don't do um, whole body MRI. ESMO is the European uh, sarcoma uh, imaging guidelines. Um, this brings me to my last uh, case as an example in this group. So here's a 65-year-old man, and I can't remember who had that, uh, who had a poster on something similar. 
So, um, so this is a 65-year-old man with knee pain and palpable lumps with iron deficiency anemia, that's IDA, benign prosthetic hypertrophy, smoker and hypertensive. That's how it came. That's the history. And this is the finding. Okay? Uh, so, obviously, we are clever radiologists. We look at an MR. There is a low T2 signal lesion. I have not shown the GRE sequence to show you blooming artifact. What's the diagnosis? Sorry? Okay, go on. Very good. Okay. Okay, fair enough. Uh, but with the other two, do you think this is in the Hoffer's fat pad or actually within the joint? Yeah, but it's intracapsular, but is it intrasynovial within the true joint compartment or is it extrasynovial within the Hoffer's fat pad? Because that will differentiate because once you say extrasynovial, your other two differential goes out of the window. So for it, hemophilic arthropathy and the other thing, they need to be within the synovium, isn't it? It is the true joint compartment. Whereas if it's Hoffer's fat pad, it's typically PVNS until proven otherwise, isn't it? Such is what we thought. So we completely agree you can come and work for us. That's what we thought. But this is the X-ray. Okay. Um, and the X-ray was at a little interval. I can't remember the exact interval now, so it wasn't that the x-ray was done next day. At that time, the x-ray was not too bad. This is at an interval. Uh, notice this lesion. Okay, so that's a little bit further away and starts you think, okay, it still could be PVNS. Um, because so far he's been stamped as a PVNS based on the dark and uh, things. Um, and you can see the soft tissue swelling around the knee, and they all got worse over time. So we said, okay, maybe time we repeat the MRI, because this is quite a close gap as well, maybe a couple of months, or maybe less than that, six weeks, um, while he was waiting for that, because everybody thought PVNS, PVNS is a benign condition, blah, 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 histological blurring. Uh, we'll do our arthroscopy at time, but it's a benign condition. So here we go. So it, two months, and then another six weeks until he gets the MRI. So now he comes for the MRI and says, oh, I have got a you know, visible swelling, and he's struggling to walk. And you start looking at this and say, mm, yeah, my PVNS thing is there. Well, what is that thing near that you know, patella tendon? Are we looking at? And some clever guy in the department will say, oh, I think this is amyloidosis. Look at renal function. And this. Think, yeah, stop that for a second and do a biopsy. So we did a biopsy. Okay. So basically, you were spot on when you talked about hemophilia, spot on. And that is the learning element in this. Never, never, never forget that low T2 means blood product as well. Okay? Any tumor that has bled can look like a PVNS because of the low T2 signal. It's the hemosiderin that's doing the trick. Okay? You're, you're, you're imaging histology, basically. Unlike CT and X-ray, where it's just radiation going through bones and soft tissue, and you taking an image and working out what it's gone through, here you're actually imaging. With MR, you're imaging tissue, isn't it? So bear in mind, hemosiderin, anything dark, you know, calcium, fibrous tissue, you know, they'll be dark on T2. Obviously, blooming means either PVNS. If you look at the actual reason why PVNS, that's hemorrhagic and hemosiderin as well in that. But any other tumor. Amyloidosis is actually another example where you get T2 blooming and T2 things. But they'll be intraarticular. You can get periarticular as well. You'll get mixed probably in both. If you get intraarticular, because PVNS can be localized or generalized. So local ones will be within the synovium of a pad. Generalized will be intra and that as well. So this was actually a lung uh, cancer. So to summarize, um, uh, I wanted to give you an idea of the AJCC and the Enekin classification. Bear in mind, Enekin is really, really important. And it just adds power to your report. It shows you you're in control, which we should be. Radiologists should be in control. We're the ones who are imaging. It doesn't work like that in India, but it is you who's imaging, who's making the diagnosis. So you are the person who is in control, okay? Let the surgeons follow you. Let them tell you otherwise, but they will know as well. Because, you know, but that thing can only come through if you add value to your report, okay? If you say normal knee, then it, you know, a lot of people have seen people reporting things as normal knee, although it doesn't happen here, or a normal, uh, thing, then it doesn't matter. If you, 
if you add value to reports, so that's where Anakin comes in. And just to rephrase the Anakin thing, so remember, if it's extra compartmental, it's 2B. If it's intra compartmental, it's 2A. And one is with is within the lesion just itself. Okay. So that is it. I've got some references. So let me finish this and I'll take you. I'll have a look in between as to. Oh, now I can see the mouse. Uh, what did I show you? And let me split the screen and show you. Oh. Sorry, I was going to swear, but I didn't, thankfully. Okay, so here we go. So I'm showing you an axial. Well, actually, I'll do one better. Uh, so you're going to stage, so I'm going to provide you good quality images, the best that we could do. So this is a T1-weighted fat-suppressed post-gadolinium image, um, and this is an axial uh, PD-weighted image, which looks very dark on your screen, actually. But ignore that. Let's stick to this one. Okay. So how would you stage this? Anakin 2, B, very good. And if we were to do a T staging, the maximum length of this tumor is what? It says 6.5, so it's actually T1 even, under eight centimeter. So it sounds like a great, you know, T1, you've got a tumor, T1 osteosarcoma, that should be operable. No, it isn't. It's Anakin 2, B. So I was going to show you the axial, so the vessels are involved, breach of cortex, periosteum. And by the way, what's this sign called? If you saw it in the x-ray, what, what is it called? This thing that what's it? the periosteum is elevated, and you see this triangular bit of extra osseous. It is Codman's triangle. This is an MR version of a Codman's triangle. If you're doing the FRCR exam, so this is one of my exam films that I show people. So if you're, seeing a, if you're doing an FRCR exam, hardly anybody will see a X-ray cordman triangle. Uh, you might be shown, but you need to know what an MR cordman triangle looks like because that's where we are going. So this is an MR version of a cordman triangle. Um, so that's that. And let me go back to the previous one. This was yeah, for those who are interested, it is a, this is how it started. So when he came for an ultrasound, I did the ultrasound. And um, this was, uh, so we have, uh, so it's just one image, sorry, which shows a solid lesion. What is, what is, why is it solid? Because A, it looks solid, B, it's got internal vascularity. So we send him for an MRI, and on the MRI, I won't show you all the images, but I'll show you the main one. So here is the MRI, which shows that uh, lesion. And this is a T1-weighted fat-suppressed uh, post-contrast image. Uh, and again, oh, you need an axial to tell, isn't it? Well, actually, it's not involving the vessels. We can tell from that, right? So you need an axial, do you? Shall I mag it? Because you're staging, I'm not. You tell me what you want. So this is the compressed tissue. Can you see around it? So this is the pseudo capsule that I was talking about. Which muscle is that? Which muscle is it in? Any idea? Shouts. There's only three or four options. Scroll one small. Choices? What happened? Rudely interrupted. <laughs> but uh, here we go. So it is sartorius. I was going to give you choices. Uh, but 
your trick worked. I think they flickered the screen, took the image off, and I forgot. I was asking you the name of the muscle, and I gave it to you myself. Anyway, so this is sartorius. It is within the sartorius, isn't it? It's not gone beyond the sartorius. It's still within the sartorius. Yeah? Happy with that? We measured it at what? Did we measure the maximum length? And when we're talking about the T stage, we're measuring the maximum length, right? Okay. So it is all within the sartorius muscle. It is intracompartmental. So this is a 2A, right? So you can remove. If, you, if you've got a good surgeon who can clear the fat planes very nicely, they can just demuscularize. You can remove the sartorius. You don't need your sartorius. It'll be a little bit wobbly when you're trying to do your dances like yesterday. Uh, but uh, it'll be fine. Your leg will be preserved. And this is an Anakin 2A. But lengthwise, because we're doing it properly, did I measure it? I forgot whether I did or not. That's another thing that happens after 40. <laughs> you forget. So tiny measure. Well, that's 6 centimeter actually, underestimating. So that's a T1 tumor, Anakin 2A. Very good prognosis. Okay. You might argue, for those who are listening, sir, sir there is a heterogeneous enhancement. Said, yeah, that is there. That is, there is heterogeneous enhancement. There's slightly bad prognostic features. But anyway, I'll close the session with this. So we've looked at it, and you've actually staged two tumors as well, one bone tumor and a soft tissue sarcoma. So uh, that's it. Thank you. Have you got any questions? We don't. We not in our center. I know, sir. There are bigger centers, and what? So there are some. Our local sarcoma center, as we call it, is Liverpool. Okay, but even then, I know all the Liverpool musculoskeletal radiologists. They don't do dynamic contrast imaging. But if you look at some research centers, if you go to Royal Marsden in London, they do. But most people don't do it because. NHS is very focused towards um, getting the useful information, what is relevant for the people, and the rest is used for research, which is done in research institutes. So yes, you can do that, but it doesn't really add anything to what we already know. There are two reasons for doing fancy things. One's because you like, enjoy doing it, feels great, and the other thing is sometimes the orthopedic surgeons and the other, they want you to do it. Isn't it? But from the relevance point of view, um, you're absolutely right. It, is, it doesn't really add anything. It is not like a prostate cancer. It's not like a prostate cancer staging where your dynamic enhancement actually multi-parametric imaging or a breast lesion and you're doing a breast MR where the dynamic enhancement pattern will help you to decide malignant versus non-malignant. That is, is not that relevant. They look at it, but from our point of view, I mean, with that, for example, soft tissue mass, no matter what your dynamic contrast tells you, it is a tumor, and that is going to come out. So we don't end up doing it. But it's a very useful question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ganguly, please continue the next session also. Another 20 minutes or so, 20, 25 minutes. But before that, I'd like to declare the result of our poster presentation. So the first is, uh, Dr. Sivangi Misrao. <laughs> Second, Dr. Amiteshwar Randhawa. And third is Dr. Uh, Rai Ki Nam Oshi, uh, Ki Ranjan Rai. Oisarja Ranjan Rai. Okay. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Jiban J is uh, Oisarja Ranjan Rai is who? You are Oisarja Ranjan Rai. Okay. Uh, but only uh, you will be asked to present your case in the last session, means between 3 and 5. Everybody will get 10 plus 2 minutes? Yeah, 10 minutes, I think, yeah. 
Ten minutes should be good enough, isn't it? Just to educate us, because it'll be good to actually hear you talk about it, and that'll help you as well. So yeah, ten minutes should be good enough. But uh, another, uh, actually, there is a dispute between third and fourth, frankly speaking. But uh, uh, we have ultimately chosen Dr. Jeevan J. Another good paper was Dr. Aisha Jaranjan Rai. Okay, so he should be fourth. We, because we, we will declare only three, that's why I said three names. But fourth is also good. A.R. Rai. Aisha Jaranjan Rai. Okay? Yeah, I think I think it'll be a bit injustice, yeah, to to not include. There were four which caught the eye, definitely. So hence, yeah, thank you, Dr. Karim. So remind me what the next session is. Is it patellofemoral instability? Is that right? Yeah. Uh, I like that exercise of showing the actual case. Can I show you an actual case? There are loads of cases actually, but I will, do, 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 do. let's show you, which one should I show you? Maybe I'll show you this one. So this patient actually came to us uh, post an injury and this is just the axial MRI. So our standard sequences you can see on the left, we do three uh, PD weighted sequences and one uh, T1W sequence. We always include a T1W. Um, why do we include a T1W sequence? Do you know? Why do we have a T1W sequence? Why do we need a T1 weighted sequence? For those coming up to the exam, why do we need it? Can we just do PT weighted images and leave it at that? Because that's your fancy thing. That's what shows you the marrow edema. That's what shows you the defect. T1 weighted is basically to look at the marrow, isn't it? That's the only thing that shows you the marrow properly. Doesn't matter if there is high signal on STIR or PT weighted fat sat. You want to see the marrow on T1 to see if it is bright or not. That's where the first changes happen. Even menisci and things like that. I don't want to go into the physics. But T1, we don't look at T1, is where the first change happens, basically. Okay? It sounds counterintuitive. If you're doing a 2A, they'll ask you, when you see a meniscal tear and you see a high signal, where you see high signal on um, your PDFS and STIR images and other fluid sensitive, but where does it actually happen first? It happens on T1 first. T1 we use for problem solving. Uh, but T1 is very important for most of these things. So this is a patient who actually had, so we, the actual uh, clinical was undisclosed, but here's a patient, and I'll scroll through. You can see the edema in the patella, right? Um, medial aspect of the patella. You can see the edema in the lateral aspect of the femur. I don't know whether you've seen these cases here or not. We see them very, very, very commonly. You almost see one every day. That's as common as you, if you're reporting MR in the UK. Uh, so this is patella dislocation, previous patella dislocation. So you wouldn't have, so this is, some people call it kissing contusion. I don't generally like the term, uh, but uh, this is edema in the medial aspect of the patella and the lateral aspect of the femur. What does that mean? Your patella has come and hit this part. It's like a hill sacs lesion. Again, as I was saying, same principle in a different place. You know, this is a bipolar lesion like the shoulder. So the patella has come and hit there. So basically, even without looking at the MR, you can say there has to be a full thickness tear of the MPFL. You can't not, you can't have the patella going from there to there and hitting the bone and making an impact with intact ligaments. It's just physically not possible. Okay, so you must have. But obviously on this one, we can see that the MPFL is torn. So more about that. We can come back to this case uh, once we have looked at our presentation. So I'll show you a different case. 18-year-old um, male. Um, by the way, it's more common in women. Uh, most of the ones that we see more common in women, unless it's you know sort of major trauma um, of some sort. Now this was an 18-year-old who had fallen down a full flight of stairs. And that's what the MR looked like, okay? So 
there is zero doubt that the patella is dislocated. Now, this is actually very, 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 very rare. You hardly ever image with the actual patella dislocated. Okay, you hardly ever. Uh, this is probably the only one that I can remember in the last 10 years where the patella actually is dislocated. Most of the time, it relocates uh, back, and which is why it's often called patella subluxation. And obviously, here there is daylight between the ligament and the patella. Okay, so this is this is full thickness MPFL tear, but we'll have a look at some other examples. This is another patient. This is what we normally tend to see. Uh, well, actually, more than one patient. There are three. These are three different patients. This is what we normally tend to see in our MRI. So we see the contusion in the medial aspect of the patella and the lateral aspect of the femur, which is a telltale sign that the patella has come and hit this part of the bone, uh, and hence the patella must have dislocated at some point in future. Um, just as an in question, how long do you think this marrow edema will stay? If I do an MRI three months later, do you think this would have gone? The answer is actually tricky. It is yes and no. Generally, we expect it to go down at least by six weeks. Okay, But the edema is very slow to resolve. It follows clinical symptoms. So your knee will feel a lot better way before your edema disappears on the MRI. So if you just base it on the MRI, it will keep looking abnormal. But the patient will say, well, my knee feels better. So bear that in mind. So the edema is a lot slower to resolve. Okay? But as a general rule of thumb, when we look at edema, if I see transient osteopenia in a tarsal bone on a foot MR or a hand or the elbow or the shoulder, I'll ask for them to repeat. Or if I think it's a stress fracture, there are different types of stress fracture. We're not going into it. It's a grade one stress fracture, a grade two stress fracture. I would say repeat MR in six weeks to check for resolution or improvement or whatever. So that's our general interval. At three months, it should go. The same principle applies when you're looking at vertebral wedge compression fractures as well. You can do diffusion. Diffusion has its limitation, I was saying. The only proof in the pudding, as we say, is when you do repeat an MR in six weeks and the edema is now gone from that wedge compression fracture and you can see the T1 signal. That means it was, sometimes it can be very difficult despite of diffusion and things to decide whether a, rest, you know, whether a collapse is truly metastatic or not. I'm talking about the ones where you can't see soft tissue extension and things. If there is a big soft tissue extension thing, that's different. Right, come back to patella, uh, trochlear dysplasia. So, this is another example where the MPFL is completely torn. Uh, there's obviously bruising all around uh, the knee. Um, I don't know how you describe it. Over the last few years, we've moved on, and we encourage our trainees to do that as well. Often, we use the word bruising compared to edema, uh, because that is what actually is happening. It is bruising of the tissue in an acute scenario, isn't it? If you tear a tendon, if you tear a ligament, tear a muscle, break a bone, you bruise. Okay, so it feels more medical rather than just edema. Edema, you know, edema is just high signal. Uh, so anyway, this highlights the other thing that you can get when the patella comes and impacts on the trochlea. You can get osteochondral injury. Okay? So as we will see later, uh, or actually when we, we'll go to it when we, uh, uh, when we get there. So uh, the couple of things is obviously a rad source. Uh, I acknowledge for the, some of the images that I will use. Orthobullets is actually really, really useful. Um, I started using orthobullets when I did orthopedics. I've carried on with it even when I'm doing radiology because they often give you an orthopedic highlight to a lot of things. And Dr. Kaplan, as usual, used to be my mentor. Some of his uh, images I've used. So we'll talk about the anatomy. We'll look at patellar geometry and trochlear geometry quickly, patellar femoral alignment, and look at cases as we go along. Um, and we'll come back to our case at the end. Um, and I'll get you to tell me what sort of dysplasia we're dealing with on that case that we saw at the start, okay? A uh, bit like we did with the tumor staging. So, uh, I am not going to, for those who feel sick by looking at this, by all means, you can look away. And should I remove the picture? Um, it, the patella is dislocated again, which is also quite an unusual uh, way to present. Generally, patellar instability is a condition which is characterized by either subluxation or dislocation of the patella. Both uh, are in the same group. They are a result of either injury or ligament laxity, and which ends up um, with increasing the Q angle. For those who don't know about Q angle, I'll explain the concept of the Q angle in a minute. Do I measure the Q angle? I don't, because it is 
partly clinical. Physios do it, they're very good at doing it, but we don't. There's a hundred other things to measure, so that's one thing that we leave it to them. Okay, and again, when I say 100 other things to measure, I will focus on the ones that I measure and what is more relevant and what has um, literature backing the uh, measurements. Okay, there's a random measurements and an orthopedic surgeon will come and do, do this particular thing. We don't always do all of them, so I'll go into that in a minute. General treatment principle is management is conservative, okay, unless you've got two things. You've got a cartilage avulsion, or a chondral loose body, or a fragment of bone which is avulsed and is floating about. That's the only, only indication for an urgent arthroscopy. Everything else should be managed conservatively in the acute phase with physio um, and you know knee braces and support. Okay. Uh, there are different types of chronic uh, surgical repair that comes into uh, repair of trochlear dysplasia, but we'll we'll have a quick look at them at the end. Um, so Q angle basically is a clinical measure. You can measure my Q angle now by just looking at it. So it's basically from the ILU, uh, ASIS, uh, anterior superior iliac spine, to the middle of the patella, which is the line of force of the quadriceps tendon, okay? And the line of force of the patella tendon, which is from the middle of the patella to the tibial tuberosity. It's the angle between them, okay? That is called the Q angle. And the more, if you think about it, stop and think, and when you do radiology, it is, uh, I go on and on about this, stop and think what you do every time you do something. Why is it important? The more, if my Q angle is very raised, which way is my leg going to go? That way. The more the leg goes that way, the patella is going to get pulled that way, isn't it? It's like a bowstring. All my muscles and force are going that way. Whereas if my leg was to go this way, the patella will come this way. So generally, it doesn't go this way. It always goes outwards. So that's the reason for looking at the Q angle. That's why the physios look at the Q angle, because they get a good idea. Now, annoyingly, like J cubitus valgus, and what's it called? The bowing uh, of the elbow, uh, carrying angle of the elbow, um, the the uh, Q angle is different between men and women. It should be less than 22 degrees in extension and 18 degrees in extension in men, uh, but varies, and it's not a very good guide, but it is an indicator all the same, okay? So what are the risk factors for patellar dislocation? One is lax ligaments. Uh, Ella Dunlop syndrome, we see that very, very, very commonly in the UK, very common, okay? Um, Previous dislocation, subluxation, just because there is injury makes it prone to get another injury. What's called the miserable malalignment syndrome. Uh, you probably haven't heard this term. It's kind of a physio-led term and an orthopedic term. It basically means um, you've got three things, increased antiversion of the femur. So femurs rotated that way. You've got genu valgum, so the knee has gone that way, and the tibia has got external torsion, so the tibia has rotated that way. Uh, so it makes the Q angle worse. So hence your lateral force worse, hence dislocation worse, okay? Again, there is no time, so I will not be going into tibial um, uh, torsion and femoral antiversion me measurement. When we are doing a full leg alignment profile, they are part of our assessment, but I, don't, I won't have time today to go into them. Uh, but so we will stick to the patellofemoral alignment only. So anatomically, there are other risk factors. What are, the, what are these? Patella alter. If your patella is very high, then the force transmission is abnormal and you can get it. If you've got an abnormal patella tilt, the patella is already sitting in a funny way. It's kind of waiting to be pushed over, so that'll go. Um, trochlear dysplasia, one of the important things. Lateral femoral condyle hyperplasia. And muscle also is important. You know, uh, hyperplastic lateral muscles and dysplastic medial muscles will pull. Everything, if you stop and think for a second, everything that increases force on the lateral side compared to the medial side will cause it, okay? Um, I have the medial structures, I didn't remove it, it was part of a registrar talk when I was talking about ligaments, so I didn't remove it because it, it is still there. So we look at the medial supporting structures, MPFL is part of it, although most of it is MCL. So the medial supporting structures are commonly injured in any sort of knee injury, okay? And often MPFL is injured during an MCL injury, okay? I'll tell you why, which we'll see in a minute. Uh, most of them are in, you know, during sports uh, event and things. Now, there are three layers, as I was talking about yesterday, and some people are already aware of it. So the Warren and Marshall, they did some work and came up with these three layers of um, structures in the, what's called, they call it the medial stabilizing structures, MSS. So layer one is just the deep fascia, and they're colored 
as per the annotation, uh, the deep uh, fascia, the vast fascia of the vastus medialis and sartorius muscle. Um, layer two is a superficial MCL, which is in continuity with the MPFL. So when you injure the MCL, you often bruise your MPFL as well. Although it is not a patellar dislocation, that's where the MPFL laxity comes in. And the deep layer, which is the deep MCL and the true joint capsule. So as you will see from uh, these two images, uh, yeah, you can see the arrow. It's, it's quite busy, so it's hard to see the arrow. So where the femoral insertion of the MCL is, MPFL plumps into the same place. Okay, it's pretty much same place. So this is an axial um, PDFS image which shows the MPFL as it goes and inserts towards the femoral condyle. And this is the MCL insertion on an axial image. Okay, so this is it again in a different slice. Okay, now with MCL injury, the grades of ligament injury were all originally described by MCL, okay. Uh, but we use it everywhere. Basically, grade one is when there is soft tissue edema surrounding the MCL. Grade two is when there is edema around and also within. And grade three is when there is discontinuity. So this is edema around the MCL, which is a grade one. This is edema to the MCL and around it. So this is a grade two. And this is where it's flapping about in the wing with wind, which is grade three. So complete dissociation of the ligament. So same thing applies to the MPFL as well. So on the left of your picture is a partial tear of the MPL, MPFL. There is a high signal around it and within it. In the middle is a full thickness tear of the MPFL from the patella. And the patella is bruised and there is discontinuity of the actual uh, ligament and this is a full thickness tear of the MPFL at the femoral end and the MPFL is floating about there and there is actual discontinuity in the MPFL. So patella always dislocates laterally, always. It never dislocates in the medial side and it is because of the Q angle and the risk and the uh, imbalance of lateral force is the right word. Um, and it hits the lateral femoral condyle and hence you get the contusions in the medial patella and the lateral femoral condyle as we saw. Uh, so this is just another uh, axial image of the, of the three structures and that's relevant. So MCL and MPFL are quite closely related. VMO is vastus medialis obliquus which is the lowermost fibers of vastus medialis. Um, so we look at patellofemoral alignment and again, plain film. We start with a plain film, okay? Now, I have just shown you four out of interest and also because of lack of space. There is at least 10 other different types, including something called Carvalho's index, which I don't know whether you've heard about. Our orthopedic surgeon seems to be quite excited by the Carvalho's index. Now, I, I can't even remember and I don't even know what they, but I have to look up. The ones which I use are these two. One is the insol solvati ratio, which is also called the patella tendon height ratio, and it's quite straightforward. And the other one is what's called the caton Duchamp. It's actually quite straightforward, although it looks complicated. Basically, you draw a line along the uh, sclerotic margin of the tibia that you can see, and then it's the same, and then it's the height of that against that. It's the easiest one that the orthopedic surgeons very, very commonly use. So hence, it's useful, because orthopedic surgeons are taught that insol salvati has gone out of the way, you know, has, has gone out of vogue, so it's modified insol salvati. Then they get confused which one to follow, so they have left both and they follow Caton Duchamp. So Caton Duchamp is uh, one of the commoner ones that most of our surgeons use. There's something else that uh, the person that I do a lot of reporting for uh, likes is patellotrochlear index. So this is kind of another measure of patella alta because if you think about it, what is patella tendon height? What are they measuring? They're essentially measuring whether you've got patella alta or not. Because remember, I said patella alta is a risk factor. If your patella is sitting too high, then it is more likely to dislocate, okay? It's like a train track, isn't it? The trochlea is like a groove, it's a train track. If the patella doesn't engage on the track, then it'll go wherever it wants to go, whichever side the muscle is pulling. That's the principle. If it can engage, that's the whole principle of surgery as well. If it can engage, then it'll stay. If it can't engage, so hence, so much importance about the top of the trochlea. So anyway, so if the patella is high, patella alta, then clearly it is not sitting on the track at all. So wherever it's pulling, it'll go that way. So you will have a dislocation every day. So patellotrochlear index is the height of the cartilage 
of the trochlea covered by the patella divided by the height of the patella as a percentage. Now, the original paper of Bidet, he called uh, patella alta as 0.12, but you know, current based on multiple hundreds of paper, they say if it is less than, I use 20%, I use 0 0.2, 0 0.18, I don't like two decimals, so I use 20%. So I'd measure G by B if it comes 20% or less than its patella alta, okay? Or I report it as there is evidence of reduced patellotrochlear chondral overlap within bracket 15% suggestive or indicating of patella alta. That's how I would word the report. TTTG, very, very common. It was in vogue. That is the one measure that you need to know, okay? Not anymore. So a lot of paper has now come out saying that the TTTG changes with the degree of flexion of your knee. So we have found that on CTs and MRs, and MR knee is done on 30 degree. Oh, by the way, that reminds me, all these x-rays have to be done at 30 degree flexion, right? Your measurement is useless if it is not on 30 degree flexion. So make sure the image is proper. Uh, even if you're not, the orthopedic surgeons are very, very rigid about these things, um, at least uh, in our place. So anyway, TTTG basically is, what is it measuring? If you think on an axial plane, we are measuring where is the tibial tuberosity and where is the trochlear groove. So here I've shown it on one image. When I'm actually doing it, and I'll do the exercise when I'm showing you the case which I showed you at the start, you can't do it on an MR on the same image. You either put a mark or a line or... If you're impatient like me, you put your cursor there and scroll through the image until you find the tibial tuberosity and then put a mark where the cursor is and then measure how far is the distance. So there are different ways. There are multiple ways of belling the cat. As long as it's, you know, and it's not an exact science. But yeah, so TTTG generally is regarded as abnormal if it is more than 20, borderline 15 to 20. So as I was going uh, saying, what they found is that the knee in varying degrees of flexion, the TTTG can change from under 15 millimeter to over 20 millimeter, okay? I know a patient where the surgeons uh, didn't repair, just repeated the MR, and I measured the TTTG on two separate occasions, and I got Curtis, who's uh, obviously the knee surgeon I work with, so we measured it together, and it was like 14 degree in one and 23 in the other. So Curtis was saying, I don't want to repair you know, this. I don't want to do a trochleoplasty. And then we had to look up, and then we found there were loads of papers finding what we have found. And we found last time, and it was sore, you know, a sore knee is bent knee. You know, we have relaxed joint positions whenever we're sore. When our hip is sore, we bend our hip, okay? So knee, when it's sore, they'll have a little bit of a flexion, like the guy yesterday who was limping. So because of that flexion, we measured, over-measured the TTTG last time. This time, the swelling's gone, and the knee's not as flexed, and the TTTG came as 14. So you can't, it's something that you can't control. So hence, people are looking at it with a pinch of salt. But what is it measuring? It's measuring how lateral is your tibial tuberosity compared to the patella. As in, how lateral is the same principle as a Q angle. How much lateralized is the whole thing? How much is your patella lateralized? How much over imbalance of force is there? That's all that's measuring. Same thing here, or similar sort of thing. This is patella tilt, which we measure against the posterior femoral condyle. So generally, if it is... I use the word opening medially because like a clam, like a shell, whichever way. So I report this as the patella opens medially by 20 degree in keeping with abnormal patella tilt. Okay, as simple as that. If it is less than that, it isn't. Then comes the patellar morphology. Now this used to be in vogue and a lot of people used to be excited by type one patella, type two. I see a lot of old musculoskeletal radiologists in the UK who still say type two, type three patella, gone out of the window. It doesn't matter what type of patella you have. Okay, they're all equally likely or less likely. That is not the primary cause. The primary cause for dislocation is something else, no matter what patella, okay? If you do a patella replacement, take this patella out and put it in a ping pong ball, it'll still dislocate because the trochlea is dysplastic. The force is different. The tilt is abnormal. There are a hundred other things that's important. So it does not play any role in corrective surgery at all. If you feel like, you can tell the type, well, we don't, so I don't. Most of us are not interested. What is more relevant 
is the gelsomer type, which you probably haven't heard about, uh, which is basically the shape of the patella on the sagittal view. How often do we do patella, you know, axial skyline view and try and look at the patella? We're looking at an MR knee all the time. So it makes sense that gelsomer came up with the types of patella. So this middle one in America is called Chirano nose deformity. Chirano is kind of an animal, or yeah, which has got a very long kind of nose. So it's a prominent uh, inferior pole of the patella, just a normal anatomical variant, but it is called gelsomer type 2. This is actually the reason why they had to give up and come up with the modified insole salvati, because they found that the patella length was often variable, and not all of it is articular surface. Sometimes articular surface is only half, less than half of the patella, if it's a gelsomer type 2. And some they found is like a round ball, as I was saying, ping pong ball. So they are more likely to have a chance of dislocation if there is patella alta, not just by itself, if there is patella alta, a gelsomer type 3, which is round like a ball, if you think of the physical principle of it, it's more likely to go this way and that way than somebody with facets. That's all there is to that. Trochlear morphology, this is where the money is. This is where we, where, where we actually assess. So we do traditional axial radiographs. Um, we tend to do merchant's view, which is shot from the top. Uh, so the film, uh, or the digital X-ray or cassette is on the tibial side. You can also do what is called a Lorin view, which is a bit easier when the patient come in acutely. And in this case, you get them to hold the cassette on their thigh, on their leg, rest it on their leg, and the beam comes from top down. Okay, sorry, from down up towards uh, towards the patient. Now, there's a lot of confusion regarding um, Dijon classification, and I don't know whether you guys use classification uh, of these uh, or not, but mainly because there were two people, Henry Dijon and David Dijon, father and son, actually, working in the same hospital over a period of about, he's still carrying on, actually, David Dijon, although he's as old as, you know, he's, he's about, you know, 12 years older than me. Um, so he's as old as, uh, you know, that. But they, 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 for the last 50 or 60 years, they've been working on trochlear dysplasia only. You know, amazing, amazing that they can actually get away with it. But all these original things we're coming up with um, were, were Henry Dijon, okay? And then David, by that time, got used to CT and MR, has come up with a lot of this. So when we say Dijon classification, we use David Dijon's classification, which is A, B, C, D. Fairly straightforward. A is a shallow trochlea, okay? B is a flat trochlea. Basically, I used to remember it by B flat, as in mu musical scale for those who, you know, play the piano or the guitar or sing and things. B flat. That's how I used to remember that B is flat. And that means C is basically, you can think of it as convex or asymmetry of the facets. Okay, convex or asymmetry. Uh, and D is when it's like a cliff, when it protrudes uh, entirely. So basically, we often use, why is it relevant? A surgeon will easily, easily do a trochleoplasty on a D sorry, B, but they won't on an A. B, they can justify in court and say why they've done a trochleoplasty if everything goes south, if it's a Dijon type B. Uh, and they would sometimes put pressure on us to say, do you not think this is B? And I would say, no, it's a very shallow A. Uh, because B gives them the lever leverage or leverage to go a bit beyond. So we, as I was saying initially, it's all about engaging at the top of the trochlea, okay? If your patella engages in the trochlea, it'll stay on track. It's like a rail line, okay? It's, think of it that way. If it doesn't engage, and all that is at the top of your trochlea. Hence, when Furman did their paper in 2000, they did all the measurements at one centimeter, two centimeter, three centimeter, and they found that the three centimeter measurements were the most representative, specific, and sensitive of trochlear dysplasia in their patient. So if you actually look at it, and I can do that, remind me when I'm actually looking at the case, by default, where we do our measurement, we actually choose three centimeter. I never measure. I only start where I can see the trochlear cartilage confidently. And if I now go back and compare with the sagittal limit, it is about three centimeter. So, you know, it, 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 you know it, it, there's no you know, special magic in it. So here are the things that we measure, or I measure. Facet asymmetry. So I draw a line of the median and lateral facet. Uh, and facet dysplasia. So trochlear dysplasia is there. This would be Dijo type C, which is facet asymmetry. If the medial is less than 40%. So I divide the medial by lateral and see if it is less than 0.4. If it is, then it's type C dysplasia. Okay. 
trochlear depth, something I measure, and there are another 350 ways of measuring the trochlear depth. People do it in all different ways. This is the traditional way. Some complicated orthopedic surgeon sitting with a cup of coffee with a radiologist came up with this. I tend to do this. Okay, but truly, <laughs> this, is, this is what you should be doing if you're doing a paper on trochlear dysplasia. But when you're deporting normally, because uh, do, not, do you guys use PACs? So we've got a software which is called, um, which is GE or Centricity PACs actually. Um, so they have something, a measure called um, midline shift. So if I draw two lines, and then put a point on the septum pellucidum, it tells me how much is a midline shift. So I use that for the trochlear dysplasia. I too put two points at the two most prominent part of the trochlea anteriorly, and it tells me what's the depth. And so I use that, which I think is quite reproducible. I've never, yeah, I suppose you could do a short paper on that, uh, of actually using that tail. That's how people publish. If you look at Japanese, Korean papers, American papers, and people in the south as well, southern part of India, very, very, I see a lot of, you know, sort of work that's sort of coming out of there. And that's all they do. They, sometimes things are very simple, but they come up with it and share what they do with everyone else. And you suddenly get, you know, sort of groundbreaking research from that. But anyway, so that's how I measure the trochlear depth. But this is the true way of measuring. You draw a line, draw a line along the posterior margin of the condyle. Then you draw a perpendicular from the highest point of the medial and lateral, okay? And then the highest point from the middle. And then you basically subtract this from them. It is quite a complicated way, or you can look into it, but I don't want to spend 10 minutes trying to explain that. Uh, so I'll move on. So generally less than three millimeter is trochlear dysplasia. The other one is lateral trochlear inclination. Now, some surgeons like it. My, the person I work for, the two of them, I do most of these for. And so Curtis Robb is one of the surgeons who actually operates on professional players. So he is very, he's quite a high-end orthopedic surgeon, uh, operating on peoples that you see actually on, on your telly, you know, in Olympics and things like that. So he, he doesn't like this. So I tend not to do the lateral trochlear inclination, but if it is less than 11 degree, that is also a sign of trochlear dysplasia. So those are the measurements that I do. Patella alta, so tendon height ratio, patellotrochlear index, okay, TTTG, still do it, although with a pinch of salt, trochlear grade, okay, uh, sorry, type, uh, the depth, and uh, the, um, the facet asymmetry or symmetry. That's all that I do. Um, so I don't want to give you lots of percentage I was saying. The other measures I'll just go into. So this is people who do these have seen these appearances. So ventral prominence, this, is, this was originally on an x-ray by Henry Dijor, but David Dijor just confirmed that, yes, I agree with that. Okay, on an MR, you do the same thing. You drop a line from the femoral cortex, and you find that it's 8 millimeter or more, then it's a prominent ventral, which is, uh, which is a sign of trochlear dysplasia, more than 8 mil uh, millimeter. Now, it, can, it has been described by some people. People come up with signs wherever they can. So it's called a nipple sign, and you can have a small or a prominent one. And again, they are signs of trochlear dysplasia. Um, there we go. Sulcus angle, gone out of vogue again. Uh, but if you were to measure it, Henry Dijur used to measure it in the days of X-ray and skyline views only. 145 or more is supposed to be abnormal, but there's wide variation. So again, I don't measure it unless specifically asked. This is a new one that's coming in. This is like absolutely hot off the press. Bisect offset. This is, I don't know whether you've even heard about it. Some orthopedic surgeons are very excited about it. Um, so basically, it is measuring how lateralized your tro patella is. You could do that by drawing a line. So do you know, I forgot to mention the lateralization bit. So to, to measure lateralization, we do draw a line in the posterior femoral, along the posterior femoral condyle, draw a perpendicular along the edge of the trochlea and see how far out is the patella jutting out. If it is more than six millimeter, we consider it as abnormal. So the more out it's sitting, it's easier to push it over. Think of it that way. So it's more likely to dislocate. So bisect offset basically is seeing how much. So there is basically a, yeah. So uh, basically B by A. B is how much of the patella sits to the lateral aspect of this line through the middle of the trochlea. So basically it's a roundabout way of saying that the patella is a bit more uh, lateralized. But some people um, do it, uh, including these people. I think they are from somewhere south. 
actually, who found that it's 100% accurate. I mean, I, I don't know how. They actually found 99 point something, but I removed that point because it was quite annoying. But anyway, they say 100% accurate if it bisect offset. But uh, again, take it with a pinch of salt. So what surgery do they do? So this is called albitrochleoplasty. As you can see, it makes sense now, isn't it? They're just deepening the groove. All they want is the patella to engage. That's why it was all your, if you remember one thing, remember that you measure it at the top at three centimeter, first slice where you see the trochlear cartilage confidently. Um, and it's, it's the depth and the symmetry at that level that is relevant. So trochleoplasty is this. You can do a wedge trochleoplasty. This is what Henry Dijor used to do in the 1960s, basically a deepening trochleoplasty. So not only do you wedge on this side, do you wedge on the other side as well. And there are multiple different ways of belling the cat. So this is another way of deepening the groove. When there's a prominent notch, you dig a triangular wedge and cave the bone in to make a groove so that the patella sits there. So there are multiple ways. So if your tibia tuberosity is too lateral, you can move the tibial tuberosity higher up and medially. So you can do, so these are some sorts of corrective surgery, which will which are you know tibial tuberosity osteotomy. Um, and they move the tibia to, again, change the line of force effectively back to the Q angle. You're changing so that your force is not to the lateral direction. It's more in the central midline. So that's the whole principle behind all these things. And that's, that's pretty much it. But uh, let me finish this, and I'll bring in, in two minutes, if the screen allows, I'll bring this up and I'll split it. Sorry, I didn't want to get that close. Oh, I've already got it. Good man, I'm ready. Uh, so, well, as I promised, it's not me. So we know we've, this guy or this lady um, has got trochlear display. Well, he's got patellar dislocation. We don't know whether he's got trochlear dysplasia or not. So we can work out if he's got trochlear dysplasia. So can we? So how do I measure it? Or how do I assess it very quickly? So let's stop in the midline sagittal, okay? So notice, and let me see whether it's projecting well. So notice, which way am I going? I'm going the right way, yeah. So if I go up, that's where I start seeing the trochlear cartilage a little bit. Where's my arrow? On this side, I can see the cartilage, but I can't really see it confidently on this side. So I won't be doing my measurement here. Okay, I'll wait, sorry, wrong way. I'll wait till I can confidently see it. Okay, don't get too confident because then you're way down. Okay, so first slice where I can confidently see it, I have to look at this image, but this is where I can actually confidently see it on my workstation, okay? It might project differently to you. At that lamine, I mean, this is not a PAX workstation. I'll drop a dot and a line to mark the surface of the patella. And then I'll see how deep is it. That's two millimeter. So what have we got? We've got a trochlear dysplasia as the cause. What type? A, at least. It's not B, B flat. Okay, I always remember the B flat bit. So A, um, for sure. Uh, now, at that level, I need to get rid of all of them. Think backspace, backspace. If I now, now I, unfortunately it won't let me, you can get your calculators out. From the middle, if I measure the medial facet and I measure the lateral facet, okay? So that's 7 point, f so 2.5 and 7.5. Basically, straight away, 2.5 by 7.5, 1.3. So that's 33, so less than 0.4. So actually, not only is this shallow, there is facet asymmetry, so this is a type C. Right? B flat. That's why I remember. I always remember the B flat and then I go this way, which is just shallow A, and go that way in my mind. Because you need to be able to see. If you don't visualize things, you won't remember things. So this is actually type C. So I'll say there is Dijon type C dysplasia. I don't need to tell them the asymmetry. I'll say it's a Dijon type C trochlear dysplasia with a maximum depth of two millimeter. And notice what? Where was I doing my measurement? As if by magic, let me see from the knee joint, where am I? Oh, crikey, sorry. 
Okay, let's remember, I'll, I'll start from that direction, okay, so that uh, I'm not cheating then. So from there, oh, it doesn't, oh, because I'm on that line, it doesn't recognize the line. Okay, so I'll have to remember, keep my mouse there and move one slice, so it's just above that slice, even roughly, why wouldn't it measure? Comes to, oh, actually, thank you for waiting. It's just under three centimeter. So even by default, when you start seeing the trochlea, it is roughly about three centimeters. So I never measure that three centimeter and go and measure there. The, the case in the point is to look at the trochlea when you first can see it confidently. And by default, you'll be at three centimeter. That's all I wanted to show. So does this patient have patella alta? He's got other things, but I wouldn't go into all the measurement. But uh, yeah, essentially, it probably does have a bit of uh, patella alta. If I was doing a caton deschamp here, I'll measure, I'll put a line across the top of the tibia and I'll measure the height of that from the patella. If I was doing a patellotrochlear index, I'll measure, and this guy does not have an abnormal index because I can see that much of the trochlea and that much of the patella. So clearly, it is not less than 20%. It's nearly half, even visually. So there is no reduced overlap. So his main problem is the dysplastic trochlea. So if they do a wedge trochleoplasty, um, it'll be fine. Now, I told you to remind me to do the TTTG. So how do I do the TTTG? I always scroll the wrong way first. I'll put my marker there, which is in the middle. So here, you don't have to be at the top. You stay at the deepest part of the groove, okay, for TTTG. I put my marker at the deepest part of the groove, and then I go down where the, clearly our MR technicians haven't done a good MR, and we should have brought the patient back. So I should be doing what I preach, but clearly I didn't. But anyway, so they should have gone down to, this is the last slice of the image. So they haven't gone down. So from my point where I had for the groove, I'll measure the middle of the patella tendon. So it measures eight. Now, you can measure the patella tendon or the tibial tuberosity. There's no hard and fast rule. So it is under 15 millimeter. So it is actually normal. So there's no case for distalization or relocation of the tibial tuberosity. The only surgery that this girl will need is trochleoplasty. They'll just deepen the groove and the trochlea will engage. So that's it. You've, you know. So I hope that gives you an overview of how we read them. Um, and unlike yesterday when we were doing ultrasound, I thought, like the tumor one, if you do a stage and if you read one together, uh, then it gives you a better feel of how it is. It's not just myth and whim. This is something that we actually do. And you can do that all under 10 minutes. Some people can do it under five minutes, you know, if you're used to doing it regularly. We report about 40 knees a day, roughly, when we are paid per case, and about two a day when we are not paid per case. But that's how it works, generally. But um, you can do it quite rapidly once you're used to, and you, you have a set pattern of what you measure. But feel free to ask me any questions. Uh, you can, you can. So I didn't go into it because, again, it expands in, you know, 30 minutes. We are still on, already way beyond 30 minutes. But, yes, we look at crossover sign, and we look at, A, we can see the lateral edge. So if I go bring back one of the x-rays, um, where's the x-ray? Oh, there. So if I bring that slide up for a second... Right, so on that image, I mean, I'll pick this one because there's nothing overlapping. So obviously here, you know this is trochlea, right? This deeper bit is a line of the trochlea. That is the depth of the trochlea. A lot of people, when they're measuring, and I see that with our senior edges sometimes as well, when they're looking at the patellofemoral joint, they measure this gap. That's not the patellofemoral joint though. The trochlea is there, you know. Of course, that is part of the joint, but it's a multi morphic joint, put it this way, because the patellofemoral is not just one straight compartment. But anyway, um, that 
where it says two is the trochlear floor. So if that trochlear floor line, the sclerotic line, crosses this line, that is called a crossover sign or a figure of eight sign, which is a sign of trochlear dysplasia. You can work that out on a plain film, but it is heavily reliant on your technician doing a true lateral x-ray. If your knee is rotated, then you're screwed because you know it'll always look it's like dysplastic. So that's one thing. And of course, the notch sign that I was talking about in the MR, if you see a big notch-like prominence here, that is also a sign. Straight away, you can see it's a type D. No matter what other types are there, that will override it. It's a type D trochlear dysplasia. And they will do notch plastic and lots of other things for it. But so yes, you can get some signs uh, on that. And of course, we do our uh, assessment of patella tendon height on the plane film as well. Does that yeah, answer your question? Thank you. Okay, so I'll answer one thing at a time. Um, the measurement side of things, most of the measurement are related to the trochlea. Okay, so whether your patella is sitting medial or lateral will not affect your trochlea measurement, right? If you think about it. Without actually looking at a specific case, and I'm more than happy to look at it, uh, it's hard to say. Generally, if your MPFL is torn, you should dislocate or expect it to move laterally unless something else has also injured at that time on the lateral side. Because if you physically think there is nothing else now to keep it. So maybe the learning, learning point is look at it with a senior to see is there anything else wrong? Because as you rightly spotted, it shouldn't be going medially. Unless you've got a concomitant tear of something else or some other lateral ligament. And bear in mind, actually, I didn't show you. I've, I've, I've done day knee workshops, you know, full day of just showing you knee cases. And there's like 30. And I have got one, which is a full thickness ACL tear with a patellar dislocation, which also has I've got MCL tear and other things. So you get a combination. When you've got a severe force injuring your knee, so much force that your MPFL is torn for the patella to dislocate, the same force will take out your MCL as well. So I wouldn't be surprised, and we see multi-ligament injury all the time. We know about Odonius triad. You sometimes, we s I have seen knees where the medial, lateral, ACL, PCL, all four are torn, all of them. Uh, so you can get quite severe injury with them. So maybe there is an additional injury. So that's the learning point. And you could, again, I always think paper. Very, very correct. So, so that is the other thing. In fact, I'll give you, I'll raise you one more. If you find five cases, because I've seen groundbreaking papers written on five and six cases. Six is actually a good number. Five, forget five, six. If you find six or more cases where the patella is not sitting laterally, sitting medially, find them, look at them, get in touch, you can get a paper out of it. Because all your learning point is look at something else. Don't stop at just the patella. That's all your learning point. I always think that way. Think paper. If you think paper, you'll you'll be thinking because that's how that's how you know it'll feel good as well. So yeah, by all means, on a serious note, get in touch, get the number, get in touch with me or other interested local people. Okay. <laughs> That's, that's the good thing about all these didactic, which you don't get uh, with hybrid and virtual lectures. People do ask questions, but the interaction is not the same. I do teach um, online as well at some point, but it does not have the same feel. There is a different feedback when you make eye contact with people you're talking. Yes, you can see some of them are not <laughs> dosing, then you look somewhere else. But at the same time, it's still very useful. It is very useful. When you do this, because in two years, five years, certainly 10 years, you'll be here um, and teaching another group. And it'll, str it'll feel strange, because I remember sitting there and listening to people. Uh, like this and thinking, oh, rubbish, you know, this is, yeah, he doesn't do that, or, or thinking whatever I'm thinking. 
but you know that's how it works that's the lay of the land right i'll stop there have you got a break or oh ankle how do i get out of this one thing that you've got oh ah yeah that's good one thing that you've got to be very careful about whenever you're presenting anywhere outside uk of course it's not allowed but swearing i see that sometimes in people um in the uk presenting because particularly when the slide is stuck and they'll say something and then obviously <laughs> they'll try not to but uh, it have to be sometimes particularly when you get an irish presenter they can they can't complete a single sentence without using a swear word um so swear boxes we call them uh so ankle where is ankle ankle so we were looking at impingement and instability we were supposed to look at impinge instability yesterday what i'll do uh, do you want me to go through it's uh, probably useful going through the anatomy anyway isn't it what time are we looking at 11:30 40 45 minutes yeah by 12:15 okay i'll yeah chop chop i <laughs> uh, i'll try and go through the basics there's no point in see the other thing is there's no point in going through things in a very quick pace because then there is no engagement and no following no understanding and things as well so i'd rather do it slowly but okay so you know that's a cue to stop talking and start doing the presentation sorry i understand <laughs> so um so basically we'll 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 carry on but i'll digress from time to time um to keep you um, guys uh, eyes on the ball as well so this y- y- how many of you report ankles and the rest don't with with somebody else or you, do you look at them at all or even even for fun no okay so ankle here we enter so knee traditionally is often reported by general radiologists right certainly in the uk um if you work in a small dgh spine and knee is reported by general radiologist if you move to a bigger place knee is part of musculoskeletal system we don't trust the general radiologist to be doing justice to the knee they have no idea what a trochlear dysplasia is okay so so general radiologist that's how we look at it in the uk right so they'll be reported if you go to an msk center spine is reported by msk radiologists as well they will tell a general radiologist would know but it's reciprocal so when somebody comes to me trauma ct head and spine the ct head is reported the, and the ct spine will be read by the musculoskeletal radiologist and will tell the reg go and find a general for the head they won't look at the head they leave it and so uh, we as reg say oh, you know there's no head you know person on call today can you not look at it no we are musculoskeletal radiologists but ankle is the first proper also shoulder we talked a lot about shoulder it is a proper msk territory mr so it is a bit busy but it is interesting because again you have to have a systematic approach we look at bones Uh, so how many of you actually do standardized uh, reporting template or template based reporting or do you just look at it and make your own call just there is okay sorry uh, there is a basic template and you follow it okay so i i don't like template based reporting so i don't follow template i follow my head and whichever direction it takes me and i often put the abnormal things first and then some the normal bits at the end i talk about everything but that's the structure of my report i'll put the abnormal things first and then structure so if you if you are doing a musculoskeletal training uh, in oxford you have to do template based reporting and it is extremely extremely boring forget boring it is annoying because i've seen the report the report will be saying tibia normal fibula normal medial navicular uh, medial cuneiform normal okay tibialis posterior normal fdl high signal tendinopathy fhl fluid normal variant you know and then they have a summary that is annoying i wouldn't read a report like that but that's what they do that is the oxford style template based reporting it is really good for trainee registrars who have never heard of what is spr well spr oh that's 
I've never heard of SP around the ankle. But if you have a structure, you will look at everything. Same like a CT chest up to my pelvis. The idea is to look at everything. So I'll go through everything today. The first slide is just showing you the uh, three ankle ligaments, the lateral ligament complex, the ATFL, CFL, and PTFL. Just because they are all a mouthful, I am going to use the abbreviations because the 45 minute will become 55 if I don't use the abbreviation to use the terminology for all of them, okay? So, if, but th these are common terminology. ATFL is anterior talofibular ligament. CFL is calcaneofibular ligament. PTFL is posterior tibiofibular ligament, okay? I've said it once. Um, so ATFL, hopefully there should be a mouse. Okay, so T is for T and F is for fibula, obviously, and that is the ATFL, right? We see it on an axial image. Very quick demonstration of anatomy. PTFL, we should be seeing it on the same axial image. Okay, if it's a true axial image, you should be seeing on the same image. But PTFL is a bit like ACL. So on a T1 weighted or a T2 weighted image, you will see irregular strands in it. That's normal. That is the first thing to lose when PTFL is abnormal. Okay, a bit like the ACL. The first abnormal thing is uniform intermediate signal on T1. Same here. Intermediate signal on T1, uniform, is the first abnormal thing. If somebody wants to know why T1 before other things, I'll tell you later at lunchtime because it's, it's, it is physics, but it's slightly, you know, it, once you understand it, you understand. But anyway, so changes happen on T1 first. But anyway, so ATFL and PTFL on the same axial slice. Then we go to the coronal, and then I go to the coronal to look at CFL. So I look at things at a time. So I'm looking at the ligaments first, okay? So CFL, calcaneofibular ligament, okay? Um, so it, uh, here we go. Here's our arrow, um, described as a boomerang-shaped ligament by the Australians. It is a curved ligament, so it's very difficult. So when I do ankle ultrasound, I actually have to invert the ankle a little bit to see the CFL, otherwise I can't see the CFL. Uh, but I know on an ankle ultrasound, if I'm doing an ankle ultrasound, there is only one structure deep to the peroneal tendon. If you can see anything deep to the peroneal tendon, that is CFL. There is only one structure, okay? So that's the trick. If you can see one thing, that's a CFL. If you can see it, it's there, okay? There is nothing else there visible. Same thing applies on an axial MR because ultrasound is very similar to axial MR, okay? Again, if you can read axial MR, you can do an ankle ultrasound. So this is CFL. That's the only structure deep to the peroneal tendons on an axial image. As you see by the white arrow overlying the bone, that's your CFL, deep to the peroneal tendon. You're seeing its horizontal component on that. The deltoid, obviously I'm not going to test you, has five parts with deeper and superficial components and they all have their own importance. Basically the deeper components are tibio-talar, anterior and posterior, and the rest, superficial ones, I go to medial structures from front to back. They either go into the navicular or spring ligament or sustenticulum tali. So accordingly, they are called that name. But again, if you know the anatomy, even if you don't know, you can waffle and make your way out uh, through there by thinking about it. So here's an example of the deltoid ligament. Like the PTFL, here's another ligament, the deeper component of the deltoid, which has got this striated appearance, okay? In UK, we call it celery-like appearance. I don't, I've never seen celery in India, so I wouldn't know what it's, um, Bangla or Hindi or version of it, um, actually. But celery stick, if you look at celery stick, Google celery stick later, it'll look like. So it has a celery stick-like appearance, okay? Celery is C-E-L-E-R-Y, if you want to Google it. Um, so they have this striated appearance. And the first thing that you see with mucoid degeneration or a type 2 sprain, because remember type 2 sprain, as I was saying, is just high signal within the ligament. Type 1 is high signal around it. Type 2 is high signal within it. Type 3 is a tear, discontinuity full, okay? So you can't differentiate between type 2 sprain or bruising and mucoid degeneration. It's the history. If there's no history of injury and there is high signal, you say, you know, type 2, degenerate type 2 sprain, some people call it, or mucoid degeneration. But anyway, so that's the deltoid. And these are the superficial components. So they are much thinner, harder to uh, see, but you can see them on ultrasound as well. Next comes the tibiofibular ligament. Some people call it the syndesmotic ligament. Um, and these are, well, there are anterior and posterior. Currently, we are looking at the anterior tibiofibular ligament, which is an oblique ligament, another slightly striated-looking ligament. 
Now, they can, we'll come to that later actually. So um, at the posterior aspect, it has its counterpart. So AITFL and PITFL, posterior inferior tibiofibular ligament or anterior inferior tibiofibular ligament. So PTFL, we'll see an example of that. So PITFL, posterior, posterior um, tibiofibular ligament, um, goes from there to the other side of the malleolus. And then we have also got the transverse tibiofibular ligament, which goes to that part of the tibia. So it's a shorter ligament going from the lateral malleolus to the tibia. But the longer one, which is a posterior inferior tibiofibular ligament, goes all the way towards the other malleolus. So some people call it the intermalleolar ligament. Some people might have heard that name. Um, so it's kind of different terminology. So this is the interosseous membrane, which is also part of those tibiofibular ligament, which together we call it syndesmotic complex. Okay, so that's the syndesmosis. Now, there is something called the Bassett's ligament, for those who haven't heard about it. That's a separate fragment of the AITFL, or the anterior inferior tibiofibular ligament, which is, uh, which is below the AITFL. Why is it important? It is actually by itself an independent cause of anterolateral impingement, if it's there. It moves separately, and it can bunch up, it can swell, so it can cause that thing, uh, anterolateral impingement, which we'll look at in a bit. Um, so the tendons, which you know about, Achilles tendon at the back, a well, long tendon with the soleus plumbing in. Uh, what is that? Retrocalcaneal bursa. And this bit is the Kager's fat pad, right? For those who read, you probably know about it. So these are relevant to whenever you're describing Achilles tendon or tendon-related change. That's the plantar fascia, plumps into the uh, calcaneum. So we look at tendons now, and the medial tendons are tibialis posterior. FDL and FHL. FHL obviously often has the muscle going low down. Um, and on the lateral side, you get the peroneus brevis, B close to the bone, and peroneus longus. And anteriorly, you've got the tibialis anterior, and then your extensor um, hallucis and digitorum longus. And sometimes you'll be able to see the peroneus tertius as well. That structure is SPR, or superior peroneal retinaculum. Uh, we call it the SPR because our surgeons can't remember, so it winds them up, and they can't figure out what SPR is. Basically, it is superior peroneal retinaculum. It is what, like any retinaculum, it keeps the peroneal tendons in place against the lateral malleolus. So if you've got a very bad lateral ligament sprain, there will be SPR tear, and if you've got SPR tear, you will have subluxation of the peroneal tendons. You can't have them subluxing with that superior peroneal retinaculum intact. It's like a buckle. It's like a belt that'll keep it in place. Similar to that, there is the, this is your flexor retinaculum or medial retinaculum, whatever you want to call it, which keeps the structures. These are the neurovascular structures in your tarsal tunnel, right? In between, so anything deep to the previously visible retinaculum is your tarsal tunnel, okay? Sinus tarsi, it's the bit between the talus and the calcaneum. I wouldn't go into the detail. I'll show you the MRI, actually. So there are two things which are relevant about the sinus tarsi, and these two are the cervical ligament, okay, which goes towards the center, and more medially placed interosseous telocalcaneal ligament. We do actually look at them. Uh, and this interosseous telocalcaneal ligament is another one which has a celery stick-like appearance. Cervical ligament don't. And cervical ligament has this typical sort of acute angle presentation on a coronal MR. That's the first thing that people spot, even without knowing what a sinus tarsi is. At some point, there was a vogue of doing sinus tarsi arthrogram. Don't know whether you even heard about it. Uh, but that went out of the window because we can see them on a 3T MR quite nicely, so we don't do any arthrograms anymore. Um, the joints, obviously ankle and subtalar joint. You can see lots of other joints. So the subtalar joint is made up of three joint, yeah, right? This, the first arrow at the back is the posterior talocalcaneal joint. This is the middle talocalcaneal joint. And often you've got a small facet of the anterior talocalcaneal joint, which is inseparable from the telonavicular joint. So it kind of merges into that one C-shaped thing. Um, I will not go into, hopefully that will take me to the instability. Good. Um, so I'll go into the instability. It is, um, basically ankle sprain is, is common in sports injury, um, with lateral sprains occurring in 85%, you know, counting for 85% of injuries. Just to give you some number, 
every year there's about 300,000 new ankle sprains uh, of which 42,000 are severe. Severe, this is clinical grading, not radiologically severe. Severe so that they are more than, you know, they can't play and things like that, or they can't walk and they're hobbling for more than six weeks or something like that. So it's clinical. Uh, so just a little bit of statistics from the UK Premier League. Um, this is 2008 published data uh, in the BMJ, actually. So ankle sprain results in really 12,000 lost days and 2,000 lost matches. That is a lot talking about professional footballers, some of which people are get 500, you know, are getting or paid 500,000 pound a week. You know, if you lose your star player, you're talking somebody gone for a season. You're talking, you know, somebody uh, not playing at all, you know, um, for the whole uh, period. So hence the interest. Um, so basically, chronic ankle instability is when the injury is too severe to recover within six weeks. That's sort of the clinical definition of it. Chronic, angulogy, uh, chronic ankle injury refers to persistent pain and sprain. And the problem is, once you get the sprain, you get recurrent sprain, um, and then you go. it's kind of a downhill. And there are multiple uh, types of instability. There are mechanical and functional. Basically, mechanical is when there is actually a visible laxity clinically and abnormal radiologically and functional is based on abnormal tendons and muscle weakness and other things. So generally, very briefly, most functional, unless you've got mechanical things and obviously visible abnormality, the first port of call, as you will see on that slide, is always physiotherapy. The surgeons get drawn into the picture only when you get a proper tear and then they do their Ballstrom procedure or whatever corrective procedure they do. I don't have time to go into the procedure, so we won't go into it. But generally, everything else, functional, definitely physiotherapy. There is nothing to repair. Even with the other ones, if there is abnormal examination but normal imaging, they will all go the physio path. Okay? Now, there are certain things that chronic ankle instability is associated with, and amongst them, there's a long list of things which you can see on that chart. I will touch on two, sinostarsi syndrome and osteochondral lesions, because I think it's, it's, um, it's not a crime not to know about sinostarsi syndrome, but I think you should know about osteochondral lesion and the grade if you're reporting ankle MRs regularly, because that is something which is, which is actually which will determine who needs a scope and who can uh, survive without. And if you don't pick up and grade them correctly, they will all end up with advanced ankle away. And you're looking at ankle replacement or fusion or whatever future is not very bright. So all, so if you forget everything else, all these instability comes from a previous ligament injury. Whether single ligament injury or multiple ligament injury, the bottom line is to get instability, you need a ligament tear. So I'll show you different examples of different types of ligament tears um, as we go through the instability. So these are all different patients, unless I say otherwise. So partial, this is a partial tear of the ATFL. We sometimes call it a periosteal stripping type injury. I don't know whether you've heard that term. Basically, if you look at the anatomy, the tendon, the fibers of the tendon will merge with the cortex. And remember Sharpie's fibers and periosteum, ring bell? Um, people closer to medical school will remember them more. So there is an inseparable transition from the end of the tendon histologically with the periosteum. So when you pull a tendon, if you're avulsing it, you often avulse the periosteum with it. We see it quite commonly with the MCL. ATFL is also another area where you see uh, periosteal elevation. Actually, you see it with um, Tennis elbow as well, you get periosteal sleeve elevation. So here, when you get periosteal sleeve elevation, you get that with the superior peroneal retinaculum as well. You get that with ECU tendons as well. It's the same principle everywhere. When you get that, you're kind of creating a little window, okay? When you kind of get that in the lateral side, you can get peroneal tendon subluxing into that place or an ECU tendon subluxing into that space. But this is a periosteal sleeve elevation type. Um, uh, partial tear. This is a full thickness tear where the tendon actually, sorry, the ligament actually dips in. Notice the severe sort of transition in, uh, in, in girth of the actual ligament. Okay, And this is what we call a grade 2 sprain or you can also call it a partial interstitial tear, overlapping term, basically high signal, associated with a Taylor, uh, lateral process of the Taylor fracture. Okay. This is an old tear 
of the ATFL with old healed partial tear, all you see is a very thick, dark ligament. It's scarring. Why is it dark? Fibrosis could have bled into the tendon as well. Hemosiderin is dark as well. Don't forget hemosiderin. Yeah. Every time you bruise, you have bled blood, isn't it? That's another reason for dark. Peop you know, often, so yeah, think you'll find, uh, you know, you, you'll find um, reasons yourself. If you find reasons, you will remember it. So this is basically an old healed partial tear. It's in continuity, so hence it's healed. But it's not normal. Normal ten ligament, we saw how it looks. It looks thin, dark, and thin. Okay, thin and sharp. Okay, thick, fuzzy, not good. This is a chronic tear uh, with scarring, and you can see the ligament is actually sort of bending inwards even. You can, they can give you anterolateral impingement when we come to them. This is a full thickness CFL tear, okay? Um, as I said, remember our original normal, I uh, should have put the normal maybe with it. There is no ligament structure visible under the two peroneal tendons. There is some soft, wispy tissue between that and the bone. There is no CFL visible. CFL is long gone. It's torn and disappeared somewhere else. So this is an example of a full thickness CFL tear. We look at it in the coronal, but coronal you have to scroll. Um, here's an example of a bruised uh, CFL. So here, this is a PDFS image, which shows you that, yes, I can see something below the peroneal tendon in between the bone and that, but it's very thick and very high signal. So this is Mucoid degeneration, you never get it in the CFL. So it is a grade two sprain, basically. So this is a grade two sprain. And when it's swollen, it becomes easier to trace. Just like you know, tall people and fat people are visible from a distance. Similarly, rather than a thin ligament, if you see a fat ligament, and stop moving your arm too much, uh, you will be able to see them more easily. And this brings us to the, okay, so this is another, ex ah, okay, sorry. Uh, so we used to do um, ankle arthrograms. I don't know how many of you actually do ankle arthrograms. Have you done any? No. We used to do loads of ankle arthrograms. Okay, then that's gone out of the window. Why? The only thing that you can see in an ankle arthrogram, well, we still do it actually. I'll come back to it in a minute. For only one scenario. Anyone, why? Anyone, which scenario do we do it? Why do we do an ankle arthrogram? We'll come to it when we get to it, um, when we get to that part of the talk. Um, Bec there is one reason where ankle arthrogram wins. You, nothing can replace an ankle arthrogram for that. Uh, similar like a knee arthrogram. That's the only scenario where we do a knee arthrogram. Uh, there is nothing else that will give you that answer. Um, I can ask you that. Remind me if I forget. Um, but with an ankle arthrogram, the only thing that was visible, and bear in mind, if you go back 20, 20 30, 40 years, People, MSK radiologists did arthrogram and read the arthrogram, the x-ray, which we don't read now. All we see, yeah, is it visible? Yeah, go, send him to the MR. But they used to read the actual arthrogram. And in them, and that's how the ankle arthrogram is useful, in them, if you inject the ankle and you see fluid in the peroneal tendon sheath, you've got what? CFL tear. That's a full thickness CFL tear. Because remember, now it makes sense. Oh, yes, Dr. Ganguly said that's the only structure visible between the bone and the peroneal tendon. When that's gone, the cushion's gone. So when you do an ankle arthrogram and you see fluid in the peroneal tendon sheath, you've got a CFL tear. You don't need to do the MR. If you've got a CFL tear, you've got bad ankle instability. Why? You can't tear the CFL without tearing the ATFL or the PTFL. PTFL, it doesn't go very much. It's the ATFL which goes first. That's what we learned in medical school. Of course, you're right. ATFL goes first. So it must have gone for CFL to go. You've got two ligament injury now. You don't need any, anything else. Stop now. You've got ankle instability. See the surgeon. You, know, you need a scope. That's how the thinking should move. But that's, that's, that's the whole idea. So nowadays, we are good at picking up CFL tear. So we've done away with ankle uh, arthrograms completely. The only case, only scenario, when I do an ankle arthrogram is when a surgeon comes and tell me, tells me, you've got a grade two or a grade three osteochondralesion. Can you sh for sure tell me whether this is loose or not? Is it going to dislocate? Is it going to become a loose body? Or is it stuck on to the bone? I inject the ankle. I inject with pressure. I inject ankles. What is the normal joint volume for ankle? 3 to 5 ml, roughly. I inject 7. I'll go 2, 3 mils up to stress the joint to see if any fluid goes in. Okay? If it does, it'll tell, it'll tell me. That's, you can argue, that's another place where gadolinium comes in handy. Because 
remember, one of the T2 high signal is also part of osteochondral lesion. How will you know that's the fluid that you injected and not that? Okay, even if you do a control type MR first and after saline injection, you still can't tell. T2 is high T2 is high T2. Fluid signal is fluid signal, you can't. The only way you can differentiate is that's another place where, I, the only place where I use GAD because that's the only way, unless, well actually nowadays I don't use GAD, I do a CT after them. Use a bit of iodine and CT. Shows you, it doesn't show you anything else, but it shows you 100% proof whether that fragment is loose or stable. Same with meniscal tear. That's the only place where I do a CT-guided um, arthrogram of the knee. If you see a crevice, high signal on an MR, how do you know it's not a recurrent tear if he's had meniscal surgery? How do you know it's not granulation tissue? Granulation tissue is vascular and high signal. So the only way is a CT uh, arthrogram of the knee. That's the only place. So this is an example of you know, chronic CFL tear. Now, one important thing about the CFL, that's the only ligament, if it hasn't struck you already, that covers the ankle and the subtalar joint. Hence the importance of CFL. Okay, pause and think from a moment. That is the only ligament which is traveling on the lateral side I'm talking about, and most instability. On the medial side, you can argue there are, yes, there are tibio-navicular component of the superficial spring ligament does, but on the lateral side, this is the only thing that covers two joint. Hence, it's so important. Once you lose the CFL, A is bad. You're going towards OA, replacement, fusion, that way, okay? Hence, the importance of looking at the CFL. So these are examples of deltoid, uh, sorry, grade two sprain. Again, I've purposefully shown you a T1-weighted image to show you the mucoid degeneration and the intermediate signal on that, you, you can't differentiate between fluid, which is also there in the ankle joint on a T1-weighted, because it's a T1-weighted image. There is edema in the sinus tarsi, we can't assess because it's a T1-weighted image, but it shows the mucoid degeneration of the deltoid, which should be all striated like a celery, or dark, like something else. Notice the tendons are all dark. That's how ligament should be as well. They're all triple helix of collagen. Sinus tarsi syndrome, that's a sinus tarsi between the talus and the calcaneum. So we look at it generally in sagittal, axial, and coronal images. Um, this is an example of, as I said, you would see the cervical ligament as an oblique structure, which is not clearly appreciable here. Um, and also on this, um, we see edema in them, and that's what we see when we get sinus tarsi syndrome, basically synovitis, which is high signal, and edema to the ligaments inside the sinus tarsi. So this is an acute sprain and high signal. So this is somebody who twisted the ankle. Um, and obviously there was no other ligament injury. There was an acute uh, sprain of the cervical ligament and edema in the sinus tarsi. I say edema, but you can call it bruising if it's an acute scenario. Bruising also sounds better. So this is another um, example. This is a sinus tarsi ganglion. So this is also sinus tarsi syndrome. So any sort of inflammation or process going on there will give you sinus tarsi syndrome. It's pain coming from sinus tarsi. And again, you can use your own um, differentials. You don't need to listen to this talk or read a book for it. There are ligaments there, there are radiolar tissues there, there are nerves there, and there are structures there. So anything related to any of them, an osteophyte, you don't really listen to any of this. An osteophyte from a bone can give you sinus tarsi syndrome. Edema there can give you sinus tarsi syndrome. A sarcoma there can give you sinus tarsi syndrome. A hemangioma, never seen one there, sir, but yeah, can give you sinus tarsi syndrome. So anything there uh, can give you sinus tarsi. Of course, synovitis from any of the adjacent joint. Gout, you know, I haven't, I might actually have an example of gout. So basically what I'm saying is think when you read images. That's what makes radiology interesting. So this is, this is a ganglion with associated edema in the talus. This, ah, there, there we go. Large cystic areas with lots of edema and synovitis. It's the cysts that give it away. This is actually gout, and there is tophaceous deposit, which will look the same at the end of the day. This is just an image. It'll look the same as any sort of other type of synovitis, but the cystic change around it makes me think it is gout. Uh, and obviously there is history of crystal deposition disease and things. This is sinus tarsi syndrome with heterotopic ossification of the cervical ligament, basically. So, you know, chronic injury, heterotopic ossification, like myositis. Technically, this is not myositis. This is, this is ligament uh, ossification, so you, can't, you shouldn't call it myositis. Myositis is muscle. But, so hence the word heterotopic ossification. Um, 
This is another example of sinus tarsi syndrome, where it's sort of chronic thickening. Notice how thick and low signal the cervical ligament is. We've been seeing it as a thin structure so far. So it's just thickening. And synovitis is just the high signal. Why am I calling it synovitis? Uh, just because there can't be anything else there. There is synovium and fluid. It doesn't look clear fluid-like. So hence, I'm calling it synovium. There's no other special magic in it. Um, so this is... Okay, yeah, forgot about this one. Uh, so this is a malunited anterior process of calcaneum fracture. Again, the shape is not right. It's deformed, hence pressure effect, reactive synovitis, sinus tarsi syndrome. So just to highlight, oh yeah, this is a nice one actually, this is a nice one. This is telecalcaneal fusion. Naturally, inherently, these guys, or this person, sinus, I can't remember if it's a boy or girl, um, sinus tarsi really, really tight with sclerosis from chronic abnormal loading and things. He's got sinus tarsi syndrome because it's kind of non-existent sinus, really. Okay, see that with telocalcaneal um, fusion. This um, we will see later, very abnormal. Look at the calcaneum, it's tilted over, marked calcaneovalgus deformity. This is basically something that we'll see later. I won't talk about it, but you can get subfibular impingement because of the abnormal calcaneovalgus which will also squash the sinus tarsi and give you sinus tarsi syndrome. We'll look at it uh, in a bit. I'll quickly go through the important bits of the osteochondral injury. It, it is a loosely used term, and often if it's degenerate, we just say osteochondral signal change. If it's trauma, it's the same thing we say on osteochondral defect or osteochondral um, uh, injury. Uh, we don't use the word osteochondritis desiccans ever. Um, but bear in mind, you can get them, if you're reporting ankles, you would have seen in the supramedial and the supralateral tailor dome. So it depends on which ligament is torn. If your deltoid is torn, the ankle goes laterally and you get a supralateral tailor dome osteochondral lesion. If it's the lateral ligament which is torn, inversion injury, you get a supramedial tailor dome osteochondral lesion based on which type of instability. Hence, they are tied together. Now, burnt and hearty, when they originally described this, they kept it simple. Uh, type one is a subchondral compression fracture. You don't see anything. Stage two, two is when you see a partial defect. Three is a complete defect, but the fragment's undisplaced, and four is um, displaced fragment. This is the standard classification that everybody uses. MR obviously creates problems because you can see too much and which is why sometimes we limit uh, our MR. With MR, the most annoying thing is subchondral cyst. Now, it doesn't fall in any classification system. What do we do about these? How does that help? So the MR, Anderson, came up with an MR version. Uh, type 1 is subchondral edema, and this X-ray is normal. Type 2A is a cyst, okay? And type 2B is the partial separation, which is the partial separation of the burnt and hearty type 2. Okay, part three is complete separation, undisplaced, and type four is the same, complete and displaced. Okay, you get that? So the cyst has been introduced here in the Anderson as a type 2A. So if you just see cysts there, it's a type 2A lesion. Okay, the rest is similar to the bone. Only edema, partial tear, full tear, undisplaced, or full tear displaced. Those are the basic. The additional 2A is the subchondral cyst, if you're reporting them. So here's one in the superomedial aspect of the Taylor dome. Ah, good. I forgot I had done these because this is one of the first talks I prepared when uh, Dr. Karim uh, called me. Uh, so this is edema in the supralateral. So this is Anderson stage one, right? I'm not going to test you on the stage because of sake of time. This is a cyst. What is it? This is stage 2A. Oh, it's 12. That's great. I've got 15 minutes. That's plenty of time. I can digress. But uh, so this is a cyst, okay? With edema, forget that. There is a cyst. So this is 2A. Thank goodness, I agreed with myself. <laughs> I, I, I said to a before flicking. Sometimes I, I generally I cheat. I'll do that and then I'll say it looks clever, but also I don't want to get caught out. So <laughs> I was ahead of myself there. So this is to be. So this is a partial separation. See a CT orthogram. Okay, shows the defect really, really nicely. That's another place where we would do CT orthogram. And CT is so good, we forget how good CT is for cartilage lesion. 
you name it. Delamination, I was talking about yesterday, I was taking, talking about delamination in the tendons for those who are still there and not sleeping. We get delamination in the cartilage as well because the cartilage has, how many layers does a cartilage have? People are thinking, why do I care? We don't need to know. You know well, you don't need to know when you're reporting an MR, but a cartilage has seven layers. You'll be surprised, okay? It has seven layers. Why is it important? Because the bottommost layer are perpendicular layers stuck on to the sharpest fibers on the cortex and periosteum or underlying bone. They, you can't do anything to them. They will be there. You can't budge them unless you scrape them off. Even then, you can't. Then you come the disorganized layer, and then you get the horizontal layer. They all have two, three sub-layers. I'm not going into the detail of the sub-layers. And on top, they have um, a capsule-like layer, which is layer seven. But the bottom line is, in between those really tight vertical layers and the horizontal layer, there is an irregular disorganized layer in between. That's your delamination layer. So when you see a tear going through the top, you're fissuring of the cartilage and knee, patella cartilage anywhere. Cartilage is the same. It's hyaline cartilage, wherever it is. It's the same structure. Be it your finger. If you can see, if you've got a seven Tesla MR and you can see your MCPJ, it's the same principle. It'll go through those top layers until it hits the disorganized layer. Then it can't go anymore because there is bone and the deepest layer, which is really tight. Then it finds horizontal track, a bit like you know overflow traffic. And that's how you get your delamination. It's the same as a chondral flap. People used to call it chondral flap when you get a horizontal cleavage, okay? So the same thing. Here, so here on a CT arthrogram, you will see them really nicely because the contrast will go, if you mag them sufficiently enough, will go vertical and then go along the surface of the bone. So you'll get a chondral flap or a delaminating chondral tear. So this is the partial tear, Anderson 2B. This is Anderson stage three. See how the MR and the CT actually is a true stage. This is the same patient, I swear. Um, so MR, we would understage it often, isn't it? We would sometimes say it is a 2B. We would think mm, maybe there's, it's partial. You know. But a CT clearly shows you because bone for CT, yeah, okay, so you see bones so well. Hence the CT arthrogram comes in. Okay, here's another example. Superomedial. So what injury did this person have? Inversion or reversion? Lateral ligament injury. So it must have had an inversion injury, right? To get a superomedial. Just remember the association. Um, so this is a stage four where it is, as you can see on that image, it's slightly moved away from its bed, right? So a displaced lesion is a stage four lesion. So they can displace and go anywhere. So why, why is this important? The most important bit about this is um, the stability of the fragment. That's what the surgeon wants to know. Is it a stable or an unstable? Now we evaluate them on fluid sensitive MR. Sometimes we, as I said, we do CT arthrograms. So the MR criteria of instability, th there, this is unfortunately, unfortunately not an exact science. So I'll tell you what is relevant and how I report them. So generally high signal is granulation tissue, okay? So general teaching is that if you see high signal all along the underneath, that is a sign of instability, not necessarily. It could just be granulation tissue and a healing response. Okay, so check whether that compares with your joint fluid. If the T2 signal is as high as the fluid in your joint, that means it's fluid signal, that means it's unstable. If it is even is a little bit less high signal than fluid, it is probably granulation tissue, which is probably healing. So if that person goes for surgery, you're basically doing them a disfavor. He had a stable thing. You've got the surgeon to go in and made it unstable now. So that's where it's relevant. So a high signal dark T2, um, which we saw as sclerosis on the CT is often a sign of instability. That means there is no healing response going on. Okay, discrete cysts, uh, again, not necessarily bad, but if you see multiple cysts and large cysts below it, then that's a sign of potential instability in future. Okay, lesion size has always been debated, but generally the larger the lesion, the more likely it is going to fall out of its place. It's just basic um, thing. So in the last 10 minutes, I look at impingement because impingement is quite structured. Um, 
there are several types of impingement, and they only follow a certain pattern, and they'll be immoral at the end. Um, so anterolateral, anterior, just as the name suggests, it's the anterolateral, anterior, anteromedial, posterior and compartments. Without ado, the anterolateral impingement syndrome is generally caused by what is called the anterolateral gutter, which is basically the part of the ankle joint which is deep to the ATFL on your axial image. Okay, we'll, we'll see a true image uh, in a minute. So that is the anterolateral gutter. Some people call it anterolateral recess. Anything happening there will cause anterolateral impingement. Okay, so what can be happening there? So ATFL injury, yes. That's the roof of the anterolateral gutter. Anything in that space, a ganglion pressing on that space, synovial thickening, avulsed bone fragment, um, Bassett's ligament, as I was talking about, some accessory ligaments, anything that compresses the anterolateral gutter will cause uh, anterolateral impingement. Here's a case of a torn ATFL. Okay, there was an associated avulsion of the Taylor insertion as well with diffuse bruising, hemorrhage, edema, um, and swelling with synovial proliferation, which is a healing response with granulation tissue, making the anterolateral gutter full of all this stuff. So when you feel that person's ankle, it'll feel doughy and spongy, and that's where you'll feel the pain if you press. So that's an anterol gutter, anterolateral gutter impingement because of tear in that ligament. This is an anterolateral impingement due to uh, what's called meniscoid synovial proliferation. And again, see, um, thick, dark, low signal, chronic injury of the ATFL with meniscal, like thickening of the um, synovial proliferation, that's uh, anterolateral gutter impingement. Uh, this is, so these are all different types of anterolateral uh, gutter impingement. In this occasion, um, the ATFL is torn, uh, and this is also, um, this is just a thick and scarred ATFL. Now the next one is anterolateral gutter impingement from what is called the Bassett's ligament, which is why, by the way, this should have said ATFL. I think that's a spelling error. The I shouldn't be there. Uh, so the I, we come to it now. Um, the antero-inferior tibiofibular ligament, the accessory component of it, which is called the Bassett's ligament here. So if it is very thick and prominent and cord-like, it'll rub against the superolateral aspect of the Taylor dome. And hence you get a cyst and injury there. Um, and you get synovitis overlying that area. So here's the result of, well actually this is due to an accessory ossicle, but I don't have a good example of that. But you end up having anterolateral gutter impingement because of that um, ligament thickening. And often the osteochondral change is just an associated finding. This is anterolateral gutter impingement due to an accessory ossicle, and this is anterolateral gutter impingement due to large osteophytes related to OA in the ankle joint. Okay. Anterior impingement is relatively simpler. This is purely due to osteophytes and mainly because of OA. It is, as the name suggests, impingement at the anterior aspect of the ankle. Okay, Originally described by Morrison Murray as athlete's ankle. I don't know whether you've heard the term. We use that term quite often. Athlete's ankle. Actually, we use the term footballer's ankle more often. Okay, It happens because of exactly that. If you do that all your life, put your leg back and stretch and hit the ball, uh, like that, a uh, hundred times, one thousand times a day, you will get anterior, anterior impingement. There is no other way. Even if you don't get OA, the stress from doing that, and the more powerfully you hit it, um, you will. From that super dorsiflexion to plant up, you know, when you when you go, you stretch the ligaments, and you end up with a sorry, you end up with stretching and spurs. And here's the result. So you get a spur or an osteophyte. Some people call it osteophyte. Some people call it spur. What I do is generally if you've got other OA changes, I call it an osteophyte. If there are no other OA changes, then I call it a spur. Because essentially it's a traction spur, isn't it? That's where the capsule and the ligament attaches. You've been pulling at it for too long. Hence, to support the body, you've got subperiosteal bone formation along your sharp ace fibers and you've developed a spur. So it is a traction spur. But if you've got away, we call it an osteophyte. There's no, it's the same thing. Um, so this is an example of anterior impingement. And, and the spurs obviously come in all shapes and sizes, just like all of us. This is a massive spur. OK, this is a huge spur when it comes up. Yeah. It's trying to keep you awake. If you miss 
the flicker, you miss the image. So by that time, by the time you wake up, the next image is here. So here's another example of anterior uh, um, impingement. Actually, I forgot about this. So sometimes, because of that spur, you get synovial proliferation and a little bit of a pseudo erosion behind that spur. That's called a divert sign. It's not a true erosion, bear in mind. You will not see marrow edema if you do a fluid sensitive sequence. If you see marrow edema, that's an erosion. Okay. Otherwise, it's called a divert sign. Anteromedial impingement, also very simple. Again, it's related to injury to the medial structures in the anteromedial gutter, deep to the deltoid ligament, just like the anterolateral gutter, which is deep to the ATFL, deep to the medial ligament is the anteromedial gutter. And the same things apply, injury to the ligament, a ganglion, a tumor, uh, bones, loose bodies, cartilage defect, anything that can happen there, okay? Again, classically described in footballers, runners, cross-country runners, um, for some strange reason. And, yeah, this is, uh, this should be anterior tibiotalar ligament, yeah, that's it. Uh, so basically injury to the deeper component of the deltoid. We're not concerned about the superficial one. The superficial ones are sometimes stone. They don't have as much of an impact. It's the deeper ones which we are concerned about. And again, that chronic flexion and inversion and repeated microtrauma, same as the footballer's ankle in the anterior impingement, that leads to chronic traction or ligament injury uh, and anteromedial impingement. Here's an example. So you might argue this just looks like the anterior impingement that you saw. Yes, it does. It's just more in the anteromedial aspect of the ankle. It looks exactly the same. So on your sagittal MR, if it's right in the midline, it is anterior impingement. Uh, if it's off to the medial side, if you look at the axial, you find deltoid and medial ligaments to be abnormal, and this is anteromedial impingement. Okay, what's called a Taylor beak sign sometimes, Taylor beak-like osteophyte. Um, so this is just an example of uh, somebody uh, eight and 24 months, so it's an interval uh, of, uh, of a year nearly uh, with anteromedial impingement. So the, in this case, there is ligament thickening and associated synovial proliferation, very similar. There are two different patients, but you know, this is like, like the meniscoid synovial thickening in the anterolateral impingement. You get the same principle basically. Um, so once you see one, you can, you know, you can, you know, you can read the next one. Posteromedial is probably the least common impingement type, okay? It is generally caused in the posteromedial gutter, which is deep to the posteromedial aspect, neurovascular structures and FHL um, behind the medial malleolus. It is one of the least common types, as I said. Essentially happens from repeated plantar flexion when you're squashing the structures in your tarsal tunnel. And of course, trauma to the posterior part of the deltoid ligament. Um, so here's some examples. You see bone marrow edema in the posterior aspect of the talus, not in the anterior part. Okay, this is a sagittal image. And of course you see edema in the deltoid and things. So it's just that you're putting it together. Whereas posterior impingement is something that we see quite regularly, the classic famous Ostrigonum syndrome. Who gets it? Footballers and ballet dancers. Is the textbook teaching anybody who does um, a lot of uh, ankle plant flexion, we'll get it. Because the ostrigonum, if you've got one, or the posterior process of the, posterior steeder process of the talus, if you don't have an ostrigonum, is being squashed between the tibia and the calcaneum as you plant flex, right? That's exactly what is happening. Now, if you happen to have an ostrigonum, let me show you some examples of that. Well, as I said, the two main mechanism is again kicking, you know, obviously in footballers, plantar flexion and that motion of follow through. And actually not only the follow through, the sudden stop, because you, you don't go, it, the, the, the movement of the ankle comes to a sudden stop when you've actually kicked the ball. You do follow through with your leg, but the ankle movement stops. And, and with the ballet dancers, it's just chronic maintaining in that position again and again and again. Okay, so essentially, what happens is either you get this, so this is posterior impingement where you've got an ostrigonum and you get edema to the ostrigonum, synovitis, fluid all around it. This is your ostrigonum syndrome and you can also get this. Okay, no, so that should come later. So this is, um, this is actually not uh, ostrigonum syndrome. This is just thickening and edema to the posterior 
uh, ligament. So this is posterior impingement due to thickening of the posterior inferior tibiofibular ligament or also called the intermalleolar ligament, as I said, or the transverse component of the ligament. If they are thickened in edematous, they can give you posterior impingement as well. Okay. This is posterior impingement. Another ancillary finding that you get with it is FHL uh, tenosynovitis. Here's an example of posterior impingement, which is led to a uh, yep, posterior steeda process fracture. So this person does not have an ostrigonum. Here they have a prominent posterior steeda process or posterior steeda process. So when they impinge the tibia and the calcaneum, in between the bone gets squashed, you get a fracture. This is the biggest posterior steeda process I've ever seen, obviously. And it causes osteophytic lipping and thing. What do you get? Posterior impingement. So once you know your anatomy and the structures that are there, you don't me need me to tell you what causes impingement. You can work it out. I'll go into one lateral, uh, sorry, lateral hind foot impingement. I'm going to one last one, which is actually very important. And we see it regularly. And we see it very commonly in the UK because it is heavily associated with flat foot. And it depends on how common is flat foot in your practice. If you see a lot of flat foot, all of them will end up with, yeah, so a lot of them, if they're untreated, will end up with posterolateral hind foot impingement because of the hind foot valgus to accommodate for the forefoot varus. It sounds complicated and tongue twister and very jargony, but basically I'll show you what happens. So, um, so these structures involved in the junction of the posterior subtalar joint. So in hind foot impingement, what is involved is talus, calcaneum, and the adjacent fibula. So what you get classically, and this is, this is actually not the joint. So the long-winded terminology is extra-articular lateral talocalcaneal impingement. That's the full name to remind the surgeons that it is not the joint. It is a lateral side. And the simple term is posterolateral hind foot impingement, because that's just another type of impingement, okay? Um, but essentially, it's the lateral aspect of the talus which is impinging at the calcaneum. Which, what is this called, this part of the calcaneum? Angle of Gissen, G-I-S-S-A-N-E. Some people call it angle of Gissen. Pron I spelled it out because pronunciation is different um, in different parts of the world. But you get edema, corresponding edema in both of these. So that, this is posterolateral hind foot impingement. You can get cystic change as well. Um, here's another example. So along with that, what happens is you, your calcaneum goes more and more flatter. So as your flat foot, the calcaneum pitch starts to flatten, and I don't know whether you measure Mary Tomino's axis and things, as they start dropping and dropping and dropping, the calcaneum goes flat, and then it needs space, so it goes valgus. Now it tilts the other way. So with calcaneo valgus, what happens is it's natural. Now the fibula is squashing against your calcaneum. So this is exactly what you see in subfibular impingement, which is the end result of posterolateral hind foot impingement. If you've got this, you will end up with this, no matter unless you correct the calcaneo valgus. There are different ways of measuring hind foot valgus. Um, but we'll go into that. So hence, with these, you often see tibialis posterior tendinopathy. It's not just a chance thing. It's because of the association with flat foot. With flat foot, you get tibialis posterior tendinopathy, spring ligament deficiency, spring ligament tear. So it's, that is why. So this is an example of a partial tear. Okay? Uh, this is one tendon thickening. So you know the grades of tibialis posterior tendinopathy. Again, we're quite jargony from that point of view. Apologies for that. One is when you get tendon thickening and high signal. Two is when you've got partial tear, thinning of the tendon. The tendon on ultrasound is actually thinner than FDL. If it's thicker, it's one. If it's thinner, type two, because it's partial tear. And when you can't see the tendon at all, it's type three tear. So that's the tibialis posterior, so-called TP dysfunction syndrome. But that's flat foot, and hence the association between the two. Okay, so this is a very advanced uh, lateral hind foot impingement with now the fibula has been pushed so much that the SPR has been torn and all the fibular peroneal tendons are now one lying in the front, one lying behind. It's all complete disorganization of the foot. The, these, again, are very difficult to get on top of. This is very subjective. So you can measure the calcaneal valgus against the tibia, but 
I often don't. I just eyeball and see what other changes are happening. So this is another example of calcaneo valgus and subfibular impingement. This is a CT example of the same subfibular impingement, bone on bone. Uh, yeah, no, obviously, no. Football is not dangerous. We do play a lot of football, but um, uh, because of the mechanism of injury, of, of course, you can say ballet dancers as well. Most impingements. I mean, if you're a footballer, you're guaranteed to have five of the six type of impingements. Hence, their career and things, and they end up with bad OA. If you look at some of their ankles, they look horrible. You, you don't get to see them. We do. They look awful. They all, well, not all of them. Some of them will carry on with injection after injection after injection. A lot of them head towards ankle replacement quite early. If they're a good footballer, obviously if they're a goalkeeper, not kicking the ball as many as much as a forward or Messi or you know Neymar or or uh, Fernando Torres, as I was talking about the other day, then you obviously you know you don't have that kind of injury. But if you are a frontline footballer scoring goals. It's going to come back and bite you later. No, as in like, you have to, there is no other way. No exercise, no strengthening will stop it. It's just the chronic stress on the capsule and the ligaments. It's, it's a professional hazard. They're all, nowadays, when, if you go to the academy, they get talks. So Everton Academy, they'll have a radiologist talking to them and explaining these things. So a lot of people change careers. Oh, I, I'll, do, I'll become a javelin thrower. And then they go to that academy and they say, oh, you'll get thrower's exostosis, Bennett lesion, shoulder dislocation, and you know, basically you're screwed with any sort of sport. So, <laughs> no, well not, you, you need to stay fit, so you know. But uh, that's, that's it. So essentially, have any questions? We've overran by six minutes or seven minutes actually, but should be okay, yeah, go on. Very good question, actually. Very good question and a very relevant question. So I will only call something as sinus tarsi syndrome if that is the isolated abnormality. Because it is like the junction, if you think of a tube station or a central pivot fulcrum point of all these structures. If you've got lots of edema in the, say, posterolateral hind foot impingement, you will of course get secondary changes in the sinus tarsi. If you get ligament injury, generalized soft tissue bruising, of course you'll get part of everywhere else. So you're absolutely spot on. If I see it in conjunction with a lateral ligament tear or other things, I will often just say reactive synovitis or reactive edema seen in the sinus tarsi. That's how I'll word the scan, okay? Because I want the orthopedic surgeon not to get interested. Whereas if there is impingement and there is nothing else, um, going on and there's high signal and mucoid degeneration other thing in the sinus tarsi only I'd say this is in keeping with sinus tarsi syndrome that's how I'd go yeah yeah you can call it sinus tarsi syndrome. It's basically reactive to those ligament injury, but it is now sinus tarsi syndrome because everything else has settled. That's the only thing that's there. So when it's there in isolation, I'll call it. Otherwise, as you said, it is often a sign with other things. But yeah, if he's persistently, again, is the person painful? Always there's, a, you know, is the person in pain? That's something. So we don't inject, we do inject, I do a lot of sinus tarsi injections actually, but I don't unless they're in pain. Because sometimes you'll get residual edema, reactive synovitis, and a lot of other things. I don't inject all of them. Only if they're in pain. And when I press the anterolateral gutter, I dig my finger in front of the fibula and go in, and I can feel doughy, that, that's only when I inject. Uh, otherwise, I won't inject. But yeah. Any others? Thank you. Oh, sorry. I didn't realize you were behind me. <laughs> no issue. Actually, uh, we have a question and session also at the, uh, during 3 to 5. I'm slightly in a hurry because uh, one of our colleagues will leave us. Uh, we'll leave for Patna um, uh, in half an hour. So we have to give her. Um, so I'm calling Dr. Upasana uh, to present uh, cases. 
she is a musculoskeletal radiologist in uh, IGIMS and the session will be chaired by Dr. Umakant Prashad who is an additional professor of IGIMS and Dr. Sanjeev Dibedi who is a radiologist in Patna. Welcome Dr. Upasana for your presentation. Good afternoon, everybody. First of all, I would like to thank organizers, especially HOD sir, Dr. Rajawal sir, for giving me this opportunity to present cases here. Uh, I will be discussing few cases, and these all cases are rare. But this is important because you should be familiar with these cases, because all these cases has MRI findings or imaging findings, which are pathognomic for that disease. And unless and until you see that, that may not strike when you see your cases in clinical practices. So although they are rare, but important, so please pay attention. This is case one. She's a young female in early 40s. She complained of bilateral thigh pain for two to three months, more on the left side, predominantly along the medial aspects of the thigh. She also gave the complaint of history of, uh, com complaint of neurogenic claudication. And she, the, all symptoms are so vague, it was thought that she must be having lumbosacral uh, neuropathy. And she was, give, she was being given conservative uh, management, uh, like physiotherapy, some neurogenic medicine like gabapentin, like common drugs. But uh, it didn't improve. In fact, it worsened over next one to two months to such an extent that she developed limping gait. And she had difficulty in climbing or coming down of the stairs. She had to hold her thigh by climbing, climbing up or down the stairs. And all tests for hip joint, SI joint were uh, normal, except for there was active straight leg raise test in adduction, uh, which showed there was a pain in the medial aspect of the thigh. So they were suspecting that there must be tendinitis of the medial compartment of the thigh. So now they have advice for the MRI of the spine, sacroiliac leg joint, as well as hip joint. I will show you the case. So this was her spine, which was perfectly normal. There was no nerve compression, no spinal canal tenosis, no foramenal tenosis. So spine was perfectly normal. SI joint, hip joint, everything was normal. Okay, no hyperintensity along SI joint. Both of the hip joints were also normal. But on axial image, and this was reported as normal, normal SI joint, normal spine, normal uh, hip joint. But when I reviewed the case, I got something. Can anybody can pick out that abnormality? Well, I will uh, stop at the section where that abnormality is there. Anything abnormal in this section? I'll show you T2FS. This is normal, normal, normal. This abnormality over here. I know it's difficult. Now let's go. So spine, hip, SI joints, all are normal. This is a representative image, axial image, where abnormality is there. But first, let's discuss what is the disease is about. Then we will come back to this image. 
uh, this is a normal image. If you compare these two, can you find something? See, this is the coletus femoris muscle. See her image. There is no muscle over here. Okay? So let us first talk about this. This was a case of ischiofemoral impingement. And let us say until you know about this, you are not going to see this. So whenever you have a patient which has non-specific pain, back pain, around the thigh, you look for ischiofemoral space also. So it is an impingement uh, of quartus femoris muscle which produces hip pain due to narrowing of the ischiofemoral space. Actually what happens with the narrowing of the space, this quartus femoris muscle gets impinged between the lesser trunk and uh, ischial tuberosity, leading to the, in acute stage there will be edema of the muscle and chron in chronic cases there will be fatty infiltration leading to the finally complete atrophy of this muscle as we see in our case. What is the etiology? It is usually congenital or positional. That is congenitally, pelvis is uh, in such a uh, anatomic variation that that space is narrowed. Especially those uh, people who are having coxa velga, increased ischial angle or increased femoral intervention, all these are predisposing factors which tend to reduce this space. But it is also seen commonly in our um, patients who, who are having su any surgery related to this area or fracture in that area or some tumor like osteochondroma of the ischial tuberosity and all, that will also narrow the space. So all these are acquired cases. So how they present, you, they usually seen in the elderly female, but nowadays cases are being reported in the children also. About two decades uh, before, they used to think that it occurs only in the young female, but now it is being um, reported in the children also. So why female are pred uh, more predisposed to such uh, impingement because their pelvis is wider and shallow with more prominent lesser trochanter which results in smaller ischiofemoral space. And they will present with non-specific pain like atypical groin pain, hip pain, thigh pain. Uh, they, they can also have a, a snapping sensation in the hip. So uh, they can also present chronic low back pain because your sciatic nerve is just posterior to coletus femoris muscle and it might get irritated which will produce, uh, which will produce a chronic low back pain. So you see all these are non-specific symptoms and you cannot uh, get the definite diagnosis. You can have bilateral hip involvement also in few of the cases. So how you will diagnose this? Clinically you can't diagnose, x-ray can't diagnose. So you can diagnose it on the MRI. So MRI is the imaging modality of the choice and what you have to look for? You have to look for these two spaces, ischiofemoral space. It is the distance between the lateral cortex of the ischial tuberosity and medial cortex of the lesser trochanter, cut-up value is 17 mm, about 17 to 20 mm is the cut-up value. And the next thing is coretus femoris space, it is a distance between the supralateral surface of the hamstring tendon and the posterior medial surface of the illustrious tendon or you can take the lesser trochanter, cut-up value is about 8 mm. Okay, now first let's go back to our case. So what do we uh, see here now? Now you see, this space is so, so much narrowed, this is not going to be more than 7 to 8 mm. And it's very narrowed. And there is a, a pro, uh, on the left side especially, there is complete atrophy of the coletus femoris muscle. This is T2 FS image, this is T2 image, and this is T1. So there is no coletus femoris muscle on the left side. Uh, in fact, on the right side also, it's a partially atrophied. So this was a case of ischiofemoral impingement. From next time onwards, you see all the, uh, all the pelvis cases, you also see this space, okay? Uh, recently in 2023, they have written a paper where they are telling that they can see the ischiofemoral space on the ultrasound also. And they have also described about the dynamic ultrasound where you see the ischiofemoral space on flexion extension of the hip. And they have shown that on the flexion, this is cortus femoris muscle and this is the space on extension, there is a muscle, buckling of the muscle or compression. But of course, it is a cumbersome and you need experience and time to do. So. MRI is better than ultrasound, but those who are experienced, they do ultrasound also. So to take a point, if you, if, you, if you have any patient with non-specific back pain or thigh pain and you don't find any etiology, look for ischiofemoral space. Now coming to the second case. He's a young male in 20s. He's physiotherapist by profession. And he came to me in a pain in the radial aspect of distal forearm bilaterally. Since he was a physiotherapist, he was taking some physiotherapy treatment on himself. He was taking NSAIDs and some ultrasonic you know, heating treatment and all. And gradually, he, he, um, this pain doesn't improve much. Only temporarily he used to get in between. And then he noticed there was also thickening on the uh, on palpation at the site of the pain. 
So first I did ultrasound. On ultrasound, uh, I will tell you the muscle. This is a muscle of first compartment of the extensor compartment of the wrist. You know there are seven compartments on the dorsal spectrum of the wrist. This is the first compartment. Uh, muscles are abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis. So I saw that the muscles of the first compartment were diffusely or heterogeneously hypoechoic. There was loss of normal architecture of the muscle, which you can see here in this normal muscle. And this is the tendon of the second compartment. So uh, I saw there is something wrong with these muscles. But there was no fluid around the tendon and all, so there was no obvious tenosynovitis. So, uh, and this is the right side and this is the left side. And the similar findings were seen on the both side. And uh, he had complaints on the both side also. So I advised for MRI. This is an MRI. So, this is first compartment muscles. It will uh, form the tendon, abductor pollicis longus, and extensor pollicis brevis. You see, so nicely it crosses the. This is first compartment. So nicely it's crossing the second compartment tendon, which is. Extensor pollicis longus, extensor carpi radialis longus, and brevis. So, what is the finding? It's obvious. There is a peritendinous edema. Right? T2FS hypertendency is there. There is an edema in the myotendinous junction of the first compartment muscles. You can see there is an edema of the muscle edema. There is a subcutaneous edema. Uh, and also, you can see there is a peritendinous edema of the second compartment uh, tendon also. So, as you go down, see it's crossing so nicely, it's crossing. Okay? Then this is first compartment, second compartment. So what is this? Yesterday, Gangli sir had uh, described and told about this. So what is this? Diagnosis? Same images are here. Okay. This is proximal intersection syndrome. So what is this? This is intersection syndrome where there is a non-infectious inflammatory process at the intersection of first dorsal compartment and second dorsal compartment tendons of the wrist. And it, this is proximal to the listrous tubercle, about 4 to 5 centimeter proximal to the listrous tubercle. This is called proximal because you also have distal intersection syndrome. And why did it occur? Any overuse of the wrist which, uh, which occurs due to repetitive flexion extension of the wrist will cause friction between these two tendons. Okay? And does the pressure be present with pain over the dorsal forearm and and on the wrist on the radial aspect. So diagnosis you, you can make clinically, but it has to be supported by ultrasound and MRI. And what do you get on MRI? You will get peritendinous edema, muscular edema, tenosynovitis, fluid around the tendons of the first and second compartment, subcutaneous edema, like we got in our cases. We had all the three except for tenosynovitis. Maybe he will gradually develop down fluid around the tendon, or maybe it will resolve because he was in long-term treatment of NSAIDs and all. So treatment is mainly conservative treatment you have to give if he doesn't respond, like he has to modify his activity and all, uh, put on splinting. But if, it, if it, it doesn't improve, then you go for cortest, uh, corticosteroid injection. And very rarely they may need surgical uh, release of these tendons to relieve the pain. Now, uh, third case. This is also young male. He has swelling and pain in the palmar aspect of the wrist region. And he gave history of amputation of the digit long back, but he himself didn't know why it was done. Although from the imaging we can make out, but that time he didn't know why it amputation was done. And outside he was diagnosed as low flow vascular malformation of the uh, at the site of swelling on the wrist. And he had also received two cycles of sclerotherapy, but it didn't respond. And this swelling kept on increasing, and his pain also kept on increasing. So he was directly referred for MRI f uh, at our center. This is a clinical image. See, uh, the middle finger was amputated. And you can see there is a swelling on the volar aspect of the forearm and wrist. This was X-ray he was carrying. You can see the, the amputation over here. And not much information exce except that there is a soft tissue swelling in this region. I will show you. In the This entity was also touched upon by the Kaas Gangli sir yesterday. 
so anybody what is there so this is this is what this structure this is a median nerve so it's thickened you know as you go down you say it's further thickening there is a this is t1 image so this is a, this t1 hyperentens things are fat there is a fatty hypertrophy and these small small things are now fascicles you know it's getting thickened you know so this thicken as you go down in carpal tunnel also this carpal tunnel region and you see that this is further this uh, thickening of the nerve with fatty hypertrophy and uh, uh, nerve vesicles fascicles thickening can be seen extending along the branches of the median nerve even in the fingers okay on this pdfs image you can nicely see the bundles of nerve fascicles you can see this hai na so nicely so this is called coaxial cable appearance so again this mri finding is pathognomic of diagnosis fibrolapamatous hematoma of the median nerve so now safely you should not do biopsy in this case and he has been receiving sclerotherapy for this which was wrong treatment and that's why he was not improving so on axial image uh, just now i showed you you can see the round round thick and nerve fascicles which is called coaxial cable appearance and on the coronal images you can see the fusiform thickening of the nerve with multiple serpentine or cord like thick and nerve fascicles in the longitudinal manner which is uh, which gives a spaghetti string appearance and also one thing uh, he was also having progressively increased pain in the fingers and all it was because he was also having carpal tunnel syndrome you can see there is a bulging of the flexor retinaculum so this was the case of fibrolapamatous hematoma of the median nerve with car probably carpal tunnel syndrome okay although he didn't give the history of why the middle finger was amputated but now we can we think that maybe because he was having enlarged middle finger and that is called macrodystrophia lapomatosis and then i did ultrasound after mri just uh, to keep the images you can see these are thickened neural fascicles in axial section and this is in the longitudinal section so fibromatous uh, fibrolapamatous hematoma is a benign tumor which composed of hypertrophic fibrofatty and neural tissues and most common nerve involved is uh, median nerve but it can also affect the other nerve like ulnar radial or even the nerve of the dorsal of the foot and it usually presents as a slowly enlarging mass on volar aspect of the wrist and forearm it usually in the beginning it's asymptomatic but slowly as it enlarges and cause compression you, you will have the symptoms of neural compression and if it's median nerve you will have features of carpal tunnel syndrome and uh, this patients in, in about 20 to 60% of cases you can see macrodystrophia lapomatosa that is proliferation or overgrowth of the osseous structure as well as soft tissue structure like you can see here na bony overgrowth in the distribution of the median nerve and the skin subcutaneous tissue all will be thick and bone will be overgrowth so how you will diagnose is in imaging you may see the features of macrodystrophia lapomatosa in this case and this is taken from the net this is not my picture okay on ultrasound uh, i think in ultrasound if you see anything like this on the anywhere whether on the dorsal of the foot or hand you must trace it proximal and distally you know don't just don't see there and leave it maybe the uh, person who did uh, ultrasound in first setting gave it a vascular malformation because he would have not traced it so any lesion you trace it till it ends if you have traced it he might would have seen that this is arising from the nerve and there will no flow on the doppler and of course mri will be pathognomic so that you can avoid biopsy um, just to describe once again there will be fusiform enlargement of the nerve with t1 and t2 hyperentens fat signal which i have already shown in our case surrounding the cord or spaghetti shape t1 t2 hyperentens bands of enlarged nerve fascicles and also fibrous tissue and differential diagnosis vascular malformation nerve sheath tumor and same dd we had in our case also vascular malformation okay so all these were rare cases but you should no this is spotter anybody this is very simple what is this see first uh, we did uh, plain mri of shoulder and i saw there is this hypoentens structure i thought it's a anterior labral tear 
but nowadays i do ultrasound guided arthrogram in all the cases so i did ultrasound arthrogram uh, ultrasound guided arthrogram and totally my diagnosis was changed so you see that there is anterosuperior labrumis not there and there is another thick hypoantian structure and this is thickened cord like middle glenohumeral ligament uh, sometimes you may have problem whether it's a ligament or labrum so but you trace it mghl on going down will mix with the subscapularis tendon because it's going toward the capsule where, where the labrum as you go in frontally will go towards the glenoid so although on the plain film we uh, plain mri we made it as a labral tear but we changed the diagnosis after arthrogram so see arthrogram is important so wherever you are suspecting labral tear tendon tear better do uh, arthrogram and nowadays ultrasound arthrogram ultrasound guided arthrogram hardly take 5 minutes to do okay so this is a congenital glen glenoid labrum variant this is a absent anterior superior labrum with cord like thickening of middle glenohumeral ligament what can be dd where else you get absent anterior superior labrum congenital sublabral foramen hai na but again you trace that hypoantheral structure it will end it will meet towards the glenoid where in, in the buffered complex it will go towards the subscapularis tendon so all these uh, just i gathered some few cases and these were their cases remember it it will help you in the diagnosis thank you thank you pasna for your few interesting cases and uh, i one thing i like to know that any his, uh, history of overuse in your second case intersection syndrome yeah he was physiotherapist sir so he was like involved in such activities only while being physiotherapy to all patients and all okay 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 so then he was in uh, miss like he himself did gave history that he is a habit of like doing physiotherapy like this so okay. they were overusing this case okay okay thank you any questions from audience nice really nice presentation uh okay you can hear me anyway yes sir yes sir uh, so basically uh, you the first thing i did was management yeah uh yeah. it it uh, yeah when i saw first case even i didn't diagnose <laughs> slowly <laughs> routinely i don't measure sir yeah. only when i see grossly there is something abnormal in the muscle or space is looking smaller then i measure otherwise routinely i don't because yeah. it obvious ten, um, this muscle will appear bulky in normal patient sir. yeah exactly that's what i do mm -hmm. it's just the lure. I, i think one of the things that people who are looking at it for the first time is that even if it measures tight if the mr signal on flat you know fat suppressed is normal and there is no fatty atrophy i don't over report them but it is a very important abnormality to recognize i see a lot of people under reported when they come to the mdt and i look at it and there is high signal or atrophy um, they they are all because of ischiofemoral so it's a very good thing to pick up you know and and so in, for the case in this case now uh, like she um, progress to such a this uh, bad level that she has to hold her thigh while get um, climbing yeah. up and down but yeah. after diagnosing this they gave some special like ultrasonic wave therapy postural um, improvement and all and she is now walking normally yeah. i know about this case because she is my relative so oh, okay <laughs> fair enough fair enough but yeah i often compare with the other side and i only measure as you said when they look normal so the measurement is more as a supportive yeah. thing no sir no thank you excellent presentation uh the chair per person remains the same i call upon dr uh, sitan selin for presenting his cases he is a senior resident of our department
morning, everyone. Uh, and thank you, HOD sir, and all the delegates present here for giving me this opportunity again. Um, as much as I've tried to avoid uh, reporting MSK cases, they do apparently find me. And I will discuss some cases where I have been stumped and I, had, I stand corrected uh, when I have reported certain other cases as malignancies and they turned out to be other tumors. Uh, this is one such case, a 13-year-old female who presented with complaints of swelling and pain in the right mandibular region. Um, she was having this kind of an, uh, le uh, reason, uh, lesion for six months, which was insidious in onset and progressive in nature. The CT shows uh, an ill-defined lytic lesion. Um, initially, when I described this lesion, I did not call this a lytic lesion because I thought that this was a soft tissue tumor that was arising from the gingiva buccal sulcus or somewhere in the oral cavity that was invading into the adjacent bony cortex. The age is 13 years old, so I did not convince myself uh, it was a malignancy or a CA of the gingiva buccal sulcus. And um, then I, uh, I also did a contrast CT. I didn't add it here. In the contrast CT, it had homogeneous enhancement. Unlike um, gingiva buccal malignancy, it will have heterogeneity, which will have a lot of uh, dangerous features. And on the MR, we are seeing uh, just a second. This is a T1 post contrast, T1 non contrast, and the diffusion image. It was striking that uh, the lesion was also homogeneously enhancing on the MR, and on non contrast scans, it was ISO intense. So over the years, I have picked up, and it, I, uh, it is correct also. If we say hyper or hypo intense, we can clearly understand because. Uh, we are able to see it and anybody is able to see it. It is not subjective. But when we say ISO intense, we should make sure that we specify ISO intense to what structure? ISO intense to fat or ISO intense to muscle or what it is. This lesion is ISO intense to the adjacent musculature. It is mildly hyper intense maybe on the T1, but shows homogeneous enhancement and also diffusion restriction. This lesion is causing extensive erosion of the adjacent cortex. So that is how I drafted it first. Then it underwent, uh, the patient underwent a wide local excision and then it turned out to be a desmoid type fibromatosis. Initially, uh, um, after seeing this, I still did not convince myself that this can be some kind of a desmoid tumor. So I thought it might be an odontogenic tumor. Uh, but there was no association with an uh, impacted or a malrotated tooth. Uh, or uh, I, we had seen one case of Langhans histiocytosis that was similar to this that was extending into the base of skull. Um, but it did not turn out to be that. And histopathology... Uh, happens to be true. So in desmoid fibromatosis, it is a densely fibrous tumor. And when I went back to the literature, it seems to be very rare. And it is a very aggressive benign tumor. So however we, whatever we do to treat this, especially if the surgery is not adequate, a few cells are left behind, this is going to come back with a vengeance and it's going to be aggressive. At initial presentation itself, the lesion was picked up because the patient had a palpable lump and some pain. If it wasn't for that, we would not even have picked up this lesion earlier on. So uh, there are two types in this. The, it's an intra-abdominal and an extra-abdominal type, and it is characteristically associated with the mutations in the beta-catenin and the APC gene. The extra-abdominal occurrence is comparatively rare. The tumor expansion displaces the teeth if it is associated with the sub-alveolar part of the mandible or the maxilla. The desmoid fibromatosis, as, described, uh, as discussed earlier, is aggressive benign tumor. It can cause cortical expansion, cortical thinning, and also perforation of the cortex itself. In our case, we can actually see in the post-contrast image and also in the diffusion how it envelops the ramus of the mandible, extends posteriorly and to the other side of the mandibular ramus. So this patient, the 13-year-old, uh, we couldn't give her the full dose of the highest possible chemotherapeutic agents. The anti-cancer drug was uh, uh, toned down. So this is what we call the metronomic chemotherapy, where you give low doses of chemotherapeutic drugs for a prolonged period of time in anticipation that this will re prevent the recurrence of the lesion. We'll move on to the next case. This is a 59-year-old gentleman that presented with nasal block excessive snoring. He went to the ENT and uh, they had uh, done a di diagnostic nasal endoscopy. It, they saw a huge mass and they couldn't negotiate beyond the nasal septum. They ordered a uh, CT of the PNS. When we were, uh, I was in the console when this was being done, it was done uh, somewhere else. And uh, I had extended the uh, field of uh, view a uh, little bit further up and uh, I could see that most of the lesion was invading into the skull. 
so i thought maybe it is going even further up and some other lesion that is extending into the maxillary region but most of it was predominantly involving the base of the skull the sphenoid parts of the bone the posterior paranasus that is the sphenoid sinus was completely opacified and we have a characteristic appearance of the lesion on the ct when i came back to the reporting room um can somebody pick up the appearance on the bone sections the bone kernels this is also kind of a lesion of the jaw so we can think in terms of odontogenic cysts we can think in term of ameloblastomas but they have characteristic appearances what is this this is also very characteristic appearance a very rare tumor the lesion is expansile lytic mostly radiolucent but we can see specks like cotton specks or uh, sugar powder that has been thrown inside the lesion this appearance is called as driven snow appearance since we don't see snow every year and we are not living in that part of the world this is something unusual for us this is characteristic for pinbog tumor yeah the theory is that uh, yeah this is what the histopathology i am not going to pretend i know what is written there no i don't something called lisa gang rings supposed to be calcified concentric rings that's a, that's what the pathologist told me i said yes and um, yeah this was a radiolucent expansive lytic lesion with chunky calcifications involving the bilateral alve i'm sorry i didn't include the lower sections first things that i saw were, were the involvement in the pre alveolar process uh, uh, bone of the maxilla and it was extending into the infratemporal fossa and the skull bones i couldn't completely see the terigo palatine fossa the terigo maladie and the, uh, the entire anatomy was destroyed on both sides and this is probably the reason why it was occluding the eustachian tube and resulting in the ear discharge in the first place that made him go to the end So pinbog tumor is actually called as a calcifying epithelial odontogenic tumor the origin is controversial the theory is that if it is it is also associated with impacted tooth and unerupted tooth so the in the unerupted tooth the crown of the tooth has is enamel the enamel is still within the bone so the bone the enamel starts proliferating and then undergoes dysplastic change to form this it usually occurs in the third to fourth decade of life usually if there is an impacted or a mal rotated tooth we will think of other common tu uh, tumors as we first discussed like the okc ameloblastoma okc is going to be cystic ameloblastoma is going to have a soap bubble appearance there are two types here too the central and the peripheral the extraosseous type of uh, the pinbog is very rare the radiological appearance includes a pericoronal radiolucency coronal referring to the crown of the uh, un unerupted tooth and then the radio opaque flecks that are characteristic to show the driven snow appearance the scattered calcifications this also has a recurrence chance of around 15% the diagnosis differentials have been discussed before here in this patient the tumor was extensively involving the upper part of the maxilla and the base of the skull so ct played a huge role in the surgeon planning on what to do further the extent of resection is going to determine the morbidity of the patient how in future the patient is continue is going to continue living his life how he's going to eat how he's going to talk so ct plays a huge role before we go into surgery in such cases another case it's a middle aged female that presented with left hip pain i will have another sister case like this um this there is a lesion here a predominantly lytic lesion on ct it characteristically involves the location commonly described in the literature any guesses any takers for this this is how i got my exam case also a similar case okay in the ct we are able to see some uh, endosteal scalloping there is cortical thinning and first uh, i had failed to notice this i was uh, suggested uh, i was i was told this was picked up by my colleague and uh, it was there is a focal cortical breach on the lateral part of it so we went ahead and did an mri sorry i didn't include the contrast images here in this we are able to see on t2 on uh, on the ct i thought the soft tissue was actually extending outside through the breach in the cortex into the joint cavity itself causing some expansion in the joint cavity but i was proven wrong here that turned out to be joint effusion so she must have fractured this bone this bone is already diseased and that part is weight bearing so it is prone to fractures and that is what brought her to us 
So this focal cortical breach, even though the bone is diseased and thinned out, is not a malignant transformation, but rather it is a fracture, a pathological fracture, and the joint effusion seems to be reactive. So the diagnosis would be fibrous dysplasia. Liposclerosing myxofibroma was a term that was used previously. It is all dropped, no, not anymore. So it looks like a geographic lytic lesion with sclerotic margins. The MRI, the problem with fibro dis fibrous dysplasia and the MRI is it is an intramedullary lesion and it is going to be T2 hyperintense. Just like our headache, nausea, and vomiting, the common side effects in pharmacology, T2 hyperintense is what we go to. Every time somebody asks us something, we will say it's a T2 hyperintense lesion. So fibrous dysplasia also behaves the same way. It is going to be T2 hyperintense, and your other tumors are also going to be T2 hyperintense. So that is the problem when you land up with an MRI for the first time with the fibrous dysplasia. So you go back to your plain films, that will give you the diagnosis far better and far faster. And uh, sorry, this enhancement pattern of the fibrous dysplasia is also akin to other malignant tumors. It has heterogeneous hyper enhancement. Go to the next case. Yeah, there is a possibility since uh, the, I was considering that this can be malignant, fibrous dysplasia in itself has a chance of turning malignant, uh, malignant in 10% of the cases. And the most common malignancy to occur in fibrous dysplasia would be an osteosarcoma. A sarcomatous change is what we should expect. So in this patient, um, the cortical breach turned out to be a pathological fracture, God forbid. Uh, if it was a malignant the, um, change that I'm suspecting because of the extensive cortical erosion and the focal thinnings, I will have to follow this patient up, do an MR every year to see for any proliferating soft tissue, if that joint cavity is getting infiltrated or not, and all these things. Okay. Now shifting from T2 hyperintense lesions to T1 hyperintense lesions. Um, T1, T2, and another contrast enhancing uh, sequence is given here. So you're able to see it is bright on both sequences. So what will be the next thing to do if you have a T1 bright lesion? Earlier on, I picked up when I was, in a stu uh, when I was a student, I, uh, I saw everybody was describing T2 hyperintense, T1 hyperintense. So I started learning all the T1 hyperintense lesions. So it was easier for me to uh, um, shortlist my diagnosis and also sound smart at the same time. So there are three conditions that will cause uh, T1 hyperintensities commonly. One will be fat, other will be blood, and very rarely melanoma. If it is cystic, what kind of a cyst will have T1 hyperintensity? A mucin-containing cyst, depending upon the proteinaceous content, the T1 hyperintensity will change. And the T1 hyperintensity will change according to the location of this mucin-containing cyst also. In the head and neck, it is completely different, especially within the PNS, whereas outside the PNS, it is a little bit different. Um, going ahead with this, so the first thing that you would want to do, even though this is post-contrast, we want to see a fat saturation image. You are able to see in this contrast, there are some, uh, so it is completely satting out. So the entire lesion is um, become nulled. So what is the content of this lesion then? A T1 hyperintense that is fat saturated, a fat T lesion. So the diagnosis would be a lipoma, right? That is what I gave an ultrasound because it looked very echogenic, but then the pathologist went inside with a needle, randomly poked somewhere, and then found it to be malignant. So they didn't trust my report again. So they sent it back to me. They said, you're wrong. You go ahead and do something else. Okay. I, we did the MR, we discussed together, and then I couldn't figure it out what was then. We went back to the literature, and there was this thing about the histopathology. You can never be able to differentiate an atypical lipoma from a low-grade liposarcoma. So in histopathology, they will be stumped. Whereas we can say whether this lesion is a lipoma or a liposarcoma, because they all exist on a spectrum. From the most benign lipoma that is well-defined, that is purely T1 hyperintense, does not have any heterogeneity inside, and completely fat sets out, no internal enhancing component. This will be very, very important, whereas a liposarcoma in presentation in the clinical setting sometimes will not even have any macroscopic fat for us to demonstrate on MRI. That is how it is. For examination purposes, of course, we are going to have some kind of a fat component in the lesion, along with heterogeneous post-contrast enhancement, and then a part of it is fat setting and all that. So this was, uh, I uh, stood corrected, then I gave this as an atypical lipoma or a low-grade liposarcoma, which could not be, but I can still say that this does not have any malignant uh, uh, features yet. 
the reason the patient came to us is because he had the swelling for some time but there was sudden increase in size of the lesion and over the past few weeks he was worried and that is the reason he came to us this is another sister case of the same t1 hyper intense lesion one is t1 and the other one is some fat suppressed sequence okay uh, let us take this is a stir sequence anyway we are able to see that the subcutaneous fat is suppressed this lesion is bright somewhat bright and then it persists to be bright on the fat set sequence so this rules out fat so whatever this baseline sequence was i have compared it with the subcutaneous fat and then i've come to the conclusion that this is not fat this patient had a history of rta so what can this be what is the content of this lesion if it is cystic now we go back again we see how hyper intense it is on t1 because t1 it does not have to be super hyper intense you see that kind of a shading there that indicates that this can be blood components with the presence of with the history of trauma this is kind of uh, you can see if i am saying this i am declaring this to be blood then you can see that this blood is enclosed in kind of a plastic bag like a packet so this blood is filled in a packet why should it fill like that especially in young athletes who are uh, having this uh, contact sports they get injured like this yeah what is the name of this lesion in a degloving injury you will have the superficial flap the skin removed and then you will have a lot of blood and all that there is no removal of the skin it is completely intact so it is within the fascia the blood has accumulated it has blood within the fascia so this is called as a moral lavale lesion i guess it's french and uh, the in some centers they do aspirate this lesion but the problem with aspirating this lesion is two or three days later the patient is going to come back because the blood vessels are going to open up and bleed back into that same pocket so we will have to uh, devise a strategy like we do for tuberculosis where we do pleurodesis for the pleural effusions we will have to inject uh, some kind of uh, uh, hypertonic saline or something like that so that they stick together yeah another case a uh, 48 year old female stumbled and had a fall the orthopod came to us and he uh, asked he was very sure that uh, she could not have broken this bone by herself and he thought there was a pathological fracture and the pathology being here a metastasis from some other site so he wanted to wanted the, us to say whether there was a lesion inside the fracture site um but there is one history that we would like to ask what was a patient taking in the past what drugs is the patient on any guesses we have discussed this before sorry huh bisphosphonates so if the patient was under bisphosphonate treatment it is very difficult to fracture such a long bone at that part which is covered with so many muscles and guarded by it any trivial injury like this i won't say a fall is trivial but still um that should not fracture that part of the bone so i will go to a case that i learned before from one of the lectures um this patient one this uh, this case study patient she was uh, she or he i am not sure came repeatedly with hip pain and they were seriously imaging the hip every year she used to come and they were imaging one day she ended up with a fracture and then they retrospectively uh, went and saw that a part of the cortex kept on becoming thickened that is a diseased part of the bone because of the bisphosphonate treatment there was improper mineralization of the bone you know the bone matrix is an active living tissue there is mineralization and demineralization going on osteoblastic and clastic activity this improper this imbalance sometimes results in osteoporosis as we age and some things like that right so here this osteoblastic activity even though the cortex appears to be thickened is not strong is not as what god made it to be it's not the natural uh, Uh, normal architecture so this is the point of weakness i know it is it is kind of rare to get it on the lateral cortex usually you would expect it in the medial cortex but this patient in this uh, lecture had this on the lateral cortex eventually it went into a pathological fracture so can i continue sir let me finish time okay sir okay um skip this then yeah i'll just uh, finish with this what do you think this is patient has pain it's a fracture yeah i thought it was a fracture i have reported several times when i was in the residency as a fracture but this is not yeah this is actually the proximal apophysis of the fifth metatarsal 
and mind you this is an unfused skeleton once the skeleton is fused and the apophysis is merged with the bone a fracture can also occur in the same fashion like this so don't get confused with that make sure this is an unfused skeleton to see for the apophysis you can get even more confused because there is an ossicle that can be present in this place right there complicating matters worse that is called as a os uh, vesali enum yeah and that can cause that can also cause some interpretation problems so yeah this is how a fracture looks how do i differentiate in the presence of an unfused apophysis how do i differentiate it from a fracture the fracture will be across the long axis of the bone whereas apophysis will be along the long axis of the bone more more commonly yeah the fracture across also has named subtypes so here we are able to see the three regions where it can fracture itself it can be an avulsion fracture it can be a jones fracture or it can be stress fracture the avulsion fracture begs a question avulsion of what sir just taught us this a little bit earlier about a tendon that inserts into the base of the fifth metatarsal so i think it is relevant to discuss it here which tendon is this on the lateral side of the ankle the peroneus brevis tendon so the peroneus brevis tendon that has this pull avulses this fragment and results in this fracture in the rest is history i'll stop with you sir thank you Uh, next session uh, will be taken up by Dr. Rituparna Das, um, our uh, senior resident. But before that, because uh, Dr. Upasana is leaving, I request the chairperson and Dr. Ganguly to please present here, present her the certificate as well as the uh, memento. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'll be presenting a series of cases that I came across uh, after coming to this department over the period of last one year. So I would stress that these are cases, not spotters. But for brevity, I have tried to focus on some films which are uh, representative of the diagnosis. So instead of scrolling through the entire case, display me. Okay, so I think we are sorted now. So I'll quickly move on to the cases. So, oh. so.
So first up, we have a 12-year-old boy who had presented to the orthopedics OPD with a history of arm swelling and pain for last six months. So this is the uh, sagittal CT image of the humerus. So you can see that there is a lesion within the medullary cavity of the humerus, which is causing expansion of the bone. It has a ground glass matrix with some area of lucencies within it, and it is also causing cortical thinning. And at some areas, we can see that there are areas of cortical breach, though the lesion is not uh, kind of uh, extending outside the bone. So we did an MR for this patient, and this was the MR appearance. So this is a T2 coronal image of the same lesion. So you can see in the proximal metadiaphysis of the humerus, there is a heterogeneous lesion, so which is uh, hyper-intense on T2 with some hypo-intense lines. And basically, it's a mixed heterogeneous appearance. It is causing bulging of the cortical margin and also cortical thinning. If we see closely, another similar lesion is seen here on the superomedial angle of the scapula. So now we move on to the uh, stir image. So we see that the lesion has multiple locules. There are apparent some bony septa within it. And uh, some areas are suppressing and some areas are still hyperintense. The same lesion on a uh, PDFS uh, sequence. Okay, so this is the post-contrast uh, T1FS image of the lesion. So we see that the lesion is showing heterogeneous enhancement, predominantly centered around the periphery of the lesion. Some enhancement are seen around these trans and uh, rims of the lesion. So even in the humeral lesion, we can see that there is heterogeneous enhancement. So any uh, opinion, anyone? what this could possibly be. Multifocal osseous lesions in a young boy who had presented with arm swelling, giving this appearance. The CT itself was diagnostic. I told you it had ground glass matrix. It had areas of lucencies. It is fibrous dysplasia, polyostrotic fibrous dysplasia. So like Siddhant correctly pointed out immediately before, everything is T2 hyper intense. So sometimes you have to look back at the X-rays and CTs to make a diagnosis. Okay. So the second case is of a 24-year-old male patient. So he is a runner. So basically he is a defense personnel who is a runner and he has been complaining of chronic pain and swelling along the anterior aspect of the legs. So these are the axial CT cuts in bone window. And the abnormality that we see here is see the anterior subcutaneous or the shin border of the tibula. There is diffuse hyperostosis of this border. And it's bilateral. It's seen on both sides. And if you closely see that there is cortical thickening also along the entire tibial cortex. Same thing on a sagittal image. Why this image was put separately is I wanted to demonstrate the hyperostosis along the anterior border. And the second thing is, if you observe the trabecular pattern within the medullary cavity in this part of the tibia and in the involved segment, you observe that there is an absence of trabeculae and empty or hollowness within the medullary cavity in this involved segment. So MR was done for this patient. And again, we see the cortical thickening, the hyperostosis. Interestingly, another thing that we picked up on MR was the presence of these subtle stress, fra stress fractures, so which was present in the tibial shaft in the involved segment. So I told you the patient is a runner by profession. So we made a diagnosis of chronic tibial stress injury with chronic sclerosing osteitis. The os this stress injury involves the stress fractures as well as the diffuse cortical thickening and the osteitis component being represented by the diffuse hyperostosis of the shin border of the tibia. So third one is a 27-year male tailor who presented with a gradually progressive painless swelling in the forearm for last three years. So first thing is uh, the occupation doesn't have anything to do with the diagnosis. It was just incidentally mentioned. So he had a progressively increasing painless swelling in the forearm. So we did an ultrasound for the lesion first. So we see here an intramuscular heterogeneous lesion, so which has some hypoechoic areas or some uh, hypo hypoechoic areas and some anechoic areas. So on ultrasound, we did, uh, and after putting the color Doppler, we found that these areas showed vascularity. 
So our provisional diagnosis was that of a vascular malformation or a vascular tumor because of the extensive soft tissue components other than the vascular areas. So a diagnosis of hemangioma was made. And the same thing we uh, saw on ultrasound, uh, so, sorry, we saw on MR. So this is just for the purpose of showing the appear typical appearance of an intramuscular hemangioma on MR images. So this is a T2 sagittal uh, image where you see that there is a uh, predominantly T2 hyperintense lesion with some locules inside, right? And this is the GRE image which demonstrates the vascularity and small areas, these rounded bodies that you see within, these are flebolites. So these are characteristic of any hemangioma or any malformation which has a slow flow. So ideally, slow flow vascular malformations will demonstrate these flebolites. So this was the T1 image. So, and this is the post-contrast image. So post-contrast image demonstrates the uh, vessel pools and uh, the abnormal vessels within, along with the heterogeneously enhancing soft tissue component of the lesion. So the diagnosis was of the hemangioma and flexure compartment of right forearm. Actually, the ultrasound was done retrospectively. Initially, the patient had come for MR, and then we did the ultrasound. Uh, then we have a 28-year-old leprosy patient who had presented with foot deformities and pain, and he has been having this since one year. So these are the coronal CT images. Few things that we can see over here. There were multiple features in this. Firstly, is uh, for a 28-year-old patient, the bone is very less dense, so there is loss of the normal trabecular pattern. So there is osteopenia diffusely involving the uh, lower tibia, fibula, and the visu uh, visualized tarsal bones. We also see that there are some areas of irregular marginal erosions. So this is the calcaneal erosions. Additionally, what we see here is a tallocalcaneal subluxation. Again, in the fibula, we see the large lytic lesions over here, marginal erosions, the tallocalcaneal subluxation being shown here again. So this is a sagittal image. So you can see that the talus is not in its proper position. So there is a tallonavicular subluxation as well. Additionally, we see a deformity over here. What deformity is this? So there's a subluxation of the metatarsophalangeal joint of the great toe as well. So a joint which is presenting with multiple foot deformities, mu uh, multiple marginal erosions, a generalized reduced density of the bones, along with uh, dislocations and subluxations. So these are the MR images, which demonstrates the hind foot valgus deformity with the erosions being seen here clearly. And additionally, if you observe, like just now we had read about the ankle and the ligaments, anterolateral impingement, and there is some synovial proliferation happening over the anterolateral gutter over here. And also if you see the ankle ligaments, they are very stretched and edematous as well. All the ankle ligaments here, the medial compartment, lateral compartment ligaments are stretched and edematous. And even the bones are showing some signs of edema in the adjacent articular surfaces. So this is the bone marrow edema. There was some synovial fluid collection. And this is the post-contrast image, which demonstrates the diffuse synovial enhancement in the tibiotalar and the ta tallocalcaneal compartments. So based on all these features, classically, we read for one arthritis, that is neuropathic arthritis, so which is associated with the 60s that we all know, right? So density change, debris, dislocations, deformities. Okay, so the final diagnosis was of neuropathic arthritis. So next up, we have a 25-year-old factory worker who had presented with paresthesia in the medial aspect of palm following an injury over the elbow six months back. So basically, he was handling some machinery, and he had a very deep lacerated wound over the medial aspect of the elbow. And here we see the soft tissue defect second, uh, because of that wound. Additionally, what we see here is a bony spur or a hook-like structure which is arising from this uh, uh, proximal part of ulna, and it is impinging on the medial epicondyle of the humerus. And the structure that we have here is the ulna nerve. So the ulna nerve is present in the anterior compartment of the arm, and then it pierces the medial intermuscular septum and comes into the posterior compartment, and here it lies superficially over the medial epicondyle of humerus. So this bony spur was impinging the ulnar nerve. And next up in this coronal uh, PDFS image, we see that in the expected region of the ulnar nerve, there is a 
rounded swelling and the nerve itself is not very clearly seen. We cannot see the fascicles, we cannot make out the nerve anatomy and we see this region. Actually, if you could have scrolled this image, it would have been better for you to understand that the ulnar nerve in arm was seen, but only at this site it was not seen. So this is the CT image of the same patient and we see the bony spur very clearly. So this could have been an old fracture which had malunited or an old fracture which had healed or some chronic stress reaction or injury leading to this spur formation. So that was impinging the ulnar nerve and so we gave a diagnosis of traumatic avulsion of ulnar nerve with a neuroma formation at the site of trauma. Next up we have a male patient with presented with gradually progressive swelling in the medial aspect of palm, which was associated with paresthesia in the palm. So this is an axial T1 weighted image. So anatomically, what is this region? Superficial to the uh, carpal tunnel. So this is your, basically, this is the region of your Guyan's canal. So we have in it, it houses the ulnar nerve. So uh, we have a lesion over here, which is T1 iso to hyper intense. And on coronal images, we see that it is a rounded, well-marginated lesion, which is T2 hyper intense and has a hyper intense rim, right? So this, uh, this is the lesion. It, is, it was impinging the flexure tendons underneath it. And this is the post-contrast appearance of the lesion. So more or less a homogeneous enhancement of the entire lesion is seen. So based on its anatomical location, and actually we also tried to trace, I don't know if this video will play or not. I'm really sorry, I tried to show it in one video where you could trace the lesion back to the ulnar nerve. And uh, so we made a diagnosis of an ulnar nerve schwannoma. So other than that also, the diagnostic features were a well-defined lesion housed in the Guyan's canal, and we could trace it back to the ulnar nerve. Sorry, I couldn't play the video. So this was a ulnar nerve schwannoma. So this was a very interesting case and it took me a lot of time to finally come to the diagnosis. So a 42 year old homemaker, she had presented with multiple bone pains which were migratory in nature since last one year. Please make note of the point that she was having bone pains and not joint pain. So she complained of pain in her arm, she complained of pain in her forearm, in her legs, but never in the joints, not in the knee, not in the wrist. So, see, uh, this is uh, the lesion that we had. So in both her legs, actually it's difficult to so, uh, show both the legs uh, at a time. So what we had was in the mid shaft of both tibia and fibula, we were having these sort of lesions. So what were the lesions like? They were lytic, they were expensile, and they were hypo heterogeneously hyper intense on, uh, heterogeneously hypo intense on T1 and T2 with some hyperintense areas, they were causing expansion of the medullary cavity and cortical breach as well. So we can clearly see the cortical breach it has caused and uh, this is displacing the surrounding muscles. There was no definite invasion. So multiple such lesions were seen in both the tibia and the fibula. Additionally, when uh, we also saw that besides having these lytic lesions that we are seeing on this uh, coronal bone, uh, CT image in bone window, so this is the mid-shaft lytic lesion with some bony septa persist, uh, seen within it. There is cortical thinning and bone expand, mild bone expansion over here. We also saw some sclerotic lesions that were present within the bones. So these sclerotic lesions were also scattered in both the tibia and the fibula. Now we tried to include other parts of the skeleton so we, because it was difficult to make a diagnosis from this. We tried to see what other bones were involved. So this is a axial CT in, uh, of the brain in bone window. We see that there is diffuse thickening of the calvarium. You cannot clearly make out the inner and outer table differentiation. So there was uh, thickening, there was osteosclerosis, and within it, we saw some small lytic foci. So these two were scattered in all the bones, frontal, parietal, occipital bones. Se uh, and in the pelvis, see small lytic lesions, these lytic lesions, they were seen involving the sacrum as well, uh, sacrum as well as the ileum on both sides. Besides, she also had lytic lesions in the ribs, but we will, uh, the le lesions were similar in morphology to the one you see in the pelvis. So this is again another sclerotic lesion, big sclerotic lesion in the radi uh, distal radius. So again, also you see another sclerotic lesion in the distal radius of the other side. 
Lytic lesions similar to the appearance of the lesion in the tibia within the, meta, uh, within the uh, proximal phalanx. Interesting thing is, I don't know how evident it is on this image, but if you closely observe, you will see some erosions along the radial aspect of the phalanges. Some subperiosteal bone resorption happening over the radial aspect of the phalanges. So this sort of rang a bell because we uh, read that in hyperparathyroidism, the skeleton will show both osteosclerotic and osteolytic features. So the lady was having multiple lytic lesions in, uh, like scattered across the entire skeleton, and she had multiple sclerotic lesions also presenting in same bones that were having the lytic lesions. Additionally, the hand showed changes of subperiosteal some resorption happening over the radial aspect of the phalanges. So this is again, we see the lytic lesions in the uh, foot bones. So finally, we made a diagnosis of a hyperparathyroidism and the serum values were done and they correlated well with the diagnosis. So actually this is case is still under investigation. We are trying to look for the source. We will do a USG neck when the patient comes next. And the last one is of a 50 year male patient who had presented with a slowly growing swelling in the sole of foot since last three to four years. It was painless, gradually progressive in size. So this is the T2 sagittal image of the lesion. So here we see that we have a well-defined lobulated lesion, which has some internal T2 hypo-intense components and some hyper-intense components. So these areas are almost similar in intensity to the subcutaneous part of the sole. And this is a sagittal T1 weighted image showing a hypo-intense component. And of course, now since it is hyper-intense on T1, we clearly know that this is fat. And uh, these are areas of mineralization within the lesion. So this was the post-contrast image that we had obtained. The lesion was extending into the intermetatarsal space or the web space between the digits, and uh, it was extending uh, to the dorsum of the foot as well. So though the lesion was epicentered in the sole, it was extending to the dorsum, and it was causing some pressure erosions of the adjacent bones, which I'll demonstrate on, uh, this, uh, on CT. And if you observe that the lesion is not homogeneously enhancing, there are some components which show some enhancement. There's no enhancement in the fatty areas and also in the areas of mineralization. So this was the CT appearance of the lesion. So these are the pressure erosions of the adjacent bone. So the lesion had not invaded into the adjacent metatarsals. It was clearly uh, causing erosion because of the long-standing uh, pressure effect. And it was extending into the uh, dorsum as well. The tendons around it were also free of the lesion and the tumor was uh, just pushing the tendons on its periphery. So these were the areas of calcification within the lesion. So this is the calcification that we clearly see on the bone window reconstruction. So which had appeared hypo-intense on T1 and T2. So this was a slow growing tumor of the foot which was not arising from any of the structures, not from the bone, not tendons or muscles and it showed extensive calcification within. So we finally came up with the diagnosis of a soft tissue chondroma for this lesion. It is yet to be proven by biopsy, but we are waiting for the biopsy results. We had taken a US guided bi biopsy for this lesion, so we'll wait for it and see if we are correct. So based on my literature search, it appeared to be this. So yeah, thank you. So this was a collection of few interesting cases I had seen. Hope you find it useful. Thank you so much. Yes, very good collection of cases, few rare cases. Any questions from audience? No questions. Students can go for lunch break, but please come by uh, 45 minutes, within 45 minutes, come back within 45 minutes, okay? After that, we'll, uh, uh, we'll have a live demonstration of uh, ankle joint and then uh, our regular program, okay? So, uh, all are requested to please leave for, there is a VIP patient who will be examined uh, separately. So, please, please, uh, uh, actually a lady patient, that's why we do encourage our students to remain here. Uh, please uh, 
go for lunch we are coming within 15 minutes
two sessions left one is novelty in musculoskeletal assessment and another uh, pg's program means uh, the poster presentation but before that i'll request dr ganguly to demonstrate uh, ankle joint okay because i am having some ankle pain i am going there to be examined by him so everybody you will be able to see इसको थोड़ा और भी पास कर दीजिए तो आई डोंट नीड टू वरी अबाउट द माइक देन सो जनरली व्हेन आई एम स्कैनिंग आई विल स्टार्ट फ्रॉम द एंटीरियर एस्पेक्ट ऑफ द एंकल ओके सो जस्ट बेरिंग्स रिमेंबर बेसिक्स फर्स्ट मेक श्योर टॉप इज़ एट द टॉप सो दिस इज़ टिबिया आई एम गोइंग इनटू द टिबिया एंड आई क a little bit from left to right. So obviously if I was, so this, this black thing, do you know what this black thing is? Anyone? Cartilage, okay. So that's the cartilage on the Taylor dome. So I can see if I was to move the ankle, I'll be able to see a bit more of the cartilage. So there's a little bit of thinning of the cartilage, but you expect that on anybody on the other side of 40. So that's not a problem. And then if I keep going down, uh, the problem is that the bones don't have their names written on them. So you have to follow them down from the talus. That means the next one is navicular. This has to be navicular. That means this has to be medial cuneiform. And, and then I check and see whether my transducer is going towards the big toe. Yes, it is. So I'm on the right track. So that's the only way. So when you get lost, uh, when you lose yourself, find the metatarsus and go back 
and then that will tell you which. So this is intermediate cuneiform because I'm in line with the second toe. If I'm in line with the third toe and I go back, then it is the lateral cuneiform. I'll come back, he's sore around the big toe, so hence I'm looking at the big toe. So all I can see in the big toe is, again, if I freeze there. So this is the cartilage, the interface. This is a little bit of synovial thickening and fluid, which you see very often with a bit of wear and tear, as we say wear and tear. Uh, people don't like the use word little bit of OA, so wear and tear is a little bit of arthritis. So how do I know it's synovium or fluid? So if I press, I can't do anything to that, whereas even the bones and tendons and things I can move. So okay, going back to power Doppler now, so if I can move it. So that's my hand movement. That's a blood vessel, so because it's outside the synovium. So there's actually not much vascularity in the synovium, which is how you expect with OA. But no big osteophytes and like a decent amount of cartilage. I can't see any erosions. So I'll get rid of this and I'll move from side to side. If you've got an erosion, just like we saw, this is just a normal exaggerated angle of the neck and the head because this is a bit of an osteophytic lipping. Okay. So this is OA. So it's the same principle, whether you're looking at the hand or the knee or the ankle or anywhere. Okay, so I'll come back the way we came to the ankle. Once I've looked at the anterior bit of the bone, okay, the next thing that I'll do is I'll go transverse. So from medial to lateral, this, if you're ever lost, trace the tendon down. So this is uh, the tibialis anterior, right? So that means the next one would be EHL and then extensor digitorum longus and then peroneus tertius, right? The same anatomy. So in fact, actually, when I do an ankle arthrogram, um, if I do an ankle arthrogram, I'll find that artery. Obviously, I want to miss it. That's the thing. I'll go either medial and angle that way or often lateral because I can see more of the Taylor dome and measure... Oh, can I ask it? So then I'll measure there and land there. Can you see? Uh, that's where I'll inject. And yeah. we'll come to the gutter. We were talking about anterolateral gutter. Um, so we'll come to that in a minute. So I've seen something in the anterolateral gutter, a little bit of fluid. So I'll stick, come to that last. Generally, uh, we tell the registrars, hold your horses. Whenever you see an abnormality, keep an eye, mark that, but go to that last. Because last thing you want is to press and irritate a patient who's already sore in an area, and then he won't let you look at anything else. So look at everything else that looks normal and come to that last, right? So I spotted a bit of fluid, so I'll go right to the medial side now, okay? So my transducer position is transverse. There's no hard and fast rule. The idea is find it the highest resolution. <coughs> resolution to that work too. Okay, that's good. That's good. So this is medial malleolus, right? Okay, so this is tibialis posterior tendon. Anisotropy, that means it's normal. Shape, normal. Next one, FDL, normal. Size-wise, tibialis posterior should be less than double the size of FDL, right? So it is, obviously I'm not measuring it, but it looks less than double. So he does not have TP dysfunction. So that's fine. Um, next is the tibial artery and its vein. And I'm trying to anisotropically identify the nerve. So the nerve is sitting just here, just below. If I, to see the FHL, don't confuse that with the nerve, okay? FHL is much farther back. If you noticed my hand movement, I was here when I found the nerve. There's the nerve again, just deep to, they'll often be running just deep to the artery, okay, and the vein. If, we, if you go further back, only then, 
do you start sorry seeing the FHL tendon which is actually this now I'm behind the artery and things previously for the nerve I was below the artery okay so I went from this position right to the back and I used the same anisotropy to find the tendon and there is the FHL tendon you can always go back up and find the muscle if you want he doesn't have any fluid in that with regards to the ligaments so a little bit of fluid around the tibialis posterior tendon as you can see here is normal as long as it doesn't envelop the whole tendon if somebody holds their leg in one position and things often you will find a tiny bit of fluid I don't I wouldn't get excited if the tendon looks normal and the fluid doesn't completely surround it okay so now I go in a longitudinal section so these let me see what I can see so this is obviously so the deeper components of the deltoid is just here it's the triangular bit you can't see much at the moment apart from a feel of a striation some of the superficial if you angle them correctly so this is one of the superficial ligament components which is going down past the deltoid and then if you trace depending on where you're going we don't necessarily interrogate the specific tibionavicular tibio spring tibio calcaneal ligament the other thing that we look at here is the Taylor head so this is the tibialis posterior tendon if I scan down follow the tibialis posterior tendon until you get to the head of the talus which is this and then measure this do you know what this structure is so this is a superomedial component of the spring ligament so again it measures three millimeter in, uh, in dr. Kareem's case um, normal is up to about five millimeter so when you see pest planus or flat foot deformity there is a theory that the TP tendon goes first followed by the spring ligament and the foot goes that way some people will say the foot is inherently that way that will stretch the spring and so it's all sort of interconnected but it's part of the assessment that I do particularly important just like we were looking at that uh, femoral acid you know femoral impingement uh, ischiofemoral impingement I only do this when the tibialis tendon looks abnormal because they are associated spring ligament thickening so I'll do that again so find the tibialis posterior tendon in cross section go down 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 until you see the curve of the Taylor head and then the only structure just like the lateral side here the only structure that is there yeah sorry in between that is the spring ligament the only structure between the tibialis posterior and things so we can assess the spring ligament there so now we come to the lateral side and by this time we run out of jelly so the other thing about musculoskeletal ultrasound you, you run out of jelly but I suppose if you do obstetric scanning you run out of jelly as well you run out of jelly faster I suppose with obstetric scanning so with the lateral it's a bit tricky with the lateral so I will always do it clinically so the top so we call it the toe and the heel end of the transducer I don't know whether you call it or not so we often call it so we'll put the toe in the lateral malleolus and then I'll change the heels direction to find everything because anatomically I know that ATFL is basically a horizontal structure once I find that I will go up and find the anterior tibiofibula because that's also horizontal ish structure or although on MR it is oblique on ultrasound it's largely horizontal uh, I'll show you what I mean and then I'll go and try and see the CFL okay so I'll show you what I do so I'll first um, look at the lateral malleolus and find and the ATFL well it's quite thin 
So normally, Arik Takarur ATFL, Bekle, you could have seen, normally ATFL is a very nice, thick trapezium of a ligament. So in your case, I can see it, but it's a little bit sort of heterogeneous in texture, tiny bit of fluid superficial to it, suggests a sort of either degeneration or an old injury related thing of the ATFL. And it is a little bit lax as well. So when I say lax, that's because it's sort of caving in. Um, if you turn your leg, yeah, you don't have it. Oh, sorry. So this structure is AITFL. It's this thin ligament. This. So if you keep an eye on this structure, this is anterior tibiofibular ligament. Okay, I'll skin it again. It's a really thin structure because it's a flat structure. So we can't, on an MR, we can see the flat band on a coronal image. Here we can only see the axial bit of the flat band. So it looks like a very thin structure. It is actually like a flat band. So when you see that, the only structure below that is ATFL. Now in an ATFL is normally visible very easily. In your case, it looks as if you might have had a partial unrecognized tear and a bit of scarring and this is a little bit of synovial thickening and a meniscoid bit that I was talking about. It's not meniscoid bit, but this is a bit of inflamed fat and a bit of tissue in the anterolateral gutter. So, if you've got pain there or swelling or you get there, so that is a soft sign of anterolateral change and that's why we saw the fluid. So now that your leg is in a different position, the fluid is gone from there. It's gone that way now somewhere. You can see this. So the next important bit is obviously once you see that the ATFL the, oh, actually, this is the ATFL, but it still looks a bit uh, abnormal. So, see, it's a, this structure. Let me measure it so you will see what I'm talking about. It is this whole structure. Can you see it's like a trapezium going from here? So, imagine this is the side of the trapezium. This is one surface, that is the other surface, and this is the other end. So, it's almost like an inverted trapezium. But yeah, I want to easily take care of it either normally. To the abdom normal high. So again, even if I don't evert the leg, going back to the principle that I said, these are the two peroneal tendons. Okay, the only structure that you can see deep to it is CFL. So it can't be anything else. So, so you can see the fiber structures here a little bit because it's like a boomerang. Unless I actually evert the leg, I won't be able to. Even then, I won't be able to see the whole bit of it. But this is the CFL. This is the vertical portion of the CFL. After that, it comes up into it like this. So because it's coming that way towards you, you will struggle to see it. But this is a very normal-looking CFL. If it was abnormal, thickened, swollen, fluid, or edematous, then I would try to evert his leg and try to see the rest. But as of now, I'm more than happy that that's a normal CFL. So obviously, as soon as you see anything wrong with the ATFL, you've got to look at the CFL, as I said, because that is going to be the critical determinant. PTFL, you can't assess. You can't see with uh, ultrasound. That's pretty much it. Uh, we can look at the peroneal tendons as you go up. These are the two tendons, brevis closer to the bone. OK. Um, if if I was to look at, so what I normally would do is put the leg on something, find the peroneal tendons, uh, sorry, I mean, and I mean, dorsiflex, plantiflex, correct? Yeah, so, yeah, that's good. So, uh, actually, freeze, score. Okay, so relax. So, Basically, I don't know whether you noticed or not, this is just an isotropy that the brevis looks bright and the longus doesn't look bright. This structure overlying it is a superior peroneal retinaculum. If that was torn, when he was doing it, which he was doing better than most of my patient does, these tendons would have sprung out or sat there. That's how you demonstrate dynamic ultrasound, subluxation of the peroneal tendons. That's how you do. You don't have to do anything eversion, inversion. You'll end up injuring the ankle. Even the act of plantar flexion, dorsiflexion quickly will make it move. And obviously here there is no movement at all. Okay, that's the last bit. Just Alekbar Patam in Tule. Okay, so plantar flexion, dorsiflex a bit. 
So see, I mean, the, the brevis is moving, but when there is, uh, yeah, that's fine, relax. So when it is subluxing, it will come right out. It, it, there's no two ways, you, you will spot it. It'll be very, very obvious when it subluxes. So that's how we assess for subluxation. I think that's pretty much it. The only thing that I didn't look at is the Achilles tendon. Can you look at it? Achilles tendon, normally we look with uh, you lying on your tummy. So on your side, Tale. Also, Tale, um, Akbar, Sorry, we are making, making the most of Dr. Kareem on the table. <laughs> we can look at all the things. Plantar fascia and all the things. It, uh, so normally, as I was saying, I look at, so first things first, that's okay. Slightly, even, even after doing so many ultrasound, my brain is a little bit confused because I'm used to seeing it from a different angle because I lie them on their tummy and things. But no, no, that's fine. It's absolutely fine. That's fine. That's part of the training as well. But I know when I'm going down, this and I'm going up, okay? So the tendon looks entirely normal. Can you see it? Uh, and how do we move that focus? Even if I don't, ah, perfect. If you can see the echogenicity and the echo right nature. So can we, how can we do the elastography to share wave? Can you tell me what you're doing? You're doing a machine different, you know? So, kunta pe velocity and color mapping ashe jeta pe or youngs the neel lal naan no kuma shna jeta bole je degeneration ashe. Chola hai chola. Complete kore dila hai na. Box ta tendon ne rupur lagbe na? Box ta kore na. Box ta kore da? Upo da. I want there. Update hai chakha? Na, ashu kota. Yeah, this is actually excellent because I, want, I am going to talk about it a little bit for those who don't know. So the color coding, you can look at the chart, okay? It gives you kilopascal, you know, the pressure and things. The basic principle, it, it's showing how well your shear wave is transmitting, okay? So the shear, so that the tougher, the tighter, the better the fiber structure is and tighter, it'll go faster through that and it'll slow down in areas of mucoid degeneration. So although structurally it looks absolutely normal, there is a couple of areas of green within the blue. Means there is some microscopic mucoid degeneration. What we are talking about is actually sort of research level. Uh, it's called experimental stage because we don't really know whether we are seeing this too early. Should we really be doing anything to those tendons we show? It's been looked at in the carpal tunnel where it, are, it, it is showing areas of you know, loss of shear wave, uh, but there is no real textbook or anything telling you whether we should be intervening, because I would never be doing anything to that tendon. It looks normal. But you know, I, if I do the same, I'll probably find the same. In fact, that was my plan if you didn't volunteer to see how my tendon is. Uh, but thank you very much. Uh, so that just is a demonstration of how I do my ankle with an additional bit of the shear wave to just show you what. But as I said, shear wave, um, until there is more data available, I wouldn't base any treatment on the shear wave. But it's, it's interesting to look at and see, particularly when things look normal. And on the shear wave, it has some abnormality. So it is better to degenerate the brain than uh, to. <laughs> it's really nice. I might actually have a look. At the shear wave. This generation is more preferable, brain or uh, tendon. <laughs> I used to get, a, I might actually look at it because Akhon it's fine, but I used to get a lot of tennis elbow symptoms. Achha, tale, down to chunne ho, ito ko eta fluid to ito. Ito to old is something, ito to injury, achha. Ito to ame ito vishan bhalo chile 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 chile. Ito to ke lafano ta prottek dinir vyapar chilo. That's not the ligaments. Then. This is your phone. So I might actually look at my own uh, common extensor tendon later on shear wave because I used to play a lot of cricket and then because it's my leading hand, I used to get a lot of pain there. But I never got it injected. 
or did anything, I just used to rest. Now that I don't play regularly, it is okay. It is, it is fine. I want to look at it. Is there somebody with uh, yes. hand? Yeah, yeah, we can look at it. So we can look at uh, his. Uh, I said, let's start. Yeah. There is a two minutes, five minutes time I can require. Okay. One of our coding will be each. He has to be given the certificate. Okay. Certificate, then? So you have to Flexion and supination. So what's the antagonist of supination? Pronation. So if I pronate my hand, 
So this is the way to find. You don't flex and extend to look at the integrity of the biceps tendon. All you do is uh, you hold the hand. Sounds great when you say hold the hand of somebody. Uh, and you pronate and supinate to see whether the tendon, can you see the tendon gliding? Yeah, so that shows it's normal. So, yeah. And if you want, you can trace it, but bear in mind, often when you trace, you might have to change the resolution from high resolution or drop the frequency a little bit if you want to see it going into the uh, radial uh, tuberosity. So this is the radial tuberosity because obviously you want it to be really uh, high frequency. Remember, if you turn the hand that way, you'll be often able to see, but sometimes, yeah, you can see with the movement, you can see the bone moving with the tendon. Can you see? So the bone is, here's the radial tuberosity. Yeah, right? You can see it uh, changing position. So that's that. So the next thing I come around is look at the ulnar nerve. So straight away, I'm going fairly high up to show you. So the ulnar nerve we learned yesterday, which even I have forgotten, it runs along the medial aspect of the triceps, okay? So no, I haven't forgotten, I had to remember. Thanks to Dr. Karim's talk about upper limb or instruction for me to talk about it. I had to read it up about 10 times, so now I remember. So, so as, as I come down, so this is a normal, uh, yeah, so this is a normal nerve. Arrow. Where's the arrow? By the time I find the nerve, I lose the arrow. By the time I find the arrow, then the nerve is gone, okay. So there's the ulnar nerve, normal, on the medial triceps, okay. I am following the ulnar nerve. Sorry, my arrow slips off sometimes. You can see it's got thickened, quite thickened. So we now know two causes of thickening of the nerve, don't we? Thanks to the presentations uh, before, you get fibrolipomatous hypertrophy, but this is not that. Why? If you nod with me, you need to give me an answer. If you say, well, you know, then tell me why. Why is it not? Excellent. The, the coaxial cable sign, as they call it, and also fat is what on ultrasound? Yeah. Uh, and also, well, depends on where the fat is, but you're right, generally fat is echogenic. So even there is no anisotropy, so it's not a tendon or an accessory thing that you're mistaking. And if it was multiple, if it's fatty, you would have seen the coaxial cable fat and the dark areas of nerve fascicle in between, so very well done. So this is basically thickened nerve. Um, at this point, obviously in India, it's a common diagnosis of Hansen's or whatever type, but if it is the UK, then you'll be talking in terms of autoimmune neuropathies, okay? Which obviously, if it's the spine, it'll be Gulenbar, as they call it. it uh, in India, we used to call it Gulenberry. We used to call, you know, a kind of Gulenberry will come. Gia Bar is what they actually call it in French. So, so it's GB syndrome because of the confusion. We used to call it GB syndrome because sometimes they don't understand. But anyway, this is that. I'll demonstrate something else while we are at it. Behind the epicondyle, or uh, resolution, high resolution. Okay. That's, I, I actually stop it and I freeze. Relax. So sometimes, if you keep an eye, you will see little bits of the Osborne's fascia, as I was saying. It's basically, basically like the SPR, which is an envelope, which keeps the nerve in place. So what I'm going to do is what I do for dynamic examination. So is kya karenge? Abhi se karna nahi. Magar is baar main karunga. Main wahan pe dekhunga. Aap dheere dheere isko aise kijiye. Ha? Theek hai? Main batane ke baad. Pehle nahi. So find the medial epicondyle. Find the nerve. We'll find out for real if it's a bluxus or not. Sorry, here. Sorry. So if you lose contact with jelly, then you put more jelly because that's critical. You need to be able to see. Ah, ticket now.
that's why. And straight, see that? And bend. So, yape freeze kare ek So, that's the nerve right in the middle of the screen. Can you see it? Sorry. Scroll back. Yeah, so that's the nerve, okay? And unfreeze right in the middle of the screen. And unfreeze now. So if you bend and if you straighten it out, when it subluxes, you have to follow the, so my transducer is not moving, so the nerve is not subluxing out. When it subluxes, it literally pings out. So if you're struggling to find it, A, he'll tell as well, okay, it subluxes, and he'll get a funny sensation when it moves. There is nothing like that, it's just thickening of the nerve. Okay, so sometimes in people who are subluxing, you will see this as well. Ekbar freeze kare. So I'm talking with, talking to the person who understands Bangla in Hindi and talking to the person who understands Hindi in Bangla. But excuse my apologies um, for that. So this is the medial triceps. So for those who do a lot of bench presses amongst you, it's, it's that triceps which causes the snapping. So in people who have got a snapping triceps um, injury or snapping triceps syndrome, as they bend that triceps, so obviously, again, it'll, you know, there's a slight move, a slight flicker, can you see? There's a little bit of subluxation, I can actually feel it. There's a tiny bit of flickering. When some, in some people, it'll come out completely. Yeah, it's a tiny bit, so when you do this, you will get a feel under the probe, under the transducer. In snapping triceps, that's uh, that's all we do. So yeah, oh, okay. Abhi ek bahar ki taraf, last wala. Oh, to nas me pura pura problem hai. Usi liye lag raha hai aisa. To this one actually, uh, aise rakhe hain. Yeah. Sir. Yeah. No, just bas aise chhod de. So this is again. I've lost a bit of jelly, so I'm going to use it from there. So this is the common extensor tendon insertion, right? Completely normal. How do we know? It looks like that little slope-like thing. That's the insertion footprint of the common extensor tendon, and all the muscles and tendons go into an extent and insert there. Can I see the radial collateral ligament? No, I can't. Uh, even on MR, you will struggle. So if I put power Doppler, somebody with tennis elbow will have a thickened tendon there, an activity within the muscle. Let's try the shear wave. Share wave wala ek bar karo. Tendon ke upar lae or activate kare. Oh, ye mera movement hai kya? Nahi, recapture fir. Oh, reki beshi. Reki amal haath pe re. Acha. Acha, haath pe andar ki jiye thora. एक सेकेंड वो टके कर्सर टके बा बॉक्स टके शोला वाइट बट तले हम लोग आमी और रेस्ट कोडी तले हमारे हाथेर मूवमेंट हो बे ना या ऐसा ना देखे वो यो पोट है चलो ऊपर टेंडर ने कैसे चलो और एक टू पिचो और एक टू डाम दिखे या परफेक्ट एक ही लिस्टे दारु नष्ट चलो ये टाइप यहाँ पे राष्ट्र में ना We can look at it later, it's not a problem. Report. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh -huh. Median. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But the red one, that's why I'm green and blue. Gulo, dekha jaa chilo ek tu ek tu. Shayi ta ekna maybe it's not a big area, or because there are bones and other things in the area. In so that's one of the things. But that's fine. So, take it. Ab ab pore dekh boshe ta tale. Tale ekhon elastography ta bande kordo. And the last thing I look at is at the back, which is the triceps tendon, right? 
Okay, triceps tendon insertion. Um, so, ठीक है, देते हैं पोषण के लिए. अच्छा वो भी देख लेते हैं, ठीक है. अच्छा, so he is he is also indicating the area of the Guillaume tunnel. So we know that um, it will probably be coming from the cubital tunnel. But since he has got symptoms on the same area, we now know about the crush syndrome, the double crush and the reverse crush, so they are more likely. So hence, we will believe him, and we will have a look to see if I can see anything also in the Guillaume's tunnel. And relax. So again, compared to the, his ulna nerve is not that thickened, but freeze uh, correct. So the ulna nerve is here. So certainly not as abnormal as it was uh, behind the elbow, but compared to his, actually it's not that thickened compared to this. So this is the median nerve, which looks pretty normal and flat. It's, it's it pretty much normal in this part, actually. Here's the ulnar artery and here's the ulnar nerve beside it, right? in the Guillaume's tunnel, superficial. It's in that little triangle, superficial to the flexor retinaculum. Here's your little triangle of fat. And this is either the hook of Hamet or pisiform. It's probably pisiform based on where I am. If I come further, I'll find the hook of Hamet. That is more the hook of Hamet. And you can see the nerve here. That's the nerve. And if you want, you can trace it. It's a little bit more thicker here, right? Little bit more thicker, certainly compared to previous. And I'm going the other way. So this was the ulnar nerve dividing and the cutaneous branch coming off there. And as we go that way. So a little bit thickened, not as bad. So that's basically it. So we look at the nerve. You can trace it back or forth, whichever way. I just demonstrated how I'd look at the elbow as well. And uh, did you want to see anything else? Any other structures or anything else around the region? Which one? Yeah, I didn't show the elbow joint, but if I'm aspirating the elbow joint, two things. First of all, if I can see fluid somewhere, I'll go into the fluid from wherever I can see it. It doesn't matter where I can see it. Obviously, I'll try and miss the brachial artery and things, but I will. if I see fluid, I'll go for the fluid, okay? If I don't see fluid, then my place is under the triceps tendon in between the bones and the fat, okay? So the fat behind the tendon, yeah. Okay, sorry. Any demonstration is required, maybe you. Yeah, we can do it during catch up and questions and yes. things as well, yeah. Absolutely fine. Um, so there is another session of Dr. Ganguly. Novelty in musculoskeletal ultrasound. Assessment. Actually, this was ordered by me, particularly, because every day the science is developing and there are many newer issues that comes up. And because he is working on this field for uh, close to two decades, so he has immense experience on that. So we like to hear uh, about novelty in musculoskeletal assessment. After that, the PG program will start and valedictory session. This session is chaired by Dr. S.P. Kaviraj. My theory is all teaching is good teaching. Any teaching is good teaching, whichever you look at it. So, and we got additional, we weren't planning to do the ankle and elbow, but it's always nice, I don't you know, mind. So although we are an hour back, behind,
इंट्रोडक्शन के बाद इस ओवर एक टू टू सेकेंड लागे टू अंडरस्टैंड So where's my phone? Yeah, well, originally it was an hour, but we'll see if we can finish in 45 minutes or something. But I don't want to. There are some interesting challenges, um, and so I don't want to uh, sort of not show you what's in the horizon or event horizon, uh, as they say in space terminology. Um, I, I just to declare that I don't have any affiliation with any CT, MR, or ultrasound vendors, I will be using Canon's images because we've got eight Canon ultrasound scanners and one Samsung. Um, and I didn't realize Samsung makes ultrasound machines until I saw one. I thought they make TVs and fridges. But they do make ultrasound machines as well and very good ultrasound machines. So I do like their machine as well. But we've got eight Canon, so a lot of um, imaging demonstration and things are from my Canon reps in the ultrasound section. We have Siemens um, and Philips MR-wise, and we've got Canon and Philips CT-wise. So you have a total of uh, three, four MR and four CTs. So um, it is, so the event horizon of MR and CT and the development and innovation is, is immense, the things that we can do. Obviously, not, not, not as much as that, but we can do quite a lot. And I'll divide this talk into MR, CT, and ultrasound. So I'll start with MR first. Um, so generally, the basic principle for any uh, ultrasound or any advancement is even your directors and you know, you, uh, certainly our directors want everything to be done quickly. If it takes 10 minutes, do it in five. If it takes two minutes, do it in one. And more scan, quicker scan, more economical better patient friendly. So all of these is to do with faster scans, right? So the focus generally about improvement and innovation is always going to be, there's no, there's no magic in it, it's going to be towards making it faster, better, more economical, easier, available, and of course it has to be realistic as we were talking about. I mean, we, we can't do 10 point diffusion. We will have to do two point diffusion because we can't put the patient in the MR scanner for an hour. We don't. So obviously, faster imaging is about imaging quickly. That doesn't mean we image two patients at once. That doesn't happen. There used to be this theory in, uh, in America at one point, used to be called the MR tunnel of love. So you can go into the MR tunnel with your friend, all hugging, and you both get your MRs together. But no, that doesn't happen. It doesn't fit to people, no matter how thin or thick uh, or fat you are. So basically, I'll start with cons um, accelerated MRI. So this is conventional accelerated imaging, and even if you don't know, some of you departments will probably have it. You may not realize you have it, but you already have it. So we certainly have these, and we have some additional things that I'll tell you. So what's the reason for having fasted imaging, if you think? Uh, of course, fasted imaging means increased patient comfort, there's reduced movement, there is less need for sedation. You can scan a child, you can scan a claustrophobic patient quicker because they'll only be there for five minutes, okay? Um, obviously, it increases access because now a lot more people can be scanned and increases throughput because we've got faster imaging. So the two things that I'm going to talk about, the 100, well, actually three. There are, there are hundreds way of faster imaging, and I, 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 I think, or I'm assuming you know all about case space and the principles of MR imaging because we don't have time to go into it. Uh, but I'm assuming, uh, I might go into a little bit of the case space uh, if need be. Um, but we'll talk about three things. One is parallel imaging. The other is compressed sensing under sampling or called CSU because um, it just seems easier. And multi-slice acquisition. But most places will be doing multi-slice acquisition anyway. So who of you don't understand case space? Okay. I'll put the question differently. Who understands about case space really well? Okay, so I think no hands in both ways is a bit confusing because 
if anybody had put their hand up uh, to say I understand it really well, I would have said, please come here and do the rest of the talk and explain it to me as well. No, I'm joking. But the main thing is to remember that case space is where we write the data. When I say we write, the machine writes the data, right? Okay, I'll, talk, I'll do this bit deliberately slowly. So you all know the MR principles. You all know the MR principles, right? We, we have a patient. We put the patient in the scanner. Okay, the scanner has got B0. And then we put an RF pulse on, okay, which is basically an oscillating thing. So because it's oscillating and not in any one direction, it basically in simple terms spins the magnet or the longitudinal magnetization into transverse magnetization. Then as it goes back, when you turn the RF off and the longitudinal transverse goes back to longitudinal, like your FID, okay? You can't map the FID. What you can map is the T2 as the drop of that signal because you can't measure T1, right? You can measure T2. Well, actually not T2 even, T2 star because there is no T2. It's T2 star because you can't avoid field inhomogeneity, right? If you, well, there is. You can argue and say, yes, you can measure T2. How can you measure T2? If you give a 180 degree pulse, um, basically, you regenerate the lost. I don't want to go into it. You regenerate and you can measure T2 because that's not part of the talk. So essentially then, at time TE, what are you doing? Okay, retrace a little bit. When I first give the RF pulse, I do something else. What do I do? Switch on slice selection gradient because I want to image a single slice, right? A tiny bit down the line, I switch on what? Phase encoding gradient. Why? Because I want every line to be at a different frequency, okay? When I want to collect the sample at time TE, what do I do? I switch the frequency encoding on, okay? So there are three gradients. The frequency encoding, what is that? That basically is segmenting it into longitudinal. So think of it like latitude and longitude. That's what I tell my trainees. Okay, so these are the, like the longitudes and those were the latitudes. So now you've got the whole slice selected into grids and you can look at one of them and say, oh, it's coming from, you know, A56, if you were to have them like that, okay? You don't, you have 256 by 256 or 512 by 512 or 1080 by whatever you've selected your field. But basically what I'm saying is you've got a full screen and you can tell exactly which point is where because you've got two things. Now, all this, where is this data going? The machine storing the data. I don't know much about it. I just look at the image. Y yes, you do. But how did it get the data? When the machine, remember this, and this is a very basic point that a lot of people don't understand. When I, at that point, at TE, if I have a voltmeter, that thing, the transverse magnetization, swings back to longitudinal, okay? Basic high school physics, Faraday's law. As magnetization changes direction, it introduces what? Electricity in the voltmeter. That's the signal. That's what we measure. That is MR. We do that. 2,500 times to get one slice or two slices or whatever, okay? But that is what is actually happening in the MR. So we flip the magnetization, we switch it off and watch as it falls. In the meantime, we switch on the phase encoding to get our longitude lines, uh, sorry, latitude lines, and then we get the frequency encoding when we are sampling. If there's no point in switching it on when you're not sampling because you'll mass mess everything up. So you now got the latitude lines and you write that data. Bear in mind, where did that data come from? It all came from that one slice. All you've got is one signal. It has got the information of which proton is in which part, but all you've got is that one signal. Are you following me? No matter what you do, even if I change this and change that, at point T, you get there's one signal that you're getting. It's coming from the whole slice. You might have put lots of different gradients on and things like on, and they're all in the proton, and protons remember that. But you are recording that one signal. So that is case space, basically. So you can manipulate whatever you want. You're not going to develop things that are not there, because the whole signal that you've recorded is coming from the whole sample. No matter what you manipulate, you cannot create pathology. The whole thing was coming. We can't see what an individual proton is doing anyway. We have to see a whole sample of proton. So that is why people will say we can manipulate with the case space, but it doesn't. Because initially when I first heard, I said, oh, we changed the case space data. Why isn't the image changing? It can't because case space is timeline data. 
We haven't done any mathematical analysis. It's just one signal. You can put up 256 gradients or 380 or 1 million gradients. At the end of the day, the signal you record is one. That's come from that slice. That's a zzz as it loses, OK? It has all the information, but the signal is one. Hence, we can change the case space. Now, back to where we started. If we, so case space, you remember of multiple lines. So it makes it simple that if you lie, if you write the first and the third and the sixth and the eighth instead of every case space, and by the way, how do we write every case space? We have to go back at TR and do the whole thing again. RF, this gradient, that gradient, T, signal. TR, again, go back. So we do this every time to write a single line of case space. That's why MR takes its time, okay? So if you have, in your field of view, 12 slices, if you go to the technician and say, can you extend it a little bit lower? I want a little bit more of the knee. They'll often say no. Why? Because to write that another extra case space, you'll have to do another 12 iteration. You can't just increase it by once because it's in your Q direction. Unless, I won't go into that, you switch your frequency and phase direction. During your frequency direction, you can get as many lines as you can because you do switching that on when you're collecting the signal. But for the phase, every time you change the phase. That's why the picture will have multiple lines in that. If you remember the pulse wave diagram, which you've probably all forgotten, it has multiple lines because every line you change it. That's your line the data. So what if I say, well, you can only write the fourth line, every fourth line, every third line, every second line. That's the concept of parallel imaging. You've heard of EPI, equiplanar imaging. Do you know what happens there? Sorry, I'm digressing. Equiplanar imaging is also fast, but as I said, all teaching is good teaching, so that's my principle. Um, Equiplanar imaging is what? You write every line of case space in one go. So they go zoom, all the thing done, okay? Echoplanar imaging means you're doing it all in what? All in one TR. You never repeated it. I said at every TR you repeat the line, right? So if you look at echoplanar imaging or if you do BFFE, what will be the image waiting? T1 or T2? It will always be T2. Fluid will always be bright because your TR is infinite. So it is extremely long. So you can only get fluid. So you can never get a T1 wave. Well, you can. There are ways machines can do it, but let's not go into that. For all intents and purposes, if you have a fluid sensitive you know, FFE sequence or an EPI, they are all, they all look. They're not all T2 weighted, but they all look T2 weighted. Fluid is bright. But anyway, so you can write the second, third space. Um, I think I've lost 10 minutes in that, but I'll come back to it. Uh, because it doesn't make any sense if everything, you don't understand anything. So that's why we can do whatever we want with the case space. And that's where the fun is in MR, for those who understand that bit. Um, so we can, so there are, if you write the second space only, so you're basically accelerating it by twice. If you write the third space, you've made the image three times faster. Now this, I'm talking about 2D imaging. What about 3D imaging? When you write this and that, there are two phase encoding direction. If you make a third line of this, and the second line of that or something. So you can permute it two times to become four times, three times can become six times. So that's how uh, the imaging uh, goes like that. So Caprina is one of the types of parallel imaging which we actually have in Warrington. We also combine it with a bit of deep learning and other things which we'll come to later. Um, and Caprina, this Caprina is just a terminology for this, controlled aliasing and parallel imaging provides higher acceleration, just you know, shortens to Caprina. It's not the Brazilian national cocktail, by the way, if you were thinking uh, that it's, it's, so it's just another way of uh, faster parallel imaging. There are some compre comprehensive 3D protocols, which we don't do, but there's, uh, certainly I have a friend in Singapore and they are doing this routinely, they call it five minute knee. So they can do T1 weighted, T2 weighted, PD weighted, fat suppressed, five sequences, the whole thing is done about eight minutes. So they can, that all, and they're all good quality images, okay? So they, when I say good quality, they have the same diagnostic information in them. What is compressed sensing under sampling? So if you look at an MR brain, for example, where, where is the image? The image is in the middle of the picture. If you look at the edges, all you've got is air and nothing, and sometimes you know clothing and things like that. So why do we have to get data from the air? So compressed sensing under sampling is a way of getting data only from the places where it's relevant. There's no point in writing case spaces of the air around the head. 
So the machine has a way of not, so it concentrates in sampling the data which is mostly contributory to the image, ignoring those bits which it doesn't contribute to your image. There's no point in writing 10 lines of air. You know, it's not going to add anything to your diagnostic information. So that's the principle of compressed sensing undersampling. So hence the undersampling. We are purposefully undersampling the data. We call sampling is writing the case space. It's called sampling, basically. Okay, so that, together with parallel imaging, will accelerate the image quite tremendously, eight times, six times. CMAC and Maverick, the names there on that slide, they're just other ways of enhancing the image uh, faster, and we'll see what happens with these. Oh, that brings us to our first case, an example. Okay, so this is a 69-year-old lady with the right THR, and we know metal artifact in THR and things. So this patient has had a traditional T, uh, two dimensional, 2D, PD weighted, TSA is turbo spin echo, and used a high receiver bandwidth and things to reduce metal artifact. Okay, so, but the second one is a CMAC, which is one of those accelerated sequences. Um, and the third one is a standard stir, I call it standard stir, and the last one is CMAC again. So notice, excuse me, notice how well defined the subchondral bone is on the CMAC compared to that. Okay, and also notice this subchondral cyst, you can't even see it on the normal. So with the CMAC, it allows you to see the subchondral bone. This is a big area of, um, you know, of advanced imaging in relation to metal artifact reduction. So that's just to show you an example of what it can do. So that was actually loosening of the t you know, right THR, which was not identifiable on anything else. And there was a bit of high signal on, oh, sorry, high activity on the bone scan, but it's been like that for the last one year. So we couldn't interpret whether it was new, but she was in pain. And there were no alvals or cystic lesions or anything around. Uh, so this, this is what uh, helps in that sort of situation. Multi-slice acquisition, I think your machine does it anyway. Okay, a lot of plies. So basically, instead of writing one line, you're writing line one of first slice, line two of the second slice, because remember, TR is much longer than TE. In between, you can pick and choose any other line, as long as, so what, there's a name for it. So you can't select adjacent slices. So you have to select, if you do, then there'll be slice crosstalk. So you pick a slice here, and pick the next slice a little bit further away, but you can get the first line of multiple slice all at once because otherwise you're sitting idle during one big TR. So that is multi-slice imaging, So which our machine does anyway. The advantage of a parallel imaging is that it has no signal to noise sort of loss. It is near neutral signal to noise. With parallel imaging, because we are writing less data, there will inherently be a bit more noise because the data is less. Okay, the image will be noisy. Um, so the disadvantage over this is because we are doing the RF pulse multiple times during one TR, do you know what SAR is, specific absorption rate? That's the amount of energy deposited on MR. So okay, we, we look at it particularly. We don't really look at it much unless we are uh, imaging somebody in their first trimester or something like that, because we don't want to, although that theory is going out of the window now, but we try to reduce our SAR um, during certain types of MR scans. Now, as I was saying, combining the multi-slice acquisition with parallel imaging will obviously then increase. So you're not only doing multiple slices at once, you're only writing the second line or the third line of the case space. So this is just maths. So it, it'll, it, you know, it'll, it'll significantly reduce your scanning time. So this is a 33-year-old uh, uh, man with knee pain. And this is just an example of um, multi-slice. This is a simultaneous combined SMS is multi-slice imaging and parallel imaging. It shows that the image quality is actually very good. Yeah, there is no loss or drop in image quality. These are, I'm not comparing with anything, I'm just showing you the images to show the cartilage. And these are, by the way, from multiple papers. We are not doing that level of research. I'll show you the ones that we are doing in a minute. But a lot of these are from multiple papers across the, across the globe, literally. And you can see the meniscal tear very nicely as well. This is just a PD-weighted image. These are our images, okay, just as a test. Do you know which one? <laughs> Do you know which one <laughs> is the actual T2 weighted image and the other is a T2 weighted but fast sequence? For this one, I'll show you. The scan on your left is the T2 weighted image which actually takes as long as it takes. The one on the right is a combined, so we used combined parallel and 
compressive sensitive undersampling. Okay? We also have a bit of a deep learning software in it which tells the image which bit not to sample. Okay, so there's a little bit of a deep learning element in it. So this image on your right is a three times, uh, if the left, I can't exactly remember, if the left one takes four minute, 20 seconds to acquire, the right one is acquired in one minute, 30 seconds or something like that, okay? So significantly, to me actually, <laughs> the faster one looks better. I don't know about you guys, it looks crisp and brighter to me. So these are some of the examples from our own. Any guesses, which one's the faster one? On the left, yeah, very good, actually. You're paying attention, that's good. So these are all our examples now. So this one uses deep learning more. The image on the right is faster. Um, those were ours. So I've used one from the deep learning because I just wanted to show our examples altogether. So they are visible, and obviously we got this 100,000 pound grant from Northwest Deanery to do this experiment. So we have two sessions every week for the last six months to do accelerated imaging, which I was supervising because obviously we have to look and see that you don't come out with a fuzz spot that you can't really diagnose. You've imaged the knee in two minutes, but it's completely non-diagnostic. So that shouldn't be the case. So for two months, well actually three, we did standard and the thing. That's where I got all these images from. Um, but obviously we now have stopped doing the standard. We only do the faster one because we can now, the scanner which was doing 20 knees in a day can do about 35 roughly. So most DL-based reconstruction are basically supervised model training. Again, I don't want to go into that because there's a lot of detail about how you train, but basically it's deep learning. Deep learning is when you train the computer to pick up an abnormality. How do you train it? By showing it one million normal or one million other cases. Once it's seen one million, it learns at every level. It's called a UNET network for those who are interested in it. Uh, it learns at every level. At a point, after you've trained it with one million, it'll tell you what, what is abnormal, what is normal. But it is limited by how you've trained it. So if you've never showed it something, it'll never pick that up. That's always a limitation. So AI, for those who think will surpass us, that won't happen. It'll come and it'll come to our aid. I wouldn't have to spend so much time picking up. It'll give me a printout of what is going on and I'll quickly check and make sure they're all correct and then I'll pick up something new that they haven't picked up or something like that, or I'll confirm. So that's how it'll work. Uh, for those who, because you know, my son is actually doing medicine fourth year, or he'll be fourth year in UCL in London, and he was saying there's no point in doing radiology because you know, by the time I do radiology, there won't be any need for radiology. So I said, don't pay that, I'm paying your salary. So there will be a need for radiology, shub shub bol, you know, as they say in Hindi. Um, so uh, basically, but that's not the case. So they don't understand it and there's a bit of scaremongering. So there's no need for scaremongering in it. It is there, it is there to help you. It's not there to replace you. It can replace the technicians and sonographers and reporting radio, it can't replace the doctors, okay? So that's the bottom line. So I'll show you some examples of deep learning base because I want to show you examples more and to show the real groundbreaking stuff that's happening around the world at the moment. So this is a 51 year old lady with anterior knee pain. And this is deep learning algorithm, okay? So the scan on your left is a conventional, um, you know, sort of uh, fast imaging, uh, two times faster. The middle one is about four times faster, but you can see that the image has dropped. It's more noisy. We are using parallel imaging and things. It's more grainy, not as crisp, but the one on your right is deep learning reconstruction based on a UNET sort of model. Um, based, um, so this is four times, but it maintains the signal resolution just like this two times faster. So you can actually scan four times, but not lose the image resolution. Same guy's counterpart, T2 fast, fat suppressed. Same uh, understanding again. Marrow edema, the ligament and the bone, and the general feel. Radiology is very aesthetic. If you don't like the image you look at, I've seen people look at dark rooms and MR images and ultrasound images. If you don't like the image, you will often miss things. So it has to aesthetically seal, feel nice as well. Hence, it is, hence the reason for looking at these. Next comes the super resolution MR. So we're talking in terms of, so this is investigational. So one of the things that we use is a DES sequence, uh, which is a double echo steady state, okay? Uh, so it's kind of almost like a double inversion rec recovery. It looks really crisp. It's like you've taken a picture on your iPhone or Google Pixel 9 or whatever, and then you go into image manipulation and put this, you know, the sharpness to maximum. 
your image will look really sharp and grainy and crisp and things, and that is what a desk looks like. For those who do any cardiac MR, you'll recognize desk because it's double inversion, unlike single inversion, is when we invert two things. So we invert not only water, we've also inverted blood and other things. You get a black blood sequence in cardiac imaging. That's a double inversion. With a single inversion, you invert fat, that stir. You invert the fat signal, you get a fluid sensitive sequence. If you double invert, you get the black blood of cardiac MR without going over. So it was there. So you can use these to do your chondral mapping as well. So they're equally good at this sort of thing. The next level advance is deep learning MR synthesis. What is this? Again, these are investigational approach. What do I mean? They are not mainstream practice at the moment. It's not mainstream MR. We are not doing it. I'm not aware of a regional center in the UK, but if you look at Japan, Korea, Germany, Switzerland, Sweden, and a lot of American places, they are doing it as an investigational approach. So basically, this is creating MR scans with a tissue contrast, for example, PDW, okay, from images acquired from different modality or different tissue contrast. So either you're creating an MR image from a CT or you're creating a PD weighted image from a T2 weighted image. So the data is there. Again, as I said, why is the manipulation possible? Because a signal that you recorded came from that slice, which has all the information in it. So you can do whatever manipulation if you're clever enough as a mathematician to work out the, okay, if it does this to the T2 time, what will it do to the other things? There is a mathematical way of working out the other. So that is MR synthesis. So you're synthesizing a PD weighted sequence from a T1 weighted sequence. Okay, so you don't need to do. So that, again, if you're doing faster imaging, plus that, you only need to do two. So that's with a five minute MR, you only do two, T2 weighted and T1 weighted, and you end up getting PD weighted, PD fat sat, T2 fat sat, everything from that. You can also do it from CT. So here's an example of, uh, sorry, go back to the discussion. So this is 23 year old man with a recent trauma to the knee. There is a downside to this, which you will see. So this is conventional, you know, uh, fast uh, acquisition space, uh, don't go into the terminology, these are ways of uh, making images faster. So it shows bone contusion, right, in the posterior aspect of the tibia. <laughs> this is a deep learning MR synthesis. So this MR is a synthetic MR. It never imaged the patient. It has just been reconstructed, this PD fat sat, from a T2 fat sat and a PD weighted image. Okay, you can see it doesn't look good. It, it, it doesn't. It's very pixelated, grainy and things, but it does show you the marrow edema, okay? So imagine what will happen in research in five years' time. You will, you know, it won't look as bad, okay? So that's another. Same patient, yes, it looks grainy and doesn't look nice, so I don't want to see it, I want that. That's what I'll tell my tech and the researcher, but they know that it carries the information. It's showing the information, so you can do an MR. So this is an example of where the MR has been created from CT. So this is a CT reference, and this is a T2-weighted, and this is a T2-weighted synthetic MR at a level showing the, uh, showing the images. Brings us to the ultra-high field, which is, again, well, actually, we've got FDA approval. FDA is in US and UK, uh, European, mm, whatever, society approval to do it in head and extremities. So we still can't use 70 for spine and other things. We can use it for head and finger. So if you notice in RSNA, there were a lot of presentations on finger and finger pulleys and all that you can see with things. But now that they can do 70, they found so many different things, even the surgeons don't know what to do with it because it's not been written about in any orthopedic or any textbook. You know, they're talking about multiple layers to each pulley. So, so, so that's the other problem. But anyway, so the main issue with a 70, it's great because if you, I won't go back to the physics again, but the higher the field strength, the more magnets, sorry, more protons you have in play, that's creating your signal. So your signal strength is stronger. You can play a little bit more, but the main problem of a stronger magnet is increased field homo inhomogeneity, okay? Increased chemical shift artifact, increased susceptibility, increased power deposition to the patient. Basically, all sorts of image, seven, sorry, image artifact, seven times more worse. So your image might be extremely sharp, as you will see in a minute. It's mainly used for cartilage imaging. It might be very sharp in things, but it's very dark. I have actually literally window these images on the screen even then they look dark to you, I think. If I hadn't manipulated it yesterday, it would have looked dark like the screen. 
they're very crisp and very nice, but there is so much chemical shift artifact that they look really dark. That's the downside. But obviously, the 70, again, I've played with the image, which is why it looks brighter. It was actually equally dark, if not darker, than the 3T. I had to manipulate, otherwise you wouldn't have seen it. But you can still see the sort of loss at the edges of the signal. So this is another area um, where we use um, ultra high field, as I said, cartilage imaging. So this is a CT of a patient showing microcalcs in CPPD, in the cartilage, chondrocalcinosis. So look at the DES image of this high seven Tesla. It, these tiny granules are calcium. So you can diagnose calcific, uh, sorry, chondrocalcinosis and CPPD based on these images. On the, this is a 70 MR. So what has taken off really, for those who read this sort of stuff, is the ultra low field. In places like India, and I know a lot of places in Nigeria, which, have, which are really, these are cheaper, very easy, you don't need a Faraday cage, a 0.25 Tesla, you can house it at the back of this room, you probably won't even know unless you've got a pacemaker. Uh, you know, it don't need, doesn't all these protections of, you know, lots of strong Faraday cage, it is much cheaper, much easier, um, much accessible, and much cheaper to run, okay? So that's where, don't like using the term third world countries or developing countries, but a lot of countries which has a big section of people who are poor, who can't pay, can't afford a very expensive can, this is like gold dust to them. And I'll show you some examples. This is a 63-year-old woman, and this is an MR spine done with a 0.5 Tesla, okay? The main problem previously was poor hardware poor gradient coil, poor reconstruction algorithm. Now we have refined them to that level that the images are not as grainy. They're not as bad if you're imaging the head and spine. Yes, you will struggle with finger pulleys and other things, but bog standard head and spine, this is the quality that you'll get. I'm happy with it, and I'm sure you will be as well. So this is point, so I'll show you what 0.25, this is down to 0.25, okay? Anyway, how, how uh, just, just remind me, what is one Tesla compared to the Earth's magnetic field? How strong is it? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so it is very strong. So we are still talking in terms of a very strong magnet, but significantly less strong. My regis always used to say, that, okay, sir, if there was no far Faraday cage, I've just parked my mark outside. Will it get pulled towards the magnet? I said, no, don't worry. <laughs> it won't get pulled towards the magnet. It's, they have a gauze uh, map. Have you ever seen an MR being installed? Yeah? If you haven't, uh, haven't seen an MR being installed, it's actually a brilliant experience when the first machine goes in and they set up the gauze map and they're creating the Faraday cage. It's, it's an amazing. And they're shimming because the first time they'll shim. Do you know what shimming is? For anybody who was in simple terms, in simplest terms, if you've ever got a wobbly table in a restaurant and you fold a piece of paper underneath to make it stable, that's shimming. So you did shimming without knowing you were doing the shimming. So that's what they do. They put bits of metal here and there and some in the body, some there, and there are different ways of shimming it. There are coils now which shim. So shim coils and things, and we switch them on. So that's basically different, you know, I'm just talking about uh, different advances in hardware which allows us to do these things. But this, going back to this 45-year-old, you're not going to like the images, but I'll tell you why. Uh, this is 45-year-old woman with wrist pain and inflammatory arthritis. And today's, uh, you know, so there is nobody to do musculoskeletal ultrasound in the department, okay? So we have done a low-field MR. So it is grainy, I'll give you that. But the, it is still in the investigational stage. Look at the synovitis and the high signal compared to the T1. Uh, uh, sorry, this is the 3T, and this is the 0.25. Of course, when you see the 3T, you can see the difference in signal increase. So this is the patient in the 3T. The signal increases from there to there on the fat-suppressed uh, sequence on a 3T scanner. But if you look at the 0.25, forget how grainy it is, this is still increasing. This is the signal on the first, and this is the post-contrast one. You can still see the increase in signal. So you can still diagnose the synovitis, and you can use it for mapping as well. The advantages I was talking about. Somebody was asking me yesterday, she's gone now, about MR neurography. 
so this is another field where there's a lot of technical advances, mostly to do with uniform fact suppression in large field of view. The main problem with large field of view is having you know, uh, uniform fact suppression. So these are examples of STIR, okay? This is a MIP image, by the way, okay? So it's a MIP like a CT. You can do a MIP with MR as well. This is a STIR. This is another SPARE, which is not a fluid inversion recovery. But notice there are still artifacts there. Compare that with a MIP Dixon water-only image, which is, which is obviously this patient has to be still, and there's other downsides to it, but they give you much, much crisper uh, to the point that you can see the cords and trunks of the brachial plexus and you can trace them uh, quite a long distance. Obviously, we are only diagnosing nerve-related uh, things here. You're not seeing the muscle. For muscle, you'll have to still do cross-sectional MRI. Brings to nearly towards the last bits of our MR, which is synthetic MR. So we've already looked at MR reconstruction of from a different, uh, what's called MR synthesis. This is true synthetic MR. So it generates morphological images, which means the image that we see with different tissue contrast, T1, T2, whatever you want, just from the tissue relaxation property. So we don't get to see the relaxation property unless you want to do, say for example, iron loading. Okay, you're looking at iron loading of the liver. And it, it'll do your R2 maps and things like that, and it'll tell you. So the machine does all that in the background before it creates the image. So we are saying that with synthetic MR, don't let the machine create the image. Stop at the point where it's got all that R2 data, relaxation data. Stop at that point, and then let the patient go. And then at its convenience, it'll create the MR image from that R2 data. We're not creating the image directly here. Okay, it sounds a bit confusing, but it basically, we don't get to see what happens before we see the image. There's a lot of steps with that signal collection, case space writing, and a lot of mathematical things until it becomes the image. We don't have to do all that. We can just get the data, get the signal, and don't create the image and let them go, and then mathematically reconstruct the image, which is what we're doing later anyway, but just from that relaxation data. The advantage is, because it's case-based data, we can manipulate it to do whatever we want. So I'll show you some examples. So this is a synthetic MR performed before and after exercise. I think this journal is, this is from somewhere in, uh, this is somewhere in Japan. Uh, so anyway, uh, so this is pre and post exercise. So it shows the ECRB, ECRL go, go getting edema 10 minutes post exercise and it shows the higher signal on the T2 map. So this was all the data that we acquired and we reconstructed the image from that. When I say we, not we, whoever presented that paper did. I'd love to be able to do these, but we're not at that level as yet. So this is a 51 year old patient with knee pain. It shows a little cartilage defect where that arrow is and the top is the reference real MRI that was done, and the bottom is a synthetic MR, which was just created from the relaxation data. This is a T2 map, which would have been created from the data anyway. That is where the map comes from, but we have created the image from that as well, okay? This is another patient, so it has gone to the level that we are actually creating images that look like an enhanced image so the top one is a T1 post-contrast image. The same patient has been imaged with a double inversion recovery synthetic MR where it shows the high signal of the inflammation of the synovium which matches. Maybe it is not as nodular enhancement as the T1 post-GAD. There will be some data loss, but it is sufficient to help us diagnose that there is active synovitis in this. And we never mr would this patient, never in the sense we talk about now. We just put him somewhere, got the data, and let him go. Uh, just got the relaxation data, okay? So then comes the advanced 3D MR representation. This is another fascinating, and the last bit of the MR segment. So this is a 53-year-old with lateral ankle pain. So this is magic angle, high signal, which is a problem with a lot of tendons, because annoyingly, all the tendons bend around somewhere or the other, okay? So this is a curved planar 3D reformat of an MR showing that same tendon with no loss of signal, no magic angle thrown out of the window, no question. It's a 3D. So these are all volumetric uh, you know, uh, imaging 
where you're creating a 3D data set and then manipulating. This is a 46-year-old with a schwannoma behind the knee. This is cinematic rendering. This is 3D volume reconstruction, like a CT. This has been done from the MR. So this is volume rendering, okay? It'll show you where the sarcoma is. So you don't need to look at my scan. You'll remember your Anakin 2B, 2A compartment, whatever. So you can do your 3D uh, from that, and you'll be give, giving the surgeon a 3D diagram. The next bit will come when you can actually do 3D printing of that, and you'll go to the surgeon with, this is what your tumor should look like. Get yours out and match. So, oh, it doesn't match. I've left a little bit behind. I'm joking. It won't happen. But that's how 3D printing is going as well. You'll be able to go. People print out hearts, don't they? In RSNA, they came. I've got actually a printed out heart in my office in Warrington. I could have brought it with me. It's a printed out 3D heart. It's 3D printing. It takes two days to print. And it's very, it's not actually not that expensive to buy. Not in the UK, at least, certainly. Uh, but it, the problem is time and policing. So you can't just go and print a pistol. You know, so some, some places, if in Central America, they'll say, ah, I can do a Tommy gun. <laughs> I'll take one week to print, but <laughs> I'll start my production. No, it doesn't happen like that. So there are quite a lot of limitations. Uh, you'll get the SAF and people paratrooping, landing in your house as soon as they pick up that the picture of a Tommy gun has been uploaded into the 3D printer. I wouldn't talk too much about CT. You probably know more about CT than I do, but a couple of things beg mentioning. I did mention dual energy CT, but even dual energy CT is going out, isn't it? It's spectral CT now, which is, which is spectral resolving CT rather than just two energy. If you get a proper crystal semiconductor instead of our usual solid state detectors, we will get, you'll be able to resolve every, you know, different levels of uh, energy coming from the scan. I'll just show you the scans because I just want to show you the, um, what I'll be looking at rather than going into the physics of it. You can read the physics if it interests you from the point of view. So this is an 83-year-old uh, with progressive difficulty in walking. So we have, uh, uh, in our regional uh, center, we have a, uh, what is called a dual CT, uh, dual energy CT scanner. So this is an 83-year-old. With dual energy, with multiple energy, you can subtract elements with specific atomic number, isn't it? Be it calcium subtraction, which is what we have done. So that is how we have got rid of the bone. It's nothing else. It's no magic. We're not, it's not a DSA that you put one image against another image and you get the subtraction. This is just mathematically atomic number, so and so, they are disappearing from your system. So all the calcium. You can do the same with iodine. That's how you get iodine only, water only. Also, you're basically feeding what atomic number you want. It's all to do with atomic number. But anyway, if you remove the bone, you can see this sort of an image, which shows this green bit in the greater trochanter, which matches with the marrow edema done in the MRI. So it's marrow imaging. It's basically a water-only image. It was showing the water. So for those places who can't do, like us in Warrington, we can't do an acute MR for all neck or femur patients. They come with your leg bent and they lie crooked. They can't go into the MR scanner. So we do CTs all the time. It's immense when you can do water-only CT images and see marrow edema. You can tell with confidence that there is actually a fracture there. And then you can do other things, but we don't have MR. So that's where this comes in really, really handy. Of course, you can get virtual monochromatic beams. And with that monochromatic beam, I don't want to bore you with the physics. What you can do is two things. One is significant reduction of um, metal artifact kind of thing, and the other is collagen mapping. Again, collagen mapping is based on the atomic number of collagen and the tissues and things. But you can get CTs like that, which will collagen map and tell you where the nucleus pulposus and the annulus fibrosus is, and you can detect a disc bulge and things. You can go a step further. This is a paper from, I think, Sweden or, or Germany, somewhere. So this is uh, somebody's heel. And only in UK, we turn the image the other way around. If I read at the ankle, the actual Achilles tendon is bottom line. So it spins my head to actually look at the Achilles tendon at the top of the image. But that is the Achilles tendon, if you were looking at for it here. So they image the patient um, prone. Um, this is the Achilles tendon. This is a collagen map telling you which areas are dark and there is loss of collagen. So a bit like elastography, as we are saying. So it's telling you which part has got mucoid degeneration before the mucoid degeneration is developed. Um, going on to, on a similar line is photon counting CT. Again, I wouldn't, I'll spare you the physics. 
it shows, so this is the same lesion which shows in a much more crisp way on a photon counting CT uh, because it's energy resolving rather than the normal energy integrated system. Energy resolving means it can actually count the energy of every photon that hits it. In case of energy um, uh, integrating detectors, which we normally have on our CT scanner, it will detect the energy of the whole beam and create the image. With a photon counting, it can actually detect the energy of every photon. And hence, you can have such crisp images because you can filter out. So you can tell it, don't count photons which are below 40 because you know they are noise. Hence, the image is sharp. Why is the image sharp? You know, how, what have we done to make it sharp? That's the reason. We can tell it only count between 80 to 100, and it'll count that sort of thing. That's how we refine the image. Previously, we got the image because we couldn't count every photon. We knew it had 40 to 120, but our detector corrected the whole thing and gave us the whole thing. Now with a photon counting, if we keep it simple, we tell him, okay, guys, don't look at anything below 60. Don't look at anything above 120. Give me the rest and I'll create the data. Hence, such a nice, crisp image with no noise. That is the basic principle why photon counting CT is better. So obviously, because of that, this is a photon counting. This is a conventional energy integrated detector system. And this is an energy resolving detector, the actual terminology, if you want the physics. So it integrated energy of the whole beam, whereas here it resolves the energy of every photon. So you can see the uh, lo lack of beam hardening artifact and thing on the photon counting CT. Uh, hardly any artifact around that screw, anything. Obviously, if this is Central America, it won't be a screw, it'll be a bullet. But uh, even then, you can you know, image that bullet uh, very nicely. And same with the myeloma lesion, which is much crisp um, when you do uh, it that way. The last bit of the CT is synthetic CT, just like synthetic MR. When I first saw this, it was jaw-dropping. And this was presented in the 2018 BSSR by a German um, group who came, who were invited speakers there. They were the ones who were doing that research. So it is actually different hearing from the people who are actually doing the research. So here, we create CT from the MR. You don't ever, no need for radiation. Nobody needs to get scanned. You don't need to bring the patient back for a CT, okay? So there are various echo techniques of creating CT image. I won't go into it. You can read that up if you want. Basically, the image, it is called an ultra short echo time or a zero echo time MR. That's what they call it. I'll show you some imaging example. So this is a zero time MRI on the left of your picture. This is a correction algorithm that the machine does, and this is the synthetic CT output. When you look at that CT, you can't tell that that's been created from an MR. It looks like a CT. The only downside is whatever the MR doesn't see, the CT won't see either because you've created the CT from the MR, okay? But you don't bring them back. So this is a conventional CT, and this is the same patient's simulated CT, we call it, from a zero-time echo MRI. Okay, so you can do all your angle and glenoid retroversion and all the different things that Dr. Ganguly taught me, which I've forgotten. I can do all of that from that, you know, zero echo time CT. You can do 3D volume rendering from that because you've got the data. Okay, so this is actually, this is not from a CT. This is from the synthetic CT, which we created from the MR, but it looks like a CT. And we can see the little anchor holes for the bank card repair as well, okay? So this is the traditional T1, this is the traditional T2, and this is zero echo time CT. You can see the calcium which was hidden, okay? The main one problem with MR, which you have picked up already probably, calcium, very hard structure, fibrous, soft structure. They're both extremely dark on MR. So that's where the zero echo time comes in because now you can differentiate, and this is the, uh, this is the Achilles tendon. So it can actually show you the tissues as well as the calcium, because you've done it in zero echo time. I wouldn't go into the detail. This is a stress fracture on a synthetic CT. This is the actual CT, but you can do the synthetic CT from the MR, and you don't need to bring them back to diagnose, okay? This is equivalent. This is somebody, conventional CT and MRI. This is a synthetic CT made from the MRI, and it shows the erosions even better than the original CT. Okay, this is sacroiliitis. 
The last section is on ultrasound, and obviously lots of different technology, as we have seen here as well, single crystal, as uh, they were saying, you know, single crystal, better visualization and penetration, right up to 50 centimeters. Um, matrix resolution, so it gives you a uniform beam at a certain depth throughout. It's all uniform, autofocus, as they'll call it. And ultra-wide, I really like the ultra-wide transducers. You can look at the whole supraspinatus tendon in one sweep from supraspinatus to infraspinatus, front to back. So here's just some of the examples of a uniform beam. So I've not, th these are um, from my Canon rep. So she has used images of the testes liver with the hemangioma at the back. And uh, you know, so just to show you the wide uh, coverage of the views of the lesion. Then there comes AI, assisted imaging, which is what I was asking them whether they have it. So you find part of the vessel, and it's not that the transducer disappears from her hand and starts walking around on itself. It'll trace out the rest of the vessel, okay, for you. So automatic vessel recognition comes in really handy, not for MSK, but really handy for people who do echo and obstetrics, because it'll find the correct plane. So no worrying about getting the correct abdominal circumference or the femur length and things. You know what to find. You don't have to spend time. The machine will do it. The AI software will do it for you. So you can do obstetric scanning in a tenth of the time that it takes you because the patient's moving around and you can't find the abdominal circumference or whatever. So that's where it comes in. Ultra high resolution, they're actually, they won't believe it yesterday when I told them, there are actually transducers which go up to 70 megahertz you can see the skin, you can see layers of the skin and things. We don't use them, 50 to 100 micrometer is the resolution. That's how small a thing you can see with MRI. And obviously with harmonic compounding, which I've talked about a little bit uh, in the actual, um, in, in the souvenir. They combine the high frequency resolution with increased depth, because remember medical, you know, basic uh, teaching, higher resolution, lesser penetration, great quality images, but I can't see anything. So you need to reduce the depth, uh, sorry, if you, if you want to increase the depth, you need to reduce the frequency, which is why the abdominal transducers are three. So obviously with harmonic compounding, you can get both in one. This is just an example of the nerve. Um, so the top images are with the 24 hertz megahertz, and the bottom images are the carpal tunnel and the nerve with a 48 megahertz transducer, okay? Some of these, again, as I said, are from my Canon reps, so I, I, they, we don't have them. We have a 28, 27, or 28, something like that. So these are, these are pulleys. You can actually differentiate the superficial and profundus tendon, okay? And this is the A1 pulley, because it's at the level of the MCPJ. This is the pulley in cross-section. This is actually an image from somebody with a 70 megahertz transducer. You can see th how thick the pulley looks. And the other, Main advantage is what is called SMI. So Canon quite idiotically calls it SMI. SMI stands for superb microvascular imaging. They couldn't come up with a better clever name, so that's what they call it. Essentially, it's a level above power Doppler, okay? So for those who don't understand it, power Doppler can't pick up microvascular flow. Power Doppler is not direction sensitive, so it's direction neutral is the word. So it doesn't have to go this way, it'll pick up flow. As long as there's some flow, it'll flow. But it will not pick up microvascular flow. Why? Because, uh, I think I might go into that in a little bit later, it has a suppression software in the machine so that it doesn't pick up my movement and the patient's movement and a few other things. So it will still show some, but it has got some suppression software. Because of that suppression software, it cannot pick up microvascular imaging or microvascular flow. Okay, so that's where the SMI comes in. It's a really ultra high rate, almost motion freezing. So if the patient is moving their hand, you can still scan, you can still see the flow with now with SMI. And the image flashes if you've ever seen SMI. So we've got SMI in one of our scanner. It flashes from image to image, okay? Um, so this is an example of Achilles tendinopathy showing microvascularity. They're often blue and purple in uh, our scanner as well. Um, it shows microvascular in the median nerve. Supposedly, it shows it before the nerve gets thickened. This is an area of ongoing research at the moment. And the last segment is elastography, which we looked at today. So traditionally, strain elastography, push and push and release, or you press and release and things and shear wave. Now, you can 
just press a button and the machine will send a shear wave through the tendon along its length. And like we did with Dr. Kareem's tendon or Professor Kareem's tendon, it'll tell you which part is red, green, blue. So that, what is it actually doing? It tells us, so this is a 42-year-old lady uh, with uh, aculodynia or pain in the Achilles, just a fancy name for it. So this is the tendon. Of course, it shows normal areas of tendon with normal um, uh, appearance of signal. Okay, blue is less stiff, so more norm, you know, sort of, um, yeah, so, uh, sorry, go back. So blue is the stiffer bit uh, of the tendon, which is a normal tendon fiber. Um, and here is a red bit, which is the degeneration. Okay, so there are bits here. So it'll tell you, as we were seeing in Dr. Karim's case, it'll show you areas of red, which is softer and getting loss of triple helix and collagen mucoid degeneration before you actually see structural change. So that's, that's the sort of horizon touching upon a little bit of what is there in future. Some of it um, is just uh, jaw dropping to see what is happening. Some of it I'll never be able to do, but it's actually good to know that that's the kind of work that's going on. And some of it, obviously, we can use it. We are using fast imaging, and we are already using a bit of deep learning, and I'm sure there are other things that we'll need. Some of it you already use. How many of you do CT colons? Reporting CT colon. You guys all use, do you use CAD, the computer-assisted detection? Oh, we do, routinely. We've been using it for the last 10 years. So the problem is, it is not clever. It's, it, so where it comes in handy, it is, this is AI. AI as we have it. Where the CAD comes in handy is when I can't find anything. It'll find a tiny thing and I'll look at it and I'll see, oh, okay, is this a polyp or is this poo? And I think, oh, this is poo. So I dismiss it. If I can, so, but it's not geared to pick up cancer. So you still need a radiologist to look at it and pick the cancer. It is purely to for polyp dissection. But that is one basic level AI. And we do AI at all other levels even without realizing. So it is there. And uh, actually, I finished five minutes before time. It's 55. Uh, so uh, 55 minutes on this thing. So that's any questions. It's just a whistle-stop tour, as we call it, because I can't go into detail about any of them. But by all means, as I said, I can leave a lot of these references and things, and you can read at your own time. But the first things first, for those who are taking the exam, get through your exam. Those who are at a le lower level, get to the level so that you're taking your exam and they take your exam and things, and these things will come. But questions? I have a question. Hello. You are working on higher uh, Tesla MRI, like three Tesla, five, seven, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. So did you, did you work uh, on the side effects of MRI on human body? Uh, no, we didn't. Uh, there's a lot of work already there, and it doesn't really prove much uh, to the point that now MR is deemed to be safe even in um, pregnant first trimester uh, patients. We're using it, and obviously SAR is one of the areas that we look at. At the moment, even then, we don't put a pregnant lady through the 3T scanner. We'll still do a 1.5T scan on them if we need to. Just Two days before I flew, there was a query acute appendicitis, and we had to do an MR uh, on somebody because they can't wait till the baby is delivered. You know, obviously they don't know what is going on. Um, so we did uh, it on a 1.5 T, but we limit what we do uh, scan. So again, we control our scanners, but uh, no, we don't do any work on the side effects. We just go by the literature. And Particularly as I said, because we are now concentrating on fetal MRI also, an early trimester MRI. Yeah. Those things are actually, um, there are uh, cases where they send us, at least ask us what, what should be done. Yeah. And these cases, in, th in these cases, it is very important to know the side effects. Very, very. So obviously because we don't do any fetal imaging at all. So because UK work as regional center, so all our fetal MRI is done in the local sort of women's hospital, as we call it, which is in Liverpool, which is a local center for all gynae, so all obstetric cases, and the pediatric uh, Alder Hay. Alder Hay is, after Great Ormond Street, London, it's the second biggest pediatric hospital in Europe. So it, they have a massive department and massive MR. So they look after, they take all our patients, and you know, thankfully, and they are interested, they have regis who do this all the time, so we don't get involved at all. You have uh, not mentioned about portable MRI. Uh, so low field, 
yeah, comes with no portable, portable MRI. MRI. There so has been research in that field. There is. So as I was saying, one of my friend who's a Nigerian who was telling me there's somebody who goes around on his van with a 0.25 Tesla doing spines and heads and things like that. He's apparently a, a clinician. He's not even a radiologist. He says, I'm going to invest on an AI software. I know where it hurts. I'm going to use that AI software on my van. No, I have a I student. I have a student in Berkeley University, actually. Okay. And she is working on that field, and she was uh, she last year and saying that they are in the process of developing a portable MRI. Yeah. So it it will be there, but obviously with low field, the main reason why the downside will be the gradients and the coils and things like that because if you've got a portable you can't have a very expensive unless the technology gets to that level okay in the old days we wouldn't even know about nano chips and things like that so once you get to that level and technology yes they might be at the moment the main limitation is the bigger the MR machine and things, you, the, why is MR so expensive? It's because of the expensive gradient coils. The better your gradient coils, the faster your imaging and faster everything else, okay? So with portable MRI, you can't have those things. So that means you're limited to extremity scanning, mostly, okay? You can extend it a bit more, but the quality drops until more research uh, makes the technique better. But yes, there are portable MRIs. Um, and certainly in other countries, I know they are using it in Africa for sure. I mean, they might be using it in India as well, uh, in some parts, I don't know. Okay, do we use uh, uh, small foot transducers in MSK imaging? For, small, for small ultrasound? Foot, uh, MSK, small foot transducers. We use, so w when you say, so we, s we use something called a hockey stick. Uh, so, because it looks like a hockey, it's not the in, you know, Indian style hockey, it's ice hockey. Uh, so it looks more like a Canadian ice hockey stick. I do use it, and we have one, but we now have a flat transducer, which is 28 megahertz, as I was saying, with matrix resolution, which actually performs better than my 20 hertz um, hockey stick. So we hardly use the hockey stick unless we are looking at small areas. But even as I say, now with matrix resolution, I can get a picture of the whole finger with that. So my use has reduced. And when I'm injecting that pulley, the hockey stick gets in the way. So I end up using the other transducer anyway. But yes, you can use it. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you. <laughs> for a wide horizon of uh, newer imaging techniques. Uh, now we are coming to the uh, concluding session of this conference. There is a open house for PGs for oral paper and poster presentation. I would ask, request uh, Professor Yaul Korim and Dr. Bhapna Prashad to chair the session. So now, Dr. I request Dr. Sibangi uh, to eight plus two minutes, eight minutes presentation on your topic and two minutes for question answer.
अच्छा वेर आर द सर्टिफिकेट्स प्लीज सेंड द सर्टिफिकेट्स यार बोलो दीचे ठीक है दे रहा हूँ इनका सर्टिफिकेट दो डॉक्टर उमाकांत द्विवेदी एक सर्टिफिकेट दे रहा हूँ सारा सर एक मिनट Okay, Dr. Umakanthu Diwede is leaving, uh, so we are handing over his certificate and memento. Good evening to everyone present here. Today I'll be discussing about a, a patient of uh, Mazabrot syndrome. So uh, Mazabrot syndrome is a, a rare benign disorder characterized by the association of single or multiple intramuscular uh, myxomas uh, with fibrous dysplasia. The fibrous dysplasia can develop in a single bone, which would be uh, monoostrotic or multiple bones, polyostrotic. The soft uh, tissue myxomas are <laughs> benign mesenchymal tumors and uh, fibrous dysplasia are benign uh, intramedullary uh, uh, fibro-osseous lesions. So uh, we have a, a patient, a 14-year-old female, who came to the orthopedics OPD with a chief complaint of pain in the right lower limb associated with difficulty in walking. On clinical examination, a palpable swelling was noted around the right hip joint. Uh, she was then sent to our department for further investigations. Imaging findings, uh, the X-ray of pelvis for the patient demonstrated radiolucency with ground glass matrix appearance involving sacrum, proximal femur, and bilateral hip bones. Uh, while on ultrasound, the right gluteal region showed an irregular, heterogeneously hypoechoic soft tissue lesion with no internal vascularity. On CT, there was osseous expansion with ground glass appearance involving sacrum, proximal femur, and bilateral hip bones suggestive of fibrous dysplasia. A well-demarcated hyperdense ovoid lesion was noted involving right gluteal, adductor, hamstrings, uh, vastus uh, muscles of the proximal third of right thigh. <coughs> this is an axial uh, CT section image of, uh, in bone window demonstrating ground glass appearance of sacrum and bilateral hip bones. On further imaging, uh, MRI, there was evidence of large, irregular, heterogeneous intramuscular mass lesions showing multiple internal cystic areas and T1, T2 iso-intense to hypo-intense solid areas showing restricted diffusion involving the proximal third of right thigh without any invasion of adjacent bone. The visualized part of bony pelvis uh, showed heterogeneous lytic sclerotic areas with ground glass opacities. So uh, these are two images. The first one is a coronal T2 image. The second one is a axial uh, T1 image showing a large irregular heterogeneous intramuscular mass lesion with multiple internal cystic areas involving the muscles of the right proximal thigh. This is a uh, image uh, of uh, DWI and uh, corresponding ADC mapping where the lesion shows heterogeneous areas of restricted diffusion. On a post-contrast T1 image, uh, there's heterogeneous enhancement in the lesion. 
Uh, biopsy was done from the intramuscular lesion, which uh, revealed a relatively hypocellular picture with a mixoid matrix and uh, loose reticular fibers, and the cells having a stellate-shaped uh, small hypochromatic pycnotic nuclei and scant uh, cytoplasm, which are consistent with uh, intramuscular myxoma. Coming to the discussion part, uh, Mazabroth syndrome defines the association of bony fibrous dysplasia and intramuscular myxoma. Uh, the prevalence is approximately one in 10 lakh population with a female preponderance. Uh, fibrous uh, dysplasia is defined as the transformation of normal bone and bone marrow towards an abnormal fibrous tissue. The lesions are generally polyostotic with pelvis and femur as first locations. Intramuscular myxoma are benign mesenchymal neoplasms consisting of undifferentiated spindle cells, myxoid stroma, and collagen fibers. The pathology, uh, the etiology is unknown, but the pathology is caused by inactivating mutations of the GNAS1 gene uh, that induces aberrant cell proliferation at different stages of cellular maturation. So uh, we need to be aware of Mazabroth syndrome as an association of fibrous dysplasia and soft tissue myx uh, myxomas in order to secure appropriate management of the patient and most uh, importantly to prevent misdiagnosis of this benign syndrome as a malignant condition. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Subhangi. Uh, who is the second? Amit, sir. मेरे एक ही थे मतलब चेक करने के गुड आफ्टरनून एवरीवन Today, uh, I am going to present a case of isolated myosis cosis, the patient with uh, neck swelling. Please present the, uh, that case, both of you. Uh, 
good evening, my respected uh, professors, uh, seniors, and colleagues. Uh, this is a very surprise presentation, but let's go. <laughs> uh, so here I'm, uh, here I'm going to present a case of uh, shepherd's crook deformity in a 14-year-old patient. Uh, a 14-year-old boy presented to our college with pain in his left leg, and on examination, he had an antalgic gait with flexion deformity. Uh, on imaging, we had uh, the following features. When we took an X-ray for the patient, uh, the in the right femur. You do one thing because you don't have an image. You just uh, so we can get you, the poster you from outside. You discuss the points. How you arrive at the diagnosis? Okay, sir. You tell us the teaching points on. Yes. Sir. Uh, so, so in. Uh, our case, the patient presented, we took multiple Im uh, modalities, we used multiple modalities to uh, examine the patient. We took X-ray, CT and the MRI. On X-ray, we noticed that the patient had a fracture in his uh, left femur and it was a linear fracture at the junction of upper one-third and middle one-third of the shaft of, and uh, uh, there was a distraction of the lateral cortex with posterior medial displacement of the distal fragment. Uh, there were multifocal areas of mild lytic and sclerotic changes noted in the bone matrix. And in the right femur, there was the typical uh, shepherd's uh, crook deformity noted at the proximal shaft. And uh, in the neck of the femur, we also noticed a displaced, unhealed old fracture. So uh, along with that, there was asymmetric cortical thinning along with endosteal scalloping in the bone matrix. Uh, on CT and MRI, in addition to the plain radiograph findings, we found uh, that the visualized pelvis had multifocal areas of lytic changes and mosaic distribution of uh, random patches of ground glassing. Uh, the lytic areas are filled with uh, lesions that are T2 hyper intense and T1 hypo intense. Uh, in the right and the left femur, uh, similarly the fracture we noticed and there was a loser zone and endosteal scalloping at the site of the lesion. Uh, in the proximal shaft, there was the coxavara deformity as we described in the x-ray. Uh, in the left femur, there was coarse trabeculations and mild expansile lesions uh, noted in the proximal shaft. And uh, there was, again, the mild uh, lytic sclerotic changes in the bone matrix. Uh, we noticed a thomas splint around the limb because there was, of course, a fracture in the shaft. Uh, so uh, according to these findings, we can uh, reach up to four diagnoses that we can uh, shortlist. The first one we thought was monoosseous uh, fibrous dysplasia. Uh, the Shepherd's Cook deformity uh, it points towards that diagnosis uh, because it is a pathognomic feature. And along with that, uh, we had expansile sclerotic lesions and loser zones with endosteal scalloping. Uh, there were mild, uh, the second uh, diagnosis that we arrived at could have been osteogenesis imperfecta in view of the uh, multiple fractures that we noted uh, because there was a, a very uh, obvious fracture in the left femur and on the right uh, neck of femur we had an old unhealed fracture and along with that we had uh, multiple areas of uh, uh, because of the ground glassing effect it, they could have been uh, and the loser zones yeah. because they could have been uh, old unhealed fractures which were uh, very obvious when we saw them uh, these uh, and they were like uh, limb length discrepancies and weight bearing uh, bones had the were the ones that were involved so uh, that could lead to osteogenesis imperfecta another uh, diagnosis could have been paget's disease because similar sclerotic lytic lesions are noted in paget's uh, along with that vermian bones in the skull uh, uh, support the diagnosis for that we need a ct or x-ray skull which we could not get because the patient was lost to follow up uh, another diagnosis that we can arrive at could be hypophosphatasia. So because of your case or you, uh, that conflict of interest, I want to know. No, no, sir. This was a case that was here. The patient came. We. This was your case, no? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, thank you. So, Acha, tumara, tumara case tum present karna chahte ho? Kar do. Nee, nee, kar do. Koi, koi. Bada hai, sir. Bada. Huh? Both bad. That's okay. So who was the third that we declared? Jeevan, Aja. No confusion. Both of you st uh, stood second. Okay. I remember the case. I saw your name. So I forgot. I'm a
ফোন করব আমার কনফারেন্স হচ্ছে দুদিন আজকে শেষ আজকে শেষ হলে ফোন করব হ্যাঁ 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 শিওর একদম একদম এসার আগে করব preparation um, uh, if you do not if you if you do not uh, answer properly or you fail to answer that is not a discredit okay but credit will be given if you are able to you know this always happens during the pg period this is a good exercise um, in future also if you are interested in your first year that will be helpful so please don't leave F final year must stay others if they uh, do not want we don't have any problem and after this uh, one anesthesia who is from anesthesia who wants to present you want to present which case oh uh, block okay theek hai baith jao ho jayega Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, here I am going to present a case uh, by my senior, Dr. Jeevan Jay. He is not here currently, but I'll be presenting it. It's a rare case of Mason's tumor of the neck. Diagnosis and correlation between the CT, MRI, sonographic features of intravascular papillary, endothelial hy hyperplasia. Uh, the objectives of this uh, presentation is to present imaging findings in a case of intravascular papillary endothelial hyperplasia and to discuss the differential diagnosis of Mason's tumor. Uh, Pierre Mason first described it in 1923, uh, hemangioendothelium vegetant intervascular as a reactive or neoplastic tumor with intravascular papillary endothelial components as a benign entity. It has been described, uh, rarely described in radiology literature. Imaging features have not been elaborately uh, characterized or specifically described for the entity. The most common presentation of uh, IPEH is a slow-growing palpable mass, often with purple discoloration of the overlying skin. The lesion may be painful or tender. So uh, here we have a case of a 28-year-old male with long-standing slow-growing swelling in the neck, anterior to the right sternocleidomastoid muscle since six years. Uh, there was history of paroxysmal enlargement and reduction in size with no significant association to any sort of treatment. Um, on imaging, uh, MRI shows a hypo-intense lesion on T1 sequence and heterogeneously hyper-intense lesion on T2 with blooming foci on SWI and restricted diffusion in dependent parts of the lesion. On post-contrast study, the lesion showed heterogeneous predominantly peripheral enhancement. Uh, on CT, the lesion showed subtle hyperattenuation compared to the adjacent muscles, average CT attenuation being plus 59 HU, possibly suggestive of hemorrhage. 
on ultrasound uh, revealed a hypoechoic mass devoid of internal vascularity. Excision biopsy and microscopy revealed proliferation of papillary endothelial structures with fibrin cores. Uh, the lesions are predominantly circumscribed, presenting with a pseudo capsule and with residual smooth muscle of pre existing vessel. Degenerative changes, including necrosis and thrombosis, are present. Uh, intravascular papillary endothelial hypoplasia is a rare benign vascular lesion that typically arises within the lumen of small to medium sized blood vessels. The lesion is characterized by the proliferation of papillary endothelial cells which form a mass within the vessel lumen without extension to the perivascular tissue. The lesion is most commonly found in the skin, subcutaneous tissue and oral cavity. Uh, the presentation of this tumor as a lateral neck mass is very rare. On conclusion, due to its clinical and radiological presentation, Mason's tumor is often mistaken for a malignant disease and the histological analysis only is confirmatory. Radiological evaluation is useful in surgical planning. Treatment of IPEH is a complete surgical excision which yields the best outcome. The prognosis for IPEH is generally good as the lesion is benign and typically does not spread to other parts of the body. However, in rare cases, the lesion may recur after treatment. Uh, uh, the following authors, Hashimoto at, uh, and the rest, have uh, addressed the recurrence rate, uh, showing recurrence in 7 out of 71 patients over follow-up periods from 7 months to 20 years. These are the references. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, who wants to present, please come. Uh, respected faculty, uh, delegates, and my dear friends, uh, I am Dr. Pushpinder Singh from Department of Anesthesia of Mata Gujri Medi uh, Medical College. I am here to present uh, a, a paper on the topic, a comparative study between landmark versus USG guided tab block for post-op analgesia undergoing uh, for patients undergoing uh, abdominal surgeries. So the transverse abdominis plane, a tab block, which we commonly refer to as, has become one of the most common truncal blocks performed for post-operative analgesia after abdominal surgeries. Tab blocks are a part of multimodal pain management for abdominal surgeries, which add analgesic benefits to the patient, reducing the post-operative -op uh, opioid requirements. Tab block can be performed for post-operative analgesia management in various abdominal sur surgeries, as well as inpatient and outpatient surgical procedures. Unilateral left or right blocks are used for unilateral surgical procedures such as cholecystectomy, appendicectomy, nephrectomy, or renal transplants, uh, while the bilateral tab blocks are used for midline and transverse uh, abdominal incisions such as umbilical or ventri uh, ventricle hernial repairs, uh, C sections, hysterectomies, or prostrectomies. Tab blocks are usually placed intraoperatively either before surgical incision or the end of the procedure before emergence from anesthesia. The Efficacy of tap block is dependent on the uh, spread of local anesthetic across the interfacial planes. Uh, these, uh, the block is usually given uh, ultra by ultrasound guided uh, uh, by ultrasound. Ultrasound guided block implicates the injection of local anesthetic between the transverse abdominis and internal oblique muscles. Uh, these, uh, this uh, tap block can also be given by landmark guided by the uh, triangle of fetid. This interfacial plane contains intercostal, subcostal, iliohypogastric, and ilioinguinal nerves. Uh, this is a relative uh, clinical anatomy. Uh, uh, this, uh, the sensitive innervation, uh, innervation of the anterior lateral abdominal walls Let's result. Give the anatomy. Okay, Technic part, the how? Okay, sir. So this is a study. Nee, this is also you skip okay, this. Sir. So as the technique. Yeah. 
so this is a uh, tab block using landmark uh, landmark guided techniques so the landmarks are boning prominences are subcostal margin iliac uh, uh, the anterior superior lie crest you you make a point 0.5 uh, cm above the uh, anterior superior lie spine and 5 cm perpendicular uh, perpendicular to that point and you go posteriorly a little above the mid axillary line this is the point of entry of your needle you take a blunt needle and then you insert you will feel two pops it's called a two pop technique the first pop will be from the external oblique then a second pop will be from internal oblique then you aspirate make sure you're not uh, any you're not hitting any vessel then you give a local anesthetic typically we give 0.5% rupivacaine with aspiration 20 ml each side so you can see sir anterior superior leg spine you go 5 cm superior 5 cm posterior you give enter you take entry at the middle axillary line and then the us uh, usg guided tab lock patient uh, is kept in supine position a high frequency ultrasound probe is uh, placed on the leg crest then you advance cephalid uh, when you see the facial plane you will see three layers external oblique internal oblique and transversus abdominis the ultrasound transducers is moved aiming to view the point where the transverse abdominus muscle begins to tail off uh, then you insert the needle along the transducer you can see the needle inserting into the plane uh, this is sir this is the external oblique internal oblique then you see this fascia and this is where you typically inject uh, the local anesthetic uh, you will see this space expanding uh, it appears as a hypoechoic space so for this study sir vas score was uh, measured at rest and at movement after 2 4 and 8 hours of uh, abdominal surgeries so this is the results from uh, the study sir the patient who were giving uh, who were given the tab block using uh, landmark technique uh, that analgesia was varied from 3 to 6 hours while the patient in which the uh, tab block was given using the ultrasound the uh, hours of analgesia uh, ranges from 8 Uh, in some patient up to 15 hours so these are some reference uh, in here. so in conclusion sir uh, this pilot study demonstrate that usg guided tab block provides a longer duration of post operative pain relief and reduces consu uh, consumption of analgesic till 24 hours uh, uh, we compare that to the landmark guided abdominal blocks how many cases you did sir i've done 15 for this study but this is a regular uh, you want to block t9 no one so, which nerve you want to block it was cholecystectomy patient that you have presented sir uh, in this study we have taken the patient undergoing abdominal abdominal surgeries hernia any abdominal surgery so this can be given for a variety of uh, abdominal surgery sir so how arbitrarily 5 cm above and 5 cm perpendicular that's a you, uh, that's a typical landmark guided technique sir that's uh, earlier you, uh, that is also used but uh, we also give usg guided no no that is not my question my question is because uh, the distribution of the sensory nerve will be segmental so if you go 5 cm above anterior superior leg spine in the mid axillary line yes sir so that will block which uh, nerve groups sir the sensory supply is given by the uh, generally sir the lateral abdominal nerve supply is given by t6 to t11 and if you go a little bit below uh, ilio ilioinguinal and ilio hypogastric nerves they also uh, supply this ilio hypogastric yes sir how ilio hypogastric will be yeah no that's fine uh, it is there are two questions one is at what level are you doing the ultrasound guided block uh, so so what level are you doing it because i know the 5 cm is your landmark guided yes sir uh, you said where the transverse abdominus tails off so where are you injecting at the same place where you do the landmark yes sir typically. or exactly the same place yes, sir. so you mark it and you look at it and when you say tail off you mean so tail off you towards the rectus sheath yes sir uh, generally you tail can tail is towards the rectus sheath yes, no i'm just trying to understand because i do a, quite a few ilio hypogastric and ilio inguinal nerve block yes, it's sir. the same plane obviously yes, between sir. the transverse abdominis and, and the, the internal oblique, internal oblique but a little bit so i generally look at the ass and then you go medially and you can see the nerves you can see the nerves and you so we just inject there so with this i have no experience of this so which is why i was interested 
uh, at the level. So, oh, so the landmark and the ultrasound is in the same place. So you can actually block the illohypogastric and illoinguinal by a landmark technique. Two centimeter above the lyre crest and two centimeter medially. That's yeah. typically where you insert and block. Obviously, being a radiologist, I always cheat. I never do landmark guided. Used to when I did orthopedic. Now, I always look with ultrasound. But illohypogastric and illoinguinal, you can see the nerves. So, yes, there's no issue. But this one's interested me because obviously, but again, I use it for problem solving post hernia repair when they come back with pain six months later to see if there is something related to that. So I would inject depo, depomedron or you know, kenacot here. Okay, sir. Along with levopivacaine, which is what we use, which is similar, an isomer yes. of ropivacaine, yes, uh, similar stuff. So do you have any long term things? Uh, using steroid to see if these people have chronic scar related pain, can you treat that or is it purely post-op that you do? Uh, so this study, this is purely for post-op. I know this study is, but do you do any long term other things? I know this study no, is purely post-op, but I'm asking do you do any or have you looked at it? Or? No sir, we don't do uh, for a long term. Uh, okay, do. fair enough, sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nice. Okay, thank you very much. So, we are going to start our next session with film reading. Uh, and after that, there will be a small valedictory session. We will uh, present the certificates and mementos. And the uh, first, second and third prize winners will be given certificate from the principal of the college. Okay, because that carries some marks also in your final examination. Uh, memento. Do. Final year, please come forward. To me, give memento. I can never. Ritu Panna. I can give certificate. Never. To me, body free. Never. Not to me. 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 Not It'll come. So I think uh, for this session, because it's very informal, it's uh, very informal and impromptu. Can I change the... I'm just trying to um No no kichu problem nahi ami dekhar chesta korchi eta ke screen hisabe use mane second screen hisabe use kora jay kina to sheta ekhan dike darao ami chesta kore dekhchi mirror theke change kore dutu display te korechi ebar dekhchi ek second Ah, perfect. So that, that's the thing. Otherwise, people cheat. Now, you don't have to look at that. So, no, first of all, uh, anybody who's interested, sit uh, there so that I can hear you. If you want, keep the microphone. It isn't, it isn't as, not as Dr. Karim was saying, it's not a quiz. Nobody's going to catch you out. It. So, I examine at... Uh, one, two, three, at least three FRCR uh, to be courses. And, and I was going to show you cases which you probably haven't seen. Um, 
in the ultrasound cases thing. But then I thought it's better to show you stuff that we come across um, and also things that you might, guys might come across if you're doing an FRCI exam and things that you learn something from. So I'll show you some. So there'll be a mixture of cases. All the ones that I'm showing are cases that I would show the examinees uh, in the UK. So here's the first one. And I'm, I'm more than happy for anybody to have a go. I don't want to go one after the other. So this is a patient with a swelling. Some of them will be, do you know what an aunt mini is? Have you heard of the word aunt mini? Yes. Yeah, so aunt mini is something which you can tell straight away, okay? If you're actually doing a 2B exam, I don't know about the exam status here, you will never get an aunt mini. If you get an aunt mini, it means either you're failing, they're trying to show you something to get it, or you're really, really lucky. Nobody gets an aunt mini, okay? You always get discussion. But it's a good, what we call a starter film, okay? So often people will get one to just get your nerves going. And when you actually walk into an FRCR exam, they will shake your hand and say, treat me like a clinician, treat this like an MDT, forget you, it's an exam. That's what they'll say. They're not testing your knowledge, it's a discussion that they have. Because you will pro never see a bullet vertebra in your life ever, probably, if you're not working in a pediatric center, okay? You'll only see it in exam, there's no point. So what is this? Uh, okay. Uh, Aneurysmal bone cyst or GCT? Yeah, so that's a very good point. Why do you say uh, one or the other? Age is the main criteria. If I sell cl uh, closer, is a criteria. No? Yeah, fair point. Uh, so when it's an exam film, is the epiphysis closed here or not? So I don't want to know what the criteria is. I want to know what is going on here. Mm. Do you think it's closed or not closed? It is closed. It is closed. Mm. So does that tilt you into one or the other? One. So if it is physis is closed, it's GCT. Unanimous? You don't sound sure. So what they'll do is they'll check whether you're sure or not. And you know, I'll tell you what the answer is in a minute. So one of the things that I have read in books is that GCT is subarticular. So that doesn't fit, does it? Does it or does not? Okay. So one of the catches, obviously, I'm trying to, I won't trick you. If in the exam, if I'm actually doing the exam, the instruction is you cannot mislead the candidate. You can't take them what is down the garden path. So where, why is GCT subarticular? Because it's a epiphyseal lesion, okay? There's a reason for everything. It's an epiphyseal. It's not always an epiphyseal. If you look at the textbook, it is either epiphyseal or apophyseal, okay? So can it be a GCT of the lesser tuberosity or the greater tuberosity? It doesn't have to be subarticular then, okay? Well, this is actually a GCT, but there's nothing wrong by calling it an aneurysmal bone cyst, okay? Would anything, if I say this guy has got a thyroid cancer, could this be an expensile met? Possible, okay? If I argue, could this be a plasma cytoma? Yes or no? Yeah. To be fair, you can't tell. It is way, way down your list. But any expensile, hypervascular, renal cancer and things could look expensile. Basically, they'll be ABC or GCT is the book teaching. But they will then ask you what goes on. So very good. This is actually GCT. So if it was a quiz, whoever said GCT first would get the point. But we, it's, it is not a quiz, as I said. It's more about sharing what we see. So I will, as I said, initially uh, show you some uh, cases, some of which you've seen and some of which you haven't seen. I'm just going to window it a little bit to help you. So this one is a scanned image. So it wasn't a digital image. Sorry. What did you say? I'm not sure how well it projects, actually. So always tricky on a screen, but go on. Again, there's no shame. Hyperparathyroidism, uh, osteoporosis. OK, so first of all, why are you saying it's hyperparathyroidism? 
So there, there are many DDs for osteoporosis, but it can be a possibility. Okay, so it probably projects that way, but I can tell you the bone density is normal. So there's no osteoporosis. <laughs> this is exactly what happens in the exam as well. If you say osteoporosis in an FRCR exam, they'll tell you that uh, I don't think it's osteoporotic. So say, you know, that basically means carry on. There's something else. What do you see in the hand? What does the hand look like? Leaking candy sign. What? Leaking candy sign. Uh, no. No, not leaked candy sign. What do the bones look like? Arthritis. Somebody said arthritis. arthritis. Okay. Now, if in the exam, at least in the FRCR exam, there is nobody who will show you arthritis, bog standard. If a hand looks like, when you say arthritis, do you mean inflammatory or OA? Inflammatory. 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 Generally, inflammatory arthritis will have erosions and things. This one actually does not have any erosion. I can show you erosions uh, in a minute. This one looks more like, so these, what are these things? This one particular. Osteophytes. Yeah. What is osteophyte a sign of? Osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis, degenerative. Why would I show you degenerative OA? I wouldn't show you degenerative OA. So something else must be on. This is an exam, if you think. Okay. Um, and even if so, sometimes the candidates there will say there's erosion there. And I'll say, no, it isn't. It's just exaggerated appearance of the proximal phalanges and things. So OA, if I show you OA in an exam film, there are two diagnoses, generally. If it's only the index and the middle finger, then you're looking at hemochromatosis. I don't know whether you see them here or not, but for the FRCR ones. And they say hook-shaped osteophytes and things like that. If, if it looks like OA everywhere, it is something that you probably haven't seen. Okay, I'll give you a clue. This guy plays basketball in his college team. Does that help? Sorry? Somebody is thinking along that line. What did you say? Somebody said Marfans. Who else can be taught? I know you're talking, you're saying Marfans because the, I said basketball. Another group of tall people? Yeah, very good. One scene never forgotten. So your terminal, there's, there's a bit of debate, but often when you look at the terminal phalanx, if you can window it, some people say it looks like an arrowhead, okay? To me, um, it looks like, well, first of all, it's a big x-ray. Okay, so you don't see those films. In When we did the exams first, they would have what's called a 17-inch film. If you need a massive film to look, compare them with your own hand, it looks big. Some people say the hands look like a spade because it's so big. Some people, um, some people will look at the OA and they'll say that it, is, it looks like bad OA. If you actually look at the joint, it looks like OA, but the joint spaces are not only are they preserved, they're increased. You get cartilage hypertrophy with them. So the MCP joint spaces are actually increased. This is actually acromegaly. Okay, it kind of often looks like OA. And the other thing that I used to think when I'm going the exam, if I'm stuck with that sort of OA, because I knew there are three things that I'll be stuck with, acromegaly, acro um, hemochromatosis, and sarcoid. With sarcoid, you get prominent nutrient foramina, which looks like heart-shaped defects in the proximal phalanges, which you probably won't see here. But this is, this is acromegaly. So in the exam scenario, if the hand looks coarse, I used to think acromegaly was my trick, but this is one. So staying with the theme of the hand, what is this? This is an aunt mini. Yeah. I've heard whispers, yeah, it is acrostylysis, it is, okay? So this is an exam film though, what is the cause? That doesn't finish. So acroosteolysis will not even, so if you normally, in an FRCR exam, saying acroosteolysis will give you five. Leprosy, maybe. So again, it's not, so again, in the exam, mm -hmm. there will be clues here. I don't want to know causes of acroosteolysis. So what's the cause here in this patient? of acroosteolysis. So you can, generally, you can give DD. What, what is this? Do you think that's part of a bone? Yeah, it is calcification in the soft tissue. 
this is, or crest scleroderma, systemic sclerosis. So this time when I was doing, using this uh, for teaching at uh, the Manipal uh, FRCR teaching one, they took one look and they said uh, snake bite. And so obviously, you know, depending on where you're coming from, snake bite is a cause, okay? Another clever answer, and I can't dispute that, people sometimes notice it's the thumb and index finger, okay? Some people say it's heat burn and frozen burn. Those are the things that we use to grab most things electrocution and all sorts of things people come up with. So what they want to see generally in, of course you know acroosteolysis, is are you able to work out what is this acroosteolysis, you know, what is the reason behind the acroosteolysis, is what they're looking at. Because anybody who knows acroosteolysis will look at it and say acroosteolysis. Do you know what I mean? That's not, that's not the idea. Now, somebody has shown this particular one before, uh, but I'll still show it. comes up, sorry, comes up in a funny way. So let me pull it down and then window it. So this patient has got left hip pain. Most of the time, people can't see anything until I mag. This is a real case, actually. Well, they are all real case, but this is a real conundrum. And in FRCR exam, this is the kind of thing that they're looking for. They will show you subtle things at the edge, which are obvious things, but they are subtle, okay? They're, well, that's what I reported it as, okay? I reported it as loser zone. So the rheumatology, so I have a Tuesday afternoon rheumatology meeting. So the rheumatologist is a really nice, very old Libyan guy. So he came and said, I did all the vitamin D things. Dr. Ganguly, as you said, they are not low. They are extremely high. They are very high. Everything is normal. I said, okay. I thought this is loser zone. Now I'm stumped. Then he said, so we, then what are the thoughts? Any thoughts? The clue was, we discussed this case. I think, uh, is it Sita? What, what was, what's, a, what's his name? Yeah, okay. So it looks like a loser zone. He was saying, so do you know what, what group of fracture are these? Now I've got the opportunity. I'm going to talk a bit of orthopedics. Um, what group of fracture is this? Is this a stress fracture or an insufficiency fracture? Excellent. Very good. Why? This is the convex side of the bone. Okay. So you only get tensile. There is no compressive force on this side. The concave side of the bone is the stress fracture. So if this was a 16-year-old gymnast, she'll get a stress fracture in the neck, which will be here. She will never get here unless she's got vitamin D deficiency, as you said, loser zone. So this is an insufficiency fracture because, as he was saying before, the bone is not normal. It's, it's thickened, but it's abnormal bone. So that's how it starts. What do you do? So that's what I would ask the candidate. If you're actually reporting this, what would you do? How would you report this? Would you suggest anything else? Here you might do an MR. We don't do MR straight away. We, in fact, this patient never had an MR. Nor did he have a CT. He had something else. Yeah, well, not bone density. We did a bone scan. So this is a technician 99 bone scan. And again, I might have to window it. Have you spotted? So you notice right and left. This is on the left side. So can you see if I window it? Can you see that hot area of activity on the left? The reason why we have done it is not to see that. The reason why we have done it is to see this. So as I don't know whether you went into this, 33%, one in three people will have it on both sides. So we had to bring this lady back. Um, I'll close this and I'll bring this up if it comes up. By the way, she's got OA and other things, so ignore the activity elsewhere. So that is insufficiency, chronic insufficiency fracture. Chronic, we knew about that, but you know, good spot. It is a chronic insufficiency fracture that we ignored. Um, but the point is, uh, there is thickening, so we haven't developed a fracture line here, but we've got it. So what's the management? What will you do? Will you let her go? Well, you let her go, as in like, let her go home. You're not going to keep her there or hold on to her. How will you treat? 
stop the bisphosphonate, would you fix the fracture? Would you fix the fracture? Uh, actually, if she's in pain, they will do prophylactic IM nailing bilaterally because what they don't want to see is her coming back with an emergency neck of femur fracture or a femoral shaft fracture. The prognosis, the survival rate and everything dips like to a quarter, to a fifth. So they will prophylactically IM nail both sides. They don't want to see it coming as a fracture. So that's generally the answer that they're expecting. So this is a different patient. with multiple abnormal bones. So go for it. What do you think? Sorry? Hyperparathyroidism. Uh, on what basis? Multiple uh, lytic lessons through. Multiple lucent areas lucent. is you know, often what we say because we still don't know whether they're lesions or not. So I'm being pedantic, but multiple lucent areas, that's okay. But that could be anything, isn't it? Sorry? Yeah, I'm sure you can, yeah, you don't need the mic. Squaring of uh, phalanx and the carpal, I made a carpal bone. Uh, so that is actually called, it's a good spot, it's called under tubulation. Mm -hmm. So when the normal shape, if you've not un seen under tubulation, the normal shape of the metacarpal uh, bones are not uh, there. So this is, what does that mean? What does it mean? What does under tubulation mean? If it is developmental, you're thinking of mucopolysaccharidosis and you saw cases of them like that, okay? Even then, why is it under tubulated? You probably never thought of it. And knowingly, I just, every time I see something, I think, why is it like that? Because it's full of mucopolysaccharides. The bone is full of rubbish. It's not full of any proper marrow. It's just full of mucopolysaccharides and other things that shouldn't be full of. Why do thalassemia get under tubulation? Because it's packed with red marrow, useless marrow, but it's marrow, which is trying its best to produce red cells, but it can't. Hence, the extramedullary hemato hematopoiesin thing spill it. So why is there under tubulation here? In a grown-up, if you see under tubulation, it's filling up with something useless, isn't it? It has filled up with something useless. Could be, could be a myeloproliferative disorder. If you were to see this wrist in isolation, I think it's a little bit tricky on a screen here. On a pack screen, when you're sitting in front of a monitor, there are things that you spot which you can't really see on a screen because there is information loss down the wire, okay? Um, but if you just looked at the wrist, what would you have called? Go on, there's no shame in it. We, we all CLL yeah. is a possibility. Uh, see, again, before you go into the, jump into the diagnosis, that's one of the first things that they say don't do in FRCR, only because unless you're 100% confident. That's one of the differences that I found with the Indian exam. They want you to go. Here, they don't want you to go because you're never going to go in your real life. Just because it's an exam, you're never going to go. You're never going to see a film and say, oh, this is PE. You will say pulmonary arteries enlarged. How do you know it's not primary pulmonary hypertension? How do you know it's not an aneurysm of the pulmonary artery? Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Whereas in the exam, I remember seeing a film and they were expecting me to call it PE. Why should I call it PE? But well, thankfully, I didn't argue with the examiner and I passed. If I'd argued with the examiner, that was it. <laughs> I would have not passed. But the thing is, bear in mind, say everything that you say and it's interesting because when I examined the people from Manipal, they were exactly the same as you guys. Uh, so there's no shame in it. They go for the diagnosis. Whereas when I examine people in UK, they will tell you first that, well, all the bones look undertubulated. The uh, radio density is sort of similar. Very abnormal appearance of the distal radius and ulna. Um, I can't see any destructive bone change anywhere. So I think it's a non-aggressive process which has been going on for a long time. This is how the uh, registrars will speak. My top differential would be enchondroma, multiple. And I'll say, okay, what else? That means I'm not happy with, okay, what else could it be? So it is not multiple enchondroma. Yes, that particular terminal phalanx is expanded, but one swallow doesn't make summer, as I say. So one swollen, you know, expanded bone doesn't make it enchondroma. You probably can't, well, you can't appreciate it here, but if you look at the distal radius, what could it be? Just if you look at the distal radius, if you think about it, it's an expansile lucent lesion. Is it destroying the bone? No. So there are no aggressive features in it. 
Do you think it's a malignancy from his, which he's going to die soon? No. There's no, some, nothing aggressive about it. What does that mean? You're in benign territory now. If it is a benign territory, what could it be? Somebody said it. Polyostatic fibrous dysplasia. Excellent. So either that or Paget's. They are exam favorites. Hyperparathyroidism is a good thought. You could have said those are brown tumors. I think they are brown tumors. When you say something, if you justify, the examiner will not say anything to you. If you say, I think, because you're, they, will, they are treating you as a radiologist. Tomorrow you could be, as they call it in UK, tomorrow you might be reporting my mom's x-ray. I want that person to be, that's the way you should be thinking. Okay, so, um, so this person has got lucent lesions. It could be brown tumor, but I don't see any supportive features. I can't see any erosion. This is actually polyostotic fibrous dysplasia. It, it is, it is, you can't see the ground glass. I never saw the ground glass. Even when I took the exam, I really struggled. A lot of my examiners and other people could show the ground glass. What I used to see is bone expansion. It's a medullary process, replacement of abnormal tissue, fibrous tissue, replacing the medulla. Hence the undertubulation. It's in the medulla. It's not a cortical lesion. Everything is expanded. Thalassemia is a good thought, but if it was thalassemia, I would have nodded and then showed you an x-ray of the skull with wide diploic spaces or a spine and things like that. So if you say thalassemia and the hemoproliferative disorders and things, then you're kind of in the track because I know you've understood the undertubulation. This is fibrous dysplasia. Okay, I'll show you another case of fibrous dysplasia um, here. This patient is a different patient with fibrous dysplasia. Why do we follow up fibrous dysplasia? He's got a bit of not as good a Shefford Krug deformity uh, as it was presented, but this person has got a little bit of a polyostatic fibrous dysplasia and a Shefford Krug deformity. Why do we follow them up? Excellent. Okay. So, what are we looking for? Any aggressive features? Okay. So, this is an example. So, can you see the, it doesn't project very well on these screens, but can you see the periosteum is not clean? Can you appreciate that? There's a bit of a, it looks much better on these screens, annoyingly, as I said with the projector, but you can see it's a fuzzy margin. So that's the kind of thing that we're looking for, and we don't want you to stop at fibrous dysplasia. We would ask, why are you doing it? Because we know malignant transformation occurs. So what would you do at this stage? And I would expect an answer, we'll do an MRI. When they answer that, I'll say, okay, what sequence will you do? Because I'm going to show you that sequence. So some people will, whatever sequence, so what sequence will you do? If I tell you, you can do one sequence, you've got five minutes, you need to do something. What MR are you going to do? So I'm just making you think. The examiners will make you think as well. And generally, if the examination is going this way, you're passing. Because they already like you and they are trusting what you're saying. They just want to see how much, because nobody can judge what you are in 15 minutes. Annoyingly, I found that very annoying in Indian exams. They try to judge you in 15 minutes. They can't. You could be the most clever person in India. But in 15 minutes, they can't judge you. You could have the worst 15 minutes of your life. Okay, so it's a discussion. Don't forget that. If you keep that in mind, it will come through, I think, in any country, in any exam. If you talk reason, explain why you're saying something. But exam techniques are different. So don't, don't hold it to heart. Um, get through the exams that you need to get through. Um, so, yeah, what MR sequence? I brought one up. So we did a star. Why did we did a, do a star? Why did we do a star? Because we want to see. What do we want to see? Lesions. Right? Yeah. There's no shame in saying anything wrong. You know, you know don't, don't forget, a lot of the time, don't forget, I'll tell you this, which is what people, people are often afraid of exams and things like that. We, well, I was not, because I know that the examiner has brought the films that he has missed or somebody has given me, okay? 
don't have any doubts about that, okay? He wouldn't have brought this as an interesting case if nobody has shown it to him. Or he thought, oh, this is nice, let me test them on this and I'll find out how many picked this up because I never found it or something. Or a tumor that they missed, okay? Don't, don't, so keep that, this is for your confidence, okay? In, in a year, or some of you, you know, in, in months, you'll probably become radiologists and will be reading scans, okay? You know, have faith and believe in yourself is the first thing. And think. Think through, you know, you've unfortunately you've picked a profession. If you picked surgery or orthopedic, you'll be hands-on all day, sewing, chewing, screwing things. You've picked a profession now by choice or by mom and dad's choice or by default or whatever, which is a thinker's profession. So, you know, you may not be philosophers, but you have to think yourself through. So what sequence? I showed you a STIR sequence. Can anyone tell me why I did a STIR and not a PDFS? Because it's a large field of view. STIR is a T, short T1 inversion recovery, short TI actually, short tau inversion recovery, okay? So it is not affected by field inhomogeneity. If you do a PDFS, which is a spectral fat suppression, you can't do a large field of view. You have to focus just on the right hip, or the left hip, or the symph, or the knee. But with a STIR, you can do a huge field, okay? Because you don't worry about field inhomogeneity at the edges of the scan. That's why bigger area, STIR. Smaller area, fat suppressed, FS. Okay, that's the reason. There's a reason for everything. Once you know, you can run your MR scanner and the technician will know, I'll want to go to you know, Dr. Ganguly and ask him. If I ask Dr. X, he doesn't know anything. He just says, do a fluid sensitive sequence. If I go and ask him. So that's the reason. Bigger field of area, do a STIR, okay? Somebody was asking me about DWI. DWI had the same issues because you're looking at a large area, the field homogeneity. And you're already, oh, sorry, what am I doing? Um, oh, wrong button. So I don't want to show you the bone lesions. You're already seeing the bone lesions. This has been presented as well, OK? What is this thing? I'll scroll back and forth. Is it in the bone or outside the bone? OK, what does it look like? Anyone describe it for me. By the way, if you're thinking, no, I didn't miss this, that's not why it's here. We picked it up, that's why it's here. I did say people put exam films, the things that they've missed. Should I describe it for you? Okay, I, I, like, I used to enjoy the hot seat, actually. I loved, so even now, when we went to this uh, course in Leeds, they were looking for things. So me and Mark Kaplan, who's actually my mentor, he's much senior, is, He's, he's 60 plus. We both love the hot seat and being grilled because it is your opportunity to speak. As long as you speak sense, it's great. So what are we seeing? We're seeing a bright lesion, okay? It's, you know, we don't call it bright in MR. What do we call it? We see a high signal lesion, perfect. High sig, oh, shy. oh, sorry. See, I told you, speak too much and <laughs> at least it wasn't a bad one. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> um, so it is a high signal lesion, right? It's an oval high signal lesion. What does oval and circular matter? Does it matter? It does matter. Cancer is how, you know, what sort of growth pattern is cancer? Circular. If you remember Petri dish and things like that, we say, why is he talking about long forgotten things? It matters. Oval means elongated, long growth pattern, means benign. It has time to grow that way. If it was a really fast going thing, it'll go in every direction. Yeah, these are basics which applies everywhere. It doesn't matter whether you're doing MSK or brain or breast or, or, or prostate. Okay, so these are benign looking things. High signal lesion outside the bone in a patient. We know of fibrous dysplasia. What are you thinking? What could it be? Somebody had a poster. I picked some of these cases because you've already shown these in different. So I just want to see whether you just showed it for the sake of showing or you actually understand. These are multiple, yeah, myxomas, okay, soft tissue myxomas. This is Mazabrod, okay. So these are, uh, so if I argue, could these be schwannomas? Yeah, very good, because they can be schwannoma. There's, you know, again, there's no shame in that. We thought schwannoma until we thought, oh, crikey, one in the, at 3 o'clock in the morning suddenly woke up, oh, read about Mazabrod two years ago. They get myxomas, looks the same as schwannoma. 
Okay? If you do a post contrast, sometimes with a myxoma, you get mixed enhancement and peripheral enhancement, whereas with a schwannoma, you would traditionally get uniform, solid enhancement. That's the way to differentiate. Did we do it? We didn't. Because the orthopedic surgeon had never heard of Mazabrod syndrome, as we're very happy when we said multiple soft tissue myxomas, all benign, you don't need to do anything about them, sir. This is Mazabrod. And so it's in my teaching pile now, in his, his teaching pile, he has never seen it, but uh, is it schwannoma? It, I'm sure it is not schwannoma, because it fits with Mazabrod. That's something which we often say called Ockram's razor. If one thing fits and explains, then stop looking for other things. Okay. And it is not cyst. Uh, it could be a cyst. You know, it could be some sort of a cyst, but why would you have random cysts everywhere? Okay, so this is Mazabrod. Night. Um, before I show... Oh yeah, actually this is nice. Somebody has shown this already. It would be nice if the people who showed this were there. I'm going to mag. Okay, we've looked at it. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. So this is apophysis, okay? Os vesalinium, or whatever you want to call it. Most of the time you don't remember the name, but it's an accessory secondary ossification center, basically. It's normal, okay? So I reported it as normal. So the patient has got severe pain. So now she still can't walk. And once I find my mouse, So this is her MR. Oh, or let me bring up the two, two. You can get a lot of normal variations actually in the proximal. Uh, you're talking about ATA? Yeah, you can get a normal variation. You can get a cleft there as well, bifid epiphysis. So that's another area of debate. So ignore this one. I think that was the later MR. So this is the first MR she had. So can you see any high signal? So this is traction apophysitis. So just because it's an apophysis doesn't always mean it's normal. Okay, so she was in pain, we did an MR. So do you know what this condition is called? You won't see it, even in the FRCR exam, unless you're doing really well, and I want to see whether you understand this. It's called Isilin's disease. So I thought when this was shown, when they were showing you know, the cases, he's going to show Isilin's disease. But Isilin's disease is traction apophysitis of this. So it's not a fracture. It's just recurrent use and dancing and tiptoeing has pulled on the peroneus brevis tendon and caused traction apophysis. Just like you get traction, Sinding Larsen's disease, you've read about them in the book. Tibial tuberosity, Oshgood slatter, they're all traction apophysitis. You can get them anywhere in the body, okay? So this is Isilin's. So again, I showed it because there was uh, people showing that. Okay, now I'll show you something more slightly dramatic. And I want you, so this is, this is an example. So while I'm adjusting the uh, thing, it's the same patient um, who had a normal x-ray about six to seven months ago. Well, there is a little bit of OA and uh, a little bit of thing. Uh, change, but this has happened in six months. So this is the shoulder. Okay, what do you think is going on? Yeah, so essentially, so what's going on? So generally when we ask our examiners, sorry examiners, when we ask our candidates, um, what can this be? Yeah, exactly. So that is, that is, you know, that is exactly the kind of thing that we, you know, want you guys to think. It could be potentially possible. So essentially, we often when they sorry sarcoma. I yeah, I probably wouldn't go into the diagnosis as I was saying. So what is happening? Because there could be a lot of things that is going on, and I've not given you some bits of the story. So what what is happening? So Tell me, just summarize it. It sounds very straightforward. Uh, 
lytic lesion okay of shop uh, lytic lesion where okay i'll give you a choice you know a multiple choice which one will you pick the joint um, okay between two lytic lesion of the humeral head or absent humeral head be 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 true that's the thing about radiology do you yeah it is absent you can't see it can you see it so it's being resorbed right so it is either replaced by something or it's just gone on something else as you know F fine replaced by something blood fluid soft tissue whatever so the head is gone how can the head be gone the first thing that comes to mind is surgery can't be surgery that looks like awful surgery you know it's not a clean cut it's a round you know rubbish surgeon okay and who would remove the humeral head if you know if you think about it the first thing we think is surgery but who removes the humeral head and why would you remove the humeral head okay so i think surgery comes down in the list it's a good thought but why else would you lose the head as in the humeral head i lose my head all the time but you know we're talking about the humeral head here but what is uh, the uh, simple tumor or infection generally isn't it if you lose something it's a lytic process either as you said the head has been destroyed now and it's absent because it's completely gone and destroyed it doesn't really look like a destruction of that side because it's a very nice well defined smooth sclerotic margin and i'm looking for my mouse i'm not randomly looking there oh that's because it's a screen here so it's you know smoothly defined sclerotic margin okay infection if you say infection you're kind of in the track but i'll i'll tell you that a crp is normal white cell count is normal never had an infection in his well never had an infection related to this okay true and the other thing that uh, professor karim said i often ask them do you think it's a bone problem or a joint problem because that excellent so that dramatically now narrows down there is a destructive process okay if i'm describing this over the phone that's how you should describe an x-ray to my boss there's a destructive process i can't see the humeral head it's joint based so he'll say it is either some sort of a sarcoma in the joint extremely rare infection in the joint in which case the patient will be septic gorham's disease which we saw yesterday but what is the main thing about gorham's disease which is missing here lucency everything will look lucent because it's a hypervascular angiomatous proliferative condition okay gorham's disease vanishing bone disease which um, uh, dr mandal doc, doc, you know showed yesterday okay so no it doesn't fit with gorham's disease it's sclerotic and then i say can you describe it a bit more said, well the joint is a bit disorganized the whole density is increased um it it's it the head is destroyed and uh, there are little debris floating about here and there i said oh one two three four i've i've counted four d's what i haven't told you is this person had a severe injury and had a transection of the cervical cord for or hemisection of the cervical cord so he's now got essentially almost like a syringomyeliatic cord myelopathy okay so what does that make this diagnosis neuropathic charcot's or neuropathic joint okay if you see surgical like resorption and it's joint based always keep charcot's in mind it can resorb bone very quickly very dramatically okay dramatically such dramatic disappearance won't happen with met it can happen with infection but things will look lucent it will happen with gorham's but things will look lucent if it happens with charcot's things will look sclerotic there is no other option if you work it out and and only on a projector you can't see it this is the film which i was telling somebody for the last 10 years i've been using it and it says neuropathic joint at the top which you can't read but it's there but i've till 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 date in the last 10 years of doing three frcr to be exam courses each year and examining 10 candidates per course i have not seen one person i'm still waiting for somebody to catch me out and look at the film and say this is neuropathic arthropathy because it says so you know so similarly so i had i one of my i i got the idea from one of my bosses who had an achalasia and there was you could see the film was written in portuguese at the bottom 
So it was Chagas disease. What he wanted me to say was Chagas disease, which you've heard of, but you haven't seen. But this was a Portuguese guy, hence the film was written in Portuguese. So I could see the language was different, but I didn't know what language. So I went on about esophageal tumor and achalasia and things. They all had fluid level, distended esophagus. But you know, sometimes there are other things. As Dr. Bhadro, my first uh, boss, Ashok Bhadro, uh, respected sir. So he always used to tell me when I was a first year DMRD student that Akash, remember every film has four corners. And those days had films, so he used to remember it. And he used to tell me that, you know, remember film has four corners. So that's something that I kind of still remember and I use it and I see it's not been, you know, people, people don't spot. Possibly often they're in the hot seat. Uh, that's why. Now this is a part of a long case. Okay, so this is a hand. I love hands. And that I've picked up from another um, senior colleague of mine, uh, Debidar uh, surname Bulegechi, Dr. Debi uh, Bhattacharya Chatterjee. Okay, so he was something he you know he said look at X-rays of the hand. If you can diagnose X-rays from the hand, so I actually have a collection of about 50 hands of different conditions. Okay. So this is one of them. I don't normally bore people, but I've got a total of, I think, about 700, but uh, I don't use all of them. There are some that comes up recurrently in the FRCR. Some are obviously for workshops like these. So what can you see? Two abnormal bones? Straight away, it's multiple, polyostotic. Okay, keep it simple. I'm helping you think here. Okay, let's stick to, you can pick any one of the abnormal bone. Which one are you going to pick? The metacarpal or the proximal phalanx or the right hand? Or the left hand third metacarpal or metacarpus? Which one do you want to pick? The metacarpus? What does it look like? What do you think is going on? Benign or aggressive? Yeah, radiologically the features are benign. It hasn't destroyed, okay. So what are your differentials for this sort of an appearance now? Is it expanded? Is the bone expanded? Yes. Is it bigger than the other bones? Yes. Yes, yes or no? Is it sclerotic? Yes. yes. Okay. Has it got mixed density, loosened areas? And yes. Yeah. Very good thought, actually. In an exam scenario, if it is not fibrous dysplasia, what is it? You don't see them here. That's the thing. It, it, in the UK, people will say it in the reverse, in the other order. So if it is not fibrous dysplasia, Thickening of the bone, sclerotic, the bone is enlarged, mixed density. They get high output cardiac failure. It is Paget's disease, okay? So this is Paget's disease actually, okay? There's no point in thinking it if you don't say aloud. So that's the problem with uh, most of the time, including me. I am basically an introvert. So often I used to sit at the back and think, oh, butterfly glioma. And we used to have our clues. When, when we used to get quizzed before the FRC, we had our clues. So if I do this, that means it's a butterfly glioma. So we had our little clues between our friends group. So from a distance, they look at us and they do this. So, you know, we had, but we were too shy to actually speak up when I go in the hot seat. But so there's nothing, no, no shame with that. So this is actually Paget's disease. But what would you do next? Do you know? So what we do next is a bone scan because nothing is as hot as a Paget's disease. Okay. That's one of the teachings that we get. And you get to see lots of Paget's disease if you're ever working in the UK. You'll do lots of bone scan and they involve the whole bone. How did this patient come about? So this patient has a history of prostate cancer. That's how it started, okay? So now is your turn to stand by the MDT and say, I still don't think this is met. This is Paget's. This is not sclerotic met, okay? This is Paget's disease. Why? Because the whole clavicle is involved. A met won't involve the whole clavicle and spare the other bones and things. You'll get diffuse uptake everywhere, okay? Uh, there is uptake in the spine, but that's because this is the posterior projection. Uh, yeah, it is a posterior projection, okay? So there's uptake in the tibia, so he's got Paget's disease there. Blade of grass appearance. You might have heard about it in the book. Uh, this is Paget's of the calcaneum and Paget's of the hand, okay? OA changes here, Paget's of the clavicle. Okay, so now I say, because this is actually a long case, now I give them this x-ray, or the packet also has this x-ray. Will it, it'll have two years later. Notice it's the left side, okay? So what's happened?
what happened? Baloney amputation. Yeah? Why would you amputate a paget? See, the left calcaneum was the one where the paget was. Why would you amputate paget's disease? Yeah, excellent. So again, must have developed a secondary osteosarcoma or a chondrosarcoma, I don't know which one. But it developed a malignant tumor, or actually I can't remember which one. But it would have developed one, and then they go on to amputate. Because, what did they amputate? Must have been an Anakin 2B. So don't bring that up again. We had forgotten all about that now. Okay, but it must have been an Anakin 2B. So that's why you had amputation of that part. Otherwise, you would have had wide local excision. Okay. Sometimes you'll find that everything don't tie, doesn't tie up. Okay. Don't get frustrated by that. I do get frustrated when I can't tie things up, but uh, it's normal. So that wasn't. Um, although he ended up having a tumor, but it wasn't a prostate met. It was Paget's, and he had secondary met. I'll show you another one, and then I'll pause for a second. Uh, this patient has a history of bone cancer, sorry, of breast cancer. I won't show you the MR, actually, because the MR is a bit tricky. This is a post-contrast MR of the brain. It's slightly unrelated. It's a recognized thing. So I'll close. Can you see what? Well, actually, I'll close this because it'll throw you off. Yeah, very good, very good. So pachymeningeal enhancement, okay, diffuse. Um, in UK, they've never heard of TB meningitis and all sorts of things, so that kind of thing doesn't arise. So you're always talking in terms of either some sort of lymphoma or you're talking of some sort of MET, okay? So bear in mind, and that's actually how, so good you, because I reported that MR and I said diffuse pachymeningeal enhancement. When I looked it up, it says, who gets it? One of the common causes of cancer spreading there is breast cancer with MET because the only cancer which goes submucosal in the stomach and in funny places, brain meninges is breast. So breast MDT, known breast cancer, this looks like MET. So we did the CT, whole body, chest, abdo, pelvis, and here's what we see. Multifocal sclerotic lesions in the bone, okay? This is how it went in the MDT. So, let me see if I can bring up, sorry, were you saying something? So they do their ALKFOS and whatever other levels, so I'm going to pull that because it is going to be, oh, sh stop. And I'll change the window. It's hard to see at an angle. Is that abdomen? No. I can't read from it. Plus one. Okay, I'll stop there. We know there are sclerotic lesions in the bone, okay? This is from a breast MDT, okay? I don't do the breast MDT. It, this actually got diagnosed. I'll give you a clue. It got diagnosed, um, or it got put together rather than diagnosed is a better way, from the rheumatology MDT. And the lady is still alive. This CT is from... Uh, whatever the date it is, quite a while, some time ago, okay? So basically multiple sclerotic lesions, and then we were reviewing this because there were some issues. What's happened to the spleen? Enlarged, right? The lady has got hypothyroidism. Okay, what are the causes of sclerotic, multifocal sclerotic bone lesions? How many can you come up with? Multiple? Multiple. Multiple myeloma won't give you sclerotic lesions generally. They'll give you lucent lesions. Sometimes you can, if you've by chance said that, you can argue that by saying post-treatment, post-chemotherapy, sclerotic response and try to stand your ground if you said it. But generally I wouldn't say it. Sclerotic mets, osteopoikilosis, we saw an example. Generally you don't see them and they are more uniform. They are generally periarticular. Okay, it's a real pain when an osteopoikilosis patient presents with breast cancer. We've got two in the last 12 years. It's, it's very hard to prove one way or the other, okay? Um, there are multiple other causes. So this cause, I won't go into that because I don't want to bore you. Hypothyroidism, okay, which is a type of endocrinopathy, okay? Funny you mention multiple myeloma because although there were no other features, he had a raised M-band. 
okay this is probably the only m band scenario where you get sclerotic lesions okay what is splenomegaly what is spleen it's a viscera it's an organ it's an organomegaly do you know what i'm getting towards so when i mentioned all these the rheumatology registrar said she's got numbness and tingling in both hand and feet so she's got polyneuropathy what has she got no no it's a good thought i don't know whether you've heard about it or not but you probably would have heard some of you must have heard about it it's called poem syndrome p for polyneuropathy o is organomegaly e is endocrinopathy m is m band and s is sclerotic bone lesions okay sometimes skin changes and things but if you're a musculoskeletal radiologist you remember the sclerotic bone lesion not the skin changes so that's where it came from so again so this is where the radiologist kind of as i look at it earns their money i haven't got uh, got a case but there was a thoracic splenosis which was going around as multiple lung mets but we did a colloid scan we found that the spleen was removed and he got splenic tissue into the art, you know vessels and ended up with splenic tissue debris everywhere so there was thoracic splenosis this is poem syndrome so it is not sclerotic met it's just putting things together you feel tired will you stop one or two more it's a question of who gets tired first me or you here's another aunt mini this you've all seen no you haven't i don't think anybody has seen this i hadn't seen this while you're thinking i'll tell you the story behind this this is a 45 year old in my private practice um, who came and said i want to know the answer and the pressure was is it this because i'm going to sue the doctor so they wanted to know i'm not fill up the blanks basically i'm not telling you what the answer is they wanted to know is it this condition um and that was a question so i had to look up and bring up so what differential books do you look at chapman or no chapman nakilni danart you look at danart as well yeah danart actually for the 2b i didn't look at danart mostly chapman for the 2a you need a bit of danart danart is everything everything under the sun has 1% chance of being the differential of everything so isn't it really really heavy so this guy so what's he got so i've called it what i've called i don't know whether i'm right or wrong okay so help me out here what's are all the metacarpals abnormal yes or no no which metacarpal is abnormal thumb both side yeah could this be acquired could this be acquired think of one condition where somebody you know thumb not just that bone there obviously there's not syphilis now but not why specifically that bone that metacarpal symmetrical it has got developmental or something childhood written all over it during growth or development or congenital or something like that because it's so symmetrical bilateral okay sorry ischemia what supplies just the thumb which part symmetrically how can you get symmetrical disease it's more it 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 looks more developmental now there are so you know which what is this part of the hand called the radial part of the hand right so radial ray hypoplasia is quite a big area okay um i'm glad you guys have at least heard about it because when i show that in uk they've never heard about it radial ray hypoplasia we we read some bit of it with uh, some cardiac conditions because they get murmurs holt orum syndrome somebody remember holt orum syndrome what is it apart syndrome is also another one with radial hypoplasia and there is another there are a couple of other ones there's fanconis where there is radial ray hypoplasia with renal issues okay then there is something called tar thrombocytopenia absent radius syndrome they couldn't come up with anything clever so they put the t a r and they came up with tar bit like the nomenclature the radius is not absent so what is going on here has the mum been given a medicine 
That was a specific question. That is what they wanted to ask. Is it for Comelia from thalidomide use? This is a 45-year-old gentleman, and I'm talking about this from about six years back. So he was born about 50, 60 years ago. I, th I, don't, I think thalidomide was already out of practice at that time. 60 years ago is 1960. I can't remember, you know, whether. So it was already out. So that was the question. But of course, thalidomide is in the differential because it's part, it is like, it is in the spectrum of focomelia. But anything that causes radial ray hypoplasia, so this is a differential. You can never tell exactly what it is. Fanconi wouldn't live that long because they'll have severe renal problems. Apparts and things as well, I don't know how long they live. I don't do pediatrics. So whether they'll survive to 50, I don't know. Tar will survive with blood issues and stuff like that. Thalidomide obviously will survive, we don't know. And a few other associations like Holtorum and other things, you know, where you get cardiac issues, they might survive. So I looked up at Danart and gave them 10 differential because a lawyer was calling me because if it is thalidomide, and if I say thalidomide, he's going to sue the doctor who originally, but I don't know whether they use thalidomide or not at that time, but that was a thing. So it's just a differential. Second last. But I, I, I don't mind going on, but I'm, I'm conscious of time and other things. So I'll see if this projects very well on this. Yeah. It doesn't project very well on this screen, so I'll show you something slightly different. Oh, yeah. This should project. This is an MR shoulder. Okay. Again, when we show an MR shoulder, an MR knee, or an MR ankle, or MR pelvis, or something like that in the exam, we don't expect them to pick up abnormal ligaments and supraspinator, you know, or some subtle thing. We want to pick up gross things. So this patient, and I'm scrolling from front to back. So we'll go through the anatomy. Obviously, why do we know it's front? Because it's a coracoid process, and I can see the short head uh, coming off the coracoid process. And this is subscapularis. Yeah? Subscapularis going through it. Subscapularis looks normal. What do you start to see? High signal. What does the tendon look like? Normal? Yeah, normal. I wouldn't call it a tear, certainly. There's no tear in it. Tendinopathy, not really. It's not particularly thickened. It's pretty much normal signal, okay? There's a little yeah, it's actually a benign enchondroma. Or sometimes when we want to play it down, we call chondral rest. Because cartilage is everywhere in the bone. Some bit of it never ossified and remained a cartilage. So ignore it is what we are saying, okay? So high signal there in the muscle, right? Oop, keep, keep pressing the wrong button. So I'm continuing to go back. What is this? Infraspinatus. Yeah, diffuse edema of the infraspinatus as well. What is this? Straight. Teres minor. Now we are thrown into the doldrums because so far it was supraspinatus and infraspinatus and I vaguely remember the first one, suprascapular nerve, suprascapular notch. At that point I fell asleep, but I, I remember the first bit. So it was going like suprascapular nerve. Uh, compression of the suprascapular notch because I would say I would see edema in the supraspinatus and infraspinatus. What threw me is teres minor because that's posterior division of the axillary nerve. In this occasion, I can't see anything in the deltoid, but I've got so it's not a pure posterior nerve posterior division of the axillary nerve, quadrilateral place syndrome. That is what I was going to show in the other one, but it doesn't seem to project well. With quadrilateral place syndrome, I would have seen edema in the teres minor and the deltoid. Supraspinatus, infraspinatus would have been spared. So it's not that. So what has happened? Why am I seeing edema in non-neurogenic distribution? So it doesn't fit to any distribution. What must be the cause then? I think you're right. Were you saying break? What were you saying? Bra brachial neuritis. It has to be something. So if the nerves are not individual, it's like motorway and railroad. If it doesn't fit with this and doesn't fit with it, it must be somebody 
above them before they branched out. So that is brachial neuritis. Interestingly, this is not brachial neuritis. Well, it is a form of brachial neuritis, I'll give you that. It, it, there's a name for this, Parsonage Turner. Again, I really like teaching in India only because people have come up, people will come up with answers and terms. I would have had a room full of blank faces who had never heard of Parsonage Turner when I teach in the UK. They will tell you all the things there and cleverly talk out of them, but they actually don't know the diagnosis. That's why they value the people, not only India, India, Pakistan, Middle East, in you know, African countries, and people who do proper book-based teaching, when they go there, they earn their value. But this is Parsonage Turner, and this was actually post-COVID vaccine, so the person was convinced it's related to the COVID vaccine, uh, but we know that brachial neuritis can be, or Parsonage Turner can happen after a cold, happen after anything, it can happen without a risk. But it was proven as a COVID-associated, um, you know, sort of neuritis. There is COVID, there is COVID-associated bursitis as well, subacromial, there's a name for it. But, right, I'll stop at that, there's, there's a few more. Um, but we, I think it's good to close the session now. It's nearly six. Can I show one last? It's 10 to six, I'll show you one last. Because this, yeah, actually I thought, this is one of the first few cases which I saved, um, and I was still a trainee, so I like showing this. Does it say the age? Does it say the date? Study date, 2008. I was a first year registrar training in Royal Liverpool Hospital, um, and I saved this. So it is, it is a strange say, case. What I tell my candidates when I'm examining it, as you go through, shout out the abnormalities. There's okay, five or six abnormalities, and it's again a game of putting it together. Okay, so please stop and shout out the abnormality because I'm going slowly. And don't worry if you're wrong. You can wait for me to go through once and come back. The only thing that I would suggest is before you say anything, just think what you're saying, and then I'll scroll back up to the top, and then I'll slowly stop, like sightseeing. Sorry? Very good. Right kidney, absent right kidney, point number one. Okay, fair enough. That's, that's a fair call, but if you look at it, and I'll slowly go through it, that's the left lobe, leaf-like left lobe, okay? Some people call it the arm round the spleen liver, okay? It's almost as if that left lobe has put an arm around the spleen. So it is an enlarged left lobe of the liver. I'm being very specific and pedantic for a reason, okay? What about the spleen? It's coming down there. Well, it's coming from there Still going, still going, still going, still going, still going. Your kidney is enlarged, but it's still going. You're down to the lower lumbar vertebrae. You're at the iliac crest. Is that spleen enlarged or normal? Enlarged. Okay. Remember, this is iliac crest. We, we, you know, how often do you see spleen down to the iliac crest? Just because I'm not showing a, showing, showing a coronal. Interestingly, he has also got hypertrophy of the left hepatic vein compared to the right and middle hepatic vein. Anyway, that's, that's a moot point. What about the left kidney? Enlarged. So I stop on this image. Anything abnormal about this image? Perfect. Asymmetry. And the muscles are abnormal. Both are correct, both of them. So I, my question is, is the right side abnormal or the left side abnormal? So is the right side abnormal or the left side abnormal? How many are on the side of the right side being abnormal? One, two, three, four. How many are on the side that the left side is abnormal? Oh, outvoted or oh, just about an equal vote. Okay, so what about the people who didn't put any hand up? <laughs> so so well, actually, Why does a person lose their kidney? 
I'll, I'll make you get to the diagnosis. I don't say that's, that's the way the FRCR exam works. I'll never tell you the diagnosis. Why is the right kidney absent? What are the causes of absent right kidney? Congenital absence or there is no, yeah, cross tectopic possibility. This isn't cross tectopic, but it's a possibility. Post nephrectomy. Why do you lose the kidney? This is a youngish person. Why does a young person lose kidney? Due to malignancy of some sort. Yeah, hold that thought. Any malignancy comes in mind which is associated with the side being big and the side being small. So we are saying that the right side is normal and the left side is, uh, sorry, the right side is abnormal, the left side is normal. That, but that doesn't fit with the left side of the liver, the spleen, the kidney. Why aren't we agreeing with ourselves? So we've so far, so far said the left side of the liver is enlarged, the spleen is enlarged, fact. Left kidney is enlarged because of compensatory hypertrophy or congenital hyperplasia, we don't know, but it is enlarged. So why are we disregarding the enlargement of the left side muscles and the bone? Why is suddenly the right side abnormal? Perfect. So everything was enlarged, isn't it? So okay, so now we know that the bone is enlarged, and the muscle is enlarged, so we're dealing with hemihypertrophy. So why did he have the kidney removed? Perfect. If you do this, that's an eight, which is gold medal level. Okay, most of them don't get to that level. Okay, most people will stop at seven because I haven't said any of this anyway. I, if you remember, it's all you guys who are coming up with it. But that's, that's the idea. That's what FRCR exam generally is about. They won't tell you anything. They will, whether you want to or not, they will make you say it. I remember the exam. I'll, I'll finish with that. That's, I think we'll stop. I think it's good to stop at a good... Uh, stop? You want to carry on or stop? Okay, couple, couple more and then we, da, 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 okay, and go on. Oh yeah, coffee would be nice actually. So what is this? That's a blank screen, okay. This is an MR hand. Actually, I'll show you that. So that was indeed a Beckwith-Weidman syndrome, but when I actually was a registrar, the patient came with the history of known Beckwith-Weidman syndrome for follow-up. But then when you look at it, I looked at the previous report and people haven't picked up on all the points. Everybody has said known Beckwith-Weidman syndrome, da, da 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 but you don't put it together, but it was. They do have lots of other things, macroglossia and other things, obviously, but I've never seen a better example of hemihypertrophy. So all of us who were edges at that time quickly save their images and use it. So it's, it's been a while, but I still love. It's actually, if you ever end up doing the entry course, this is one of the long cases, the hemihypertrophy. Uh, so yeah. Uh, da, 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 da. In fact, quite a few of them are in the courses. So this is an X-ray hand. I've shown you a T1-weighted image, which is on the right, um, and a PDFS. I was trying to window so that you can focus on the, it's a T2-weighted uh, fat suppressed. I'll stop on that image. Can you see anything abnormal on the MR hand? I'm trying to window it to make it better. Is that better? Okay, look at the metacarpals first, and then look at the proximal phalanges and things. Anything abnormal with any of the phalanges? Soft tissue, somebody said. Multiple soft tissue lesions are there. That's very true. Multiple soft tissue lesions are there. Are the bones normal? 
Yeah, some of the bones are showing abnormal lesions, as you said. Oh, crikey. Um, two, two, two. I was going to show you the T1. Actually, let me bring up the T1. Was that the T1? Yeah, let's keep the T1 only. Because we have seen the soft tissues, let's see the bone lesions now. So the proximal phalanx of the little finger, right? Somebody was saying. So what's going on here? What would you do? How would you report this? If you're reporting this MR, what would you do? What's the first thing that you would do? The first thing that I do is I look at the old packets to see if there is any old one. I'll say, no change, and put it down. Okay, that's the easiest report. But, okay, there are no old films. But what would you do? I was saying it's almost, it's not a sin, but we don't report an MR without an accompanying what? Yeah. So we'll get an X-ray, but before that, what are you thinking? Somebody picked up that soft tissue lesion and bone lesions. So what gives you soft tissue lesion and bone lesions? Well, anything can give you soft tissue lesion, bone lesion. You're thinking, what, what can it be? If you think rationally, is this osteomyelitis? No, it can't be. There are multifocal, multiple areas. Is it metastasis in the bone and soft tissue? Possible, but very rare in the hand. Yeah, it's very rare. If you get it in an exam, it is lung or breast, if somebody shows you. But why in the same hand? and in multiple areas of the same hand. Doesn't really fit. What else could this be? Hyperparathyroidism doesn't really feel. Fibrous dysplasia, Paget's disease, you rack through the list. Think of the lists in your head. Does anything fit? It's like running a finger scanner in the police department. Is anything fitting? Sarcoid? No, it doesn't fit. Doesn't really, nothing fits. I'll show you the x-ray, but anything comes in mind? I won't show the X-ray. X-ray has got the answer. The, if I show the X-ray, you'll get the diagnosis. That is, that is another thing. So clever people actually think. So there are two reasons why we start in an MR, in an exam. A, because we don't want to show you the X-ray. The X-ray is pathognomonic. If you see the X-ray, you'll know the diagnosis. Okay? That's generally the idea. We want to show you unusual. That happens with Paget's. Because in UK, everybody knows what a Paget's X-ray looks like, or whatever bone. So we'll start with an MR. Okay, here I was showing you the x-ray, but this is another condition where we all start with an MR. Well, when we all, but some of us start with an MR. Okay, I'll show you the x-ray anyway. And see if you can identify what does this proximal or middle phalanx of the little finger look like. Again, they don't project very well. Yeah, that's right, erosions in lots of fingers. What sort of erosions, along with soft tissue masses? Until proven otherwise, this is what? If somebody was on the telephone telling you, I'm seeing an x-ray with lots of soft tissue masses, gout, isn't it? If you describe it, you know, it is gout, tophaceous gout. These are, these are erosions, and you can get gout, tophi, deposits in the soft tissue as well as in the bone. So this is just gout deposit in the bone. You can get intraosseous and extraosseous tophi. So soft tissue pushes, soft tissue mass pushes you towards gout. I'll, um, I'll actually show you one last one and then I'll stop after that. Um, we'll, I'm sure we'll have plenty of opportunities in future. And when you actually come to do these cases, uh, when to do the FRCR exam and things like that, you have plenty of things. I can go on forever. Uh, I do, as you can see, I do like talking and I do like sharing. There's not, not teaching, sharing information. Because it sometimes happens with clever uh, trainees that actually, in fact, having said that, this time at one of the courses, there was a really clever girl from Hong Kong. So she was looking at everything and she was going like, ah, this has got this and this has got that, so it can only be this or that. And I would say yes. And then she would say, but also, if those were not there, there could be three and four, and said, shh, I didn't think of them. Maybe I should bring the patient back and look whether those things, because I have diagnosed and let them go. So there are sometimes people, bear in mind, sometimes, and I dare say that, 
Sometimes you're actually cleverer than your examiner. Never forget that. The examiner has their level. So obviously sometimes there will be candidates who are actually cleverer than the examiner and actually know more. But tone it down, play by the examiner, and keep it. You will be able to judge where you're doing that. But you know, sometimes that is just life. You know, examiner doesn't mean he's cleverer than you. He just knows the film. You don't. That's the difference. Okay. If you knew your film, he'll equally struggle with yours. Okay. I'm just telling you. So bear in mind. Don't don't get petrified or scared of exams. And I say that to everybody. You can't make people pass, but you know, don't be scared of exams and things, because everybody. It's like a pipeline. It's like driving test. Once you pass, and when you pass, nobody cares whether you pass the third time or the first time, or you know five times. You'll be as good as a radiologist if you think and you know what you're doing. It does not matter. So don't ever, ever, ever get phased by any exam in your life is generally what uh, I believe and what I tell all the regis. Don't, don't, don't really uh, worry about exam. So this guy came for, this is the last one, okay? So this guy, and it ends with the theme of musculoskeletal ultrasound. So he said, oh, I've got this patient with massive calcification. Can you, sir, please do a barber touch of this? So I looked at the x-ray, and he comes with calcific tendinopathy, apparently, from a smaller place, and had an x-ray in private, and it was reported as large volume calcific tendinopathy for barber touch. So I looked at it. And I said, this doesn't fit right. Does that look like any tendon distribution to you? It's, it, it is, what would be the differential if I just show you this x-ray? What would you think? Sorry? It could be heterotopic ossification due to injection, commonly seen in a lot of x-rays in the bottom. Uh, okay, in the people used to have m intramuscular injections at the bottom. I'm not just ma not randomly pointing to my bottom. So a lot of people used to have injections, and you get calcification there. So that could be one possibility. What else? Could be a possibility. Could be a possibility of tumor, of some sort of a tumor, which has got calcific in it, calcification in it. What else? It could be hematoma calcification. Generally, we see flebolith kind of things, so smaller fragments, if you think about it, isn't it? These are more cloud-like, bigger. Sorry, go on. Yeah. Sir, synovial chondromatosis. Synovial chondromatosis. I was thinking synovial sarcoma, you're going to say, which can calcify. Synovial chondromatosis will be joint-centered. It's a joint condition, isn't it? So you'll see all of them, at least some of them should be in the joint. Isn't it? Some of them should be. Myositis ossificans is an extremely good thought, and that is exactly what we thought. We thought this is hematoma calcification or myositis ossificans in the deltoid muscle. Okay, so what did we do? What, did, what would you do? Yeah, we did a CT. Okay. Very good spot. Now, there, there we go. We didn't actually spot that when we did the x-ray because we were too excited by the calcification. But there are other things on the x-ray. What did you see, other things? Yeah. Uh, yeah, actually the scapular things we saw, but we thought, what are these? We don't know. Okay, we don't know what are these. But what about the calcification? So there's the calcification coming up. Is very dense. There is absolutely, there is an entity called soft tissue osteosarcoma, which I heard about in India. I've never seen them there. It is any sort of soft tissue sarcoma with ossific dedifferentiation, basically. You're getting osteoblasts in any sort of soft tissue tumor. Uh, but there is no, if I could window it and get it to the abdominal window, there is no abnormal mass. There is none, no abnormal mass at all. So it is not a sarcoma. Possible, but they are joint-centered. Why is it randomly just there? And also you don't get it in uh, European people at all. You get it in African people. I don't know about India, I don't see many. Unless you've got end-stage renal disease, you don't get tumoral calcinosis. But you see primary tumoral calcinosis in a lot of African populations. So if it was a black Afro-Caribbean, Nigerian, you know, you know, some, something like that, you could say tumoral calcinosis, commonly around the hip. Um, it looks like the uh, blue uh -huh. It kind of looks like a vermiform calcification, but it is just pure soft tissue calcification. Now, I didn't realize these things calcify or this condition is associated with soft tissue calcification until I spotted the other. So what's happening to the scapula? Now come back. So just like any other place, when you're struggling with one area, look at everything where else in the um, 
X-ray. So that's the top of the scapula. So remember we saw other densities. So I started, I wasn't looking at the scapula, I was looking for the other densities that you spotted. Scapular lesions could be separate. So there's three there. Can you see the scapular lesions? Okay. If you were reporting the scapular lesions, anything comes to mind? Benign osteochondroma. Did you say? Benign? Benign osteoma is a good thought. But osteomas, multiple osteomas projecting on the cortex, uncommon site and uncommon. Cauliflower like is a very good description, actually. I like that. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you why I like this. Because we have written this case up as, uh, as a sign of this condition. So what does that one looks like? So that's another lesion, isn't it? It's on the wrong side of the blade or the underside of the blade. If it was a long bone, what would these things, what would have these things done? They would have dripped down a long bone. Okay. 25% of them are associated with a random soft tissue calcification, which is one in four. Okay. We didn't know that until we saw this. The CT scan does look like mammary osteosis. So if you Google uh, my name and put, so we called it, you could call anything. My registrar, who's obviously Christian, she, want, she wanted to call it the, what did she want to call it? So there are these sticks that they take around during Christmas, which looks like little balls on both sides. Uh, so, but uh, me and my daughter actually came up with it. She said, these look like dumpling, dad. So we called it dumpling on a plate sign. And you can Google it and you'll find, uh, uh, find that. It's a Eurorad uh, article. So basically the theory was when it's a flat bone and not a long bone, over, if you look at the principle of metalliostosis, it's all about principle. Why do you get dripping candle wax? Because if it's a long bone, you're walking around and things, the weight of it allows it to drip down the side of the bone. Okay, it's just hyperostosis. So if you've got a flat bone, okay, where Equal amount of time, you're probably lying down. Eight hours of our day, we sleep. Some people sleep 12 hours. My son sleeps 16 hours. I don't know how he manages. But you know, some people sleep longer, and some people sleep less. So scapula is a flat bone. So we, our hypothesis was, we have not been proven wrong as yet, so we are standing strong, that when it's a flat bone meloriostosis, you get dumpling on a plate sign. Not only this, we had two, when another case of mandible. So we call that dumpling on a plate sign as well because it was mandible and it proved our theory it is a flat bone membranous ossification it and it it forms little lumps which hangs off or sits on the top because it sits on the top and looks like three little dumplings on a plate we called it dumpling on a plate sign but with that i rest my case what there are lots of uh, them i was talking um, to Ritipona about There are quite a few things, uh, Rejada, in my name, Morton's. So I can, it's easier rather than finding it, just uh, let me find, oh, actually, it would be there. Uh, hang on. Which one? Oh, the case. And I can't remember. No, no, you know, that was just a differential of different differential of different conditions that you can see in Morton's, uh, you know, differential or mimics of Morton's neuroma. Uh, basically, that was it. I'm just trying to f find. Uh, da, 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 da.
yeah no they, they, this was just the uh, Oh, it's like a screen, so it won't, will it not work? No, I, well, I can find the cases, so the cases are individually, it's the images which are saved. So I was just going to go into the display because I need to change it because otherwise it won't project. Uh, arrangement, mirror. So these were, this is uh, something that we, worked on. So this is, a, this is basically intermetatarsal bursa and Morton's neuroma. So these are the differentials. So the, it, was, it is a full-blown paper, actually. It's not just one case. So this is an adventitial submetatarsal bursa. So at one point, I'll show you this example. We used to do arthrograms of the toe. Okay, it's a very painful condition and the patient doesn't thank you, but it's the best way of showing a full thickness plantar plate tear. I, I wouldn't want to go into it, but you know, there's, there's a lots of, there are lots of things which can uh, present as Morton's neuroma. So, do, do, do. somebody was showing an angiomyolipomatous hypertrophy. This is a ganglion. This is an epidermoid cyst. This is a foreign body granuloma. This is a plantar fibroma. This is the biggest plantar fibroma I've ever seen. This is just aggressive fibromatosis. Just some people call it fibrosis. And there's lots of different things actually, sarcomas. This one is actually a fibrolipomatous hypertrophy of a digital nerve of the foot. Uh, but uh, yeah, though it might have sent you this one actually, uh, Rejada. Right. Thank you so much. So have you got any questions? So we must thank Dr. Ganguly uh, for the excellent workshop for two days. Now our students will present something to Dr. Ganguly. Before we close the session and hand over the certificates, uh, please bring your whatever you want to give. Will it take some time? Then we distribute the certificates first. No, no, he will, he, will, he will stay here. So let us give the certificates. We will call one by one. The prize certificate, first, second and third prize certificate will be signed by either uh, the principal. So we will get later one because that will be helpful for your examination results. Akash. I'm calling names. We will discuss later on. Please, ha. Whatever you want to do after after the. So I request Dr. Akash Ganguly to hand over the certificate to Dr. S. P. Kaviraj and Dr. Uh, Ritu Karna Dash. After that, we'll call one by one. Mm -hmm. 
Dr. Vinita Thakur and Dr. Siddhant, are they here or they have left? Okay, so I'm calling the PGs. Dr. Yatiraj Dhir. Sir, 50 percent, oh, I'll give you the go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. PG is good. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. Dr. Shomit Maji. Dr. Devendra Rawal. Dr. Pratik, Dr. Pratik, Dr. Jeevan J, absent, no? Dr. Oisar Jaranjan, he is also absent? Okay, Dr. Sivangi Misra, Dr. Abhilasa, Season ultrasound? Okay. Dr. Gurpreet Singh. <laughs> Dr. Amalpreet Kaur Saini. Dr. Himang Subharma, Dr. Kajal, is Kajal here? Dr. Upindarajit Kaur, Dr. Trisha Sina, Dr. Amitesar Randhawa. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Akash. Now I request Dr. Kabiraj to present certificates to Dr. Nishan Sarma. Is Nishan Sarma here? No. Dr. Pooja, Dr. Asuk Prashad, Dr. Ramsuban Prashad, Subrat Prashad, Dr. Prabhita Kumari. Who is there? Who is there from outside? Dr. Puspindar Singh. Ajay, Dr. Puspindar Singh, Dr. Tanisha Khanna, Ajay, Dr. Tanisha Khanna, Ajay, Dr. Sangeeta, Dr. Chandipak Singh. Dr. Gunbir Singh, Dr. Rishabh Prashad, Dr. 
डॉक्टर इज्जत खालदा एन राग एख राग पर डॉक्टर राम बाबू रामन डॉक्टर अलोक कुमार ओके अलोक आ जाओ देर उल डोट डोट लिव देर उल फर्माल फोटोग्राफ देर उल फर्माल फोटोग्राफ उ फैकल्टी किसका ट्रेन है ओके डॉक्टर आशुतोष राय है खुजे पाई Where is Dr. Ganguly? Achha. So we will have a formal, formal photograph. Where are we going? Where are we going? Where are we going? Where are we going? Akash, please don't just. So now gift is being presented by the by, by our students. Oh, memento then, I know. So mementos will be given to those who have presented paper or uh, displayed uh, posters. So please come, one by one, all of you, those who have. So uh, give me the names. Nam do, nam bato. अपना दुजन दिए दे आगे तक बत दिए दाव दुजन मिले दिए दाव डॉक्टर तनिशा डॉक्टर तनिशा खानना प्लीज कम डॉक्टर तनिशा खानना आ जाओ डॉक्टर शंगीता डॉक्टर चंदीपक सिंह He has already received. No. Doctor Amita Sarshing Rangdhawa. Aja. Ruko. Amal Preet, Dr. Jeevanjan nahi hai, Dr. Oisar Jaranjan nahi hai, Dr. Gurpreet Singh, Trisha, Dr. 
डॉक्टर काजल डॉक्टर प्रतीक डॉक्टर एसर्ज डॉक्टर अभिलाषा डॉक्टर शिवांगी and who is the last one i do, i don't read i can uh, okay dr alok alok dr alok if you need certificate of participation for your examination because 60 marks have been allotted for paper presentation and others please uh, contact the department we will give it from the it will be signed by the principal okay th that will take some time because it has to be processed and then get signature of the principal ha naam bol do ek ek karke naam bol himanshu verma पुष्पिंदर सिंह गुणवीर सिंह उपेंद्र कौर देवेंद्र रावल डॉक्टर इज्जत खालदा आशुतोष और कोई खत्म इज इट ओवर नाउ सो प्लीज इज प्लीज प्रेजेंट द गिफ्ट टू डॉक्टर गांगुली ऑन योर बी एफ वट एवर यू हैव ब्रॉट प्लीज ब्रिंग इट there are two more uh, three more persons uh, 
वन इज फॉर डॉक्टर सोमित माजी दे रहा तुम्हें जाओ डॉक्टर सोमित माजी प्लीज कम एंड डॉक्टर ये त्रिराज धीर दिस इज फॉर देयर एक्सेलेंट मैनेजमेंट इन रिसीविंग गेस्ट इन प्लानिंग एवरीथिंग एंड डूइंग एवरीथिंग ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ द डिपार्टमेंट when oh okay okay so you want to give two gifts <laughs> that's why you have been given the responsibility to hand over another for dr asutosh rai why for his marriage <laughs> 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 last 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 anyway so this is complete let us go for a uh, formal photo faculty with the students chalo niche gaye प्रभु चुप रही